President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clark. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator, there being none. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Mr President, I seek leave to make a statement regarding ministerial arrangements for this week. Leave is granted. Senator Birmingham. I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator Payne has been appointed as Acting Minister for Defence. Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Veterans Affairs, the Minister for Defence Personnel, the Minister for Defence Industry and the Minister for Home Affairs. I also advise that Senator Cash has been appointed as Acting Attorney General and Acting Minister for Industrial Relations. Thank you. I'll call Senator Rustin. Um, I move that intervening government business be postponed till after consideration of government business. Order of the day number two, the Higher Education Support Amendment, Freedom of Speech Bill 2020. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. I move that the following general business orders of the day be considered today at a time for private senators. Bills number 68, Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Benefits to Australia Bill 2020, and number 43, National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment Small Amount Credit Contracts and Consumer Lease Reforms Bill 2019, number 2. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. General Business Order of the Day No. 68, Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Benefit to Australia Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. And I will call Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr President. Australian governments have failed to create wealth from the Commonwealth's ownership of vast reserves of oil and gas. I had thought it was a case of mismanagement and incompetence. Now it's clear. Foreign-owned oil and gas companies have too much political influence in Australia. I can think of no other explanation for the major parties arguing against the proposal in the bill. Everyone seems to agree our natural resources should be developed for the benefit of the Australian community. But when I propose putting that idea into the law, it is opposed by the government and the opposition. It's no wonder the primary vote of both major parties has fallen over the years, and Liberal Party membership is falling faster than lemmings running off a cliff. In the Offshore Greenhouse Gas and Storage Amendment Benefit to Australia Bill 2020, I propose to make the benefit of the Australian community a guiding principle in the interpretation of the Offshore Petroleum and Gas House Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006 or OPWGS Act. The Australian OPWGS Act is 1150 pages of rules, rules which address in detail the award and management of petroleum licences, title, safety and the jurisdiction of the regulator. The equivalent legislation in Norway is 39 pages long and is objective-based. The Morrison government and the opposition say they oppose my 17-word amendment to the OPWGS Act because of unintended consequences. My view is that the proposed object clause would fix many of the existing unintended consequences created by the narrow focus of the OPWGS Act. Unintended consequences like forcing taxpayers to take on the liabilities of the Northern Oil and Gas Company in February 2020, which include $4 million a week. Yes, $4 million a week to maintain the floating platform known as the Northern Endeavour 
in non-production mode and the decommissioning costs of the Laminaria and Corellia oil field in the Timor Sea estimated up to a billion dollars. Unintended consequences like enabling foreign-owned companies to hoard petroleum licences when Australian companies would be willing to put long-held licences into production and bring that gas onshore to Australia. Unintended consequences have not proven to be a problem for Norway, who have made the benefit of the Norwegian society as a whole a guiding principle in their equivalent of the OPWGS Act, the Petroleum Activities Act 1996. Section 1.2 of Norway's Petroleum Activities Act of 1966 states petroleum resources are to be managed for the benefit of the Norwegian society as a whole. Managing petroleum resources for the benefit of the Norwegian society as a whole has created a sovereign wealth fund of around $1.4 trillion and funded the best aged care system in the world. Australia will never have a sovereign wealth fund like Norway's because the big political parties put their interests ahead of the interests of the Australian people. My bill is not a tax bill and does not seek to change any tax law. In April 2017, Michael Callaghan handed his report to government. In the 2019, the government responded to the Callaghan report by removing taxes from onshore gas. Here we are four years later, and only now the government says it will consult with the industry on whether they would be willing to pay for our gas. Good luck with that. My bill is about increasing the supply of gas to Australia with a view to lowering the price of gas in Australia and creating new jobs. How do government ministers sleep at night knowing Australia is the only large gas exporter in the world where the domestic price of gas is higher than the exported price? The price differential is a massive problem for us. The multinationals are taking out and exporting 50 billion, 50 billion worth of Aussie gas, and thanks to the deal our government has done, we only get around 200 million in taxes. The tiny nation of Qatar has a different approach. It receives around 26 billion in royalties on the gas they export. What is wrong with our government? We should be telling these multinationals in regard to the retention leases in place that they need to use it or lose it, not just build up never-ending tax credits at, at our expense. Our government propping up the multinationals while denying Australian companies who want to develop the opportunity to extract gas while they prop up the multinationals. The government won't encourage the building of a pipeline from the northwest to the eastern states as promoted by Twiggy Forest, a nation-building project that worth tens of thousands of jobs and will benefit Australia for, de for decades. We're paying more here domestically for our gas than they are in the countries it, it's exported to. Gas sets the price of electricity one day in four. As our aged coal fire power stations are retired and replaced by gas-fired power stations, the price of gas will increasingly set the price of electricity. If we pay more for gas than our competitors, then we pay more for electricity than they do. If we want to sell what we make and buy what we need, we must be able to buy our natural gas at the same price as our competitors overseas, and we must be able to deliver globally competitive price electricity to families and industry. The government fell into an elephant trap when it timetabled closure of coal-fired power stations before it had a plan to replace the reliable electricity they provide to households and business. I say elephant trap because the inability to supply electricity after the retirement of these coal-fired power stations was so obvious and so big, it should have been avoided. The Belt and Brace solution successfully adopted by Germany has not been followed by this government. Instead, the Australian government has adopted the high-risk approach. It has bet the farm—your farm, my farm, everyone's farm—on finding solutions to grid stability problems caused by wind and solar power before we lose the reliable electricity provided by coal. In the next 15 years, nine coal-fired power stations are timetabled to be shut in Australia, and with them the loss of 60 per cent of the reliable energy they produce. 
The Liddell Power Station in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales is the first of nine large power stations to be retired in the next 15 years. Its closure in April 2022 was announced in 2015. But despite seven years' notice, there is no replacement in sight for the 1,860 megawatts of reliable electricity Liddell now produces. This third-term government has been so focused on the next headline or poll of public opinion that it has been caught without a plan to stop widespread blackouts, load shedding and energy demand management after Liddell's planned closure. <coughs> the government has bought 12 months of reliable electricity supply to the nation by making Liddell's owner keep the coal-fired power station open until April 2023. Further, the government told the private sector they must make final investment decisions to replace 1,000 megawatts of Liddell's power by 20, April 21, or the government will step in and build a gas-fired power station at Curry Curry near Newcastle. The private sector has no intention of pulling the government out of the element trap, and their laughter at the government's fanciful plan echoes around the world. Since then, the owners of the Yulun power station in Victoria have announced it would close four years earlier. The elephant trap just gets deeper. The government has little choice but to build a gas-fired power station and increase the supply of gas. The government's Clean Energy Finance Corporation Amendment Grid Reliability Fund Bill 2020 is intended to funnel a billion dollars into fixing grid reliability problems and allow the funding of the Kari Kari gas-fired power station. One Nation's view is the government should fund the building of new, clean, coal-fired power stations rather than waste any more money subsidising weather-dependent electricity supply. Coal-fired power stations in the eastern states, including South Australia, will deliver the globally competitive electricity prices we need to manufacture steel, glass and aluminium. The government says it will not pick winners for the supply of electricity, but at every opportunity it distorts the market with subsidies and policy. And to keep the masses happy, it talks about unproven technology like hydrogen. Where does the government think it's going to get the hydrogen? Either huge amounts of heat created by gas-fired electricity will cleave off the hydrogen from natural gas or water. But in any case, hydrogen technology will not come in time to rescue the government. The 2021-22 budget handed down last October announces the government wants to unlock the state and territory owned onshore gas reserves by spending $28.3 million in five strategic basins. Onshore gas providers have subsequently told the Australian energy market operator the government's plans to increase onshore gas supply are unrealistic which leaves the government with little alternative than to reform the gas laws relevant to the federally owned offshore gas, which brings me full circle back to the proposal contained in my bill. My proposed amendment in the OPWGS Act will have the effect of increasing the supply of gas to Australia and eventually the price will be lowered. The Australian Institute supports the proposed additional object clause saying offshore oil and gas industries contribute little to the Australian economy in terms of tax revenue or employment. Many projects represent a net cost to the Australian community as subsidies, clean-up costs, environmental impacts and depletion outweigh the relatively small tax and employment benefits. Prosper Australia also supports the proposed amendment. They say the current objectives of the OPWGS Act breaches Australia's human rights to a fair return on the exploitation of their natural resources and call successive government failures in their brief as landlord in chief for all Australians. Perhaps the most surprising response to the proposed amendment comes from the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, who argue against the proposal on the grounds it would create unacceptable uncertainty for title holders and decision makers. What about the owners? And that is the problem. The OPWGS Act just benefits oil and gas companies. This must change. My own proposal is modest, but a first positive step. The Australian people need to make these issues election issues if they want to fund aged care reforms and the NDIS. 
If Australians don't prioritise these issues, they can expect to spend their final days without the essential things we will all need. As I've said continually in this House, we are just giving away our resources. We do not charge the multinationals and we don't hold them to account enough. When we got Prelude, which is a, a floating platform which the former Resources Minister, Matt Canavan, Senator Canavan, allowed them to, to hook it to the continental shelf, they don't pay anything like the others do of the 15 per cent domestic gas supply if it comes across the, the borders of Western Australia. I've said in my speech approximately 48 to $50 billion a year in gas exported from Australia, and we are lucky to get about two or $300 million in returns from them. Yet Qatar, who don't export as much gas as we do, we are the largest exporter in the world, and they make $26.6 billion from their gas. Papua New Guinea actually has their gas up there. We actually did the deal for them. They make more out of their gas, which is about a billion dollars a year, than what we do. And we are the fools in this country. Surely we can take note of what happened in Norway. They have exported their gas and they've got paid for it. A 1.4 trillion fund that they have. What is wrong with the people in this place? Why are you not supporting the Australian people? They are our resources. We will never get them back again. We are not making the money out of it that we should. We're talking about aged care at the moment. How are we going to fund it? And all you're worrying about is taxing the Australian people again. You're not looking at taxing the, the multinationals. Here they have retention leases in Australia for 30, 35 years. You keep signing off, give them another retention lease. You don't put on them, use it or lose it. You don't say, you have to develop this. I know of Australian companies that actually want to, to be able to um, work those leases, but we don't give them the opportunity. You're destroying our own companies. You are not making the multinationals pay the fair amount of tax in this country. And yet you are forcing the Australian people to pay higher prices for our gas than what we exported at. These are industries in manufacturing. If you want to head down the path of your climate change, if you want to go to wind and solar, well, I'm telling you, it won't drive our industries in manufacturing and provide jobs. It's about time you woke up to yourselves in this place, look at after the Australian people, our resources, because it belongs to the people, and charge accordingly. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Uh, I've got Senator Van on my list, Senator Ayres. Thank you, Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I also rise to speak on the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Benefit to Australia Bill of 2020, a bill that is noble in intent but, I'm afraid, flawed in its execution. Before I go into the details of the bill, can I recognise just how important that this industry is to Australia's export performance. Australia has abundant supplies of natural gas, both offshore and onshore, enough for more than 50 years based on current production. It is Australia's third largest energy resource after coal and uranium, and it is a crucial part of Australia's energy mix, providing a quarter of the nation's needs. Australia is one of the world's two largest liquefied natural gas exporters. Australia exported 78.3 million tonnes of LNG in 2020, valued at approximately $36.2 billion. That's billion with a B. LNG is Australia's second largest energy export commodity behind iron ore. Natural gas from Australia is exported to many countries in the region mainly Japan, the largest importer of Australian gas, China and South Korea, but also to Taiwan, Malaysia, India and other places via spot markets in the regions. The Australian oil and gas industry directly supports over 32,000 jobs. The National Energy, uh, National Energy Resources Australia, NERA, estimates that each direct job in the oil and gas industry supports an additional 10 jobs across the supply chain and wider economy. Ernst and Young have estimated that over $310 billion will have been spent between 2020, uh, 2010 and 2020, highlighting Australia's strong place in the upstream industry. 
and this includes about $170 billion spent directly since 2007 on five offshore LNG projects, which include Pluto, Gorgon, Wheatstone, Ichithus and Prelu. Growth of the market since then has seen Australia become the largest LNG exporter in the world, overtaking Qatar as, as additional LNG plant capacity has come on stream over the last few years. This has meant more export earnings, more royalties, greater export income, something that benefits all Australians as it provides not only taxation but royalty income to help fund infrastructure, education and social services. While One Nation is proposing to add the following clause to the objective of the existing Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act, and I'm quoting here, to be to ensure that the exploitation of these natural resources is for the benefit of the Australian community. The remaining objects of the Act are, and I quote, a to provide an effective regulatory framework for Roman I, Roman One. Uh, petroleum exploration and recovery, and Roman II, the injection of storage and greenhouse gas substances in offshore areas. Now, while this change might, might seem innocuous, in effect what it does is inject a major uncertainty into the Act. It would make potential legal challenges to decisions made under the Act more likely. The OPG, OPGGS Act provides for the safe and responsible operation of offshore oil and gas activities. It ensures that risks to safety and the environment are reduced to as low as reasonably practicable. It also ensures that industry meets the requirements of good oil field practice and ensures that the recovery of oil or gas is at its optimal level. The proposed One Nation Amendment injects ambiguity and uncertainty into the objective particularly the round, uh, around the use of the term for the benefit of the Australian community. Now, the issue that I have is this term is not defined and would likely therefore be open to interpretation by the courts. Now, the courts rely on stated objectives of an act to help them interpret those acts. And it will be up to them to decide what such a benefit means. As we have seen, the courts have become far more active in accepting legal challenges to resource projects based on a range of environmental arguments. So it would seem highly likely that activist groups could use the One Nation objective to argue that an activity such as drilling an offshore well to recover oil is contributing to, let's say, climate change or impacting the environment. So therefore, they would argue it is not for the benefit of the Australian community. Now, if a court accepted that argument, it rapidly flows onto all the activities regulated under this Act. Even if the courts did not accept this argument, the process of legal challenges can take years. And we've seen that in so many projects over the years, particularly in Senator Hanson's home state of Queensland. So even if the challenge is ultimately unsuccessful, the process can be lengthy enough to effectively derail projects. <coughs> the stated aim of amending the objective appears to be around collecting more tax from the industry, which One Nation and Senator Patrick both believe is inadequate. However, as the Economics Legislation Committee noted in its report to this, it said, and I quote, taxation treatment is not a responsibility of the OPGGS Act but rather fits within the legislation under the purview of the Treasurer, such as the Petroleum Rent Resource Tax, the PRRT, and other company taxation arrangements. The PRRT is a profits-based tax and specifically recognises the large investments required to explore for and hopefully produce oil and gas resources. So as a result, One Nation is seeking to turn an industry regulatory act into a taxation act, and it is ill-fitting both the objectives of the current act and the type of regime it is enacted under. So, as we know, the offshore petroleum activities, um, and that includes oil and gas exploration and development along with greenhouse gas storage, 
in Commonwealth waters beyond state and territory coastal waters are governed by this Act, the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006. We, should, we also know that Commonwealth waters are three nautical miles from the territorial sea baseline to the edge of the outer limits of the continental shelf. The object of the legislation is to provide an effective regulatory framework for petroleum exploration and recovery and the injection, of, uh, and, injection and storage of greenhouse, gas, uh, greenhouse gases in those offshore areas. The legislation provides the framework of rights, entitlements and responsibilities of governments and industry and is objective-based. Importantly, the framework also sets out the requirements for occupational health and safety, well, uh, um, structural well integrity, environmental management and resource management. The OPGGS Act also establishes a regulator and a titles administrator. The National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority, commonly known as NOPSEMA, is an independent statutory body and the National Offshore Petroleum Titles Administration, NOPTA, um, are both, as well as NOPSEMA, are both cost recovered from offshore oil and gas industry. An audit of NOPSEMA was conducted by the Chief Scientist, Dr Alan Finkel, and relevant experts in 2019. That audit provides an additional level of assurance to the community that the relevant scientific and environmental considerations are part of NOPSEMA's assessment process and decision making. Dr Finkel's audit found that NOPSEMA is a highly skilled, professional and competent regulator, that it has appropriate processes and practices to meet regulatory requirements under the Offshore Petroleum Greenhouse Gas Storage Environment Regulations Act of 20, 2009, and that NOPSEMA has appropriate processes and practices to ensure environment plans are assessed against relevant sufficient and complete scientific and technical information. The OPGGS Act has established a regime that enables a title holder to progress from exploration through to production and decommissioning. The Offshore Petroleum Titles, Offshore Petroleum Titles provide rights to companies to apply for permission to undertake petroleum-related activities within their title area. And those pro proposed activities subject to approvals for environmental and safety matters and technical title assessments based on resource management. Title decisions under the OPGGS Act are made by the joint authority comprising of the responsible state or territory minister and the responsible Commonwealth minister. And this joint decision-making arrangement with states and territories recognises that offshore oil and gas projects play an important role in supplying natural gas to domestic markets and generating economic activity in regional areas. So, According to publicly available title data, there are currently around 366 active offshore petroleum titles and around 80 companies active in Commonwealth waters. Of these titles, there are currently 82 active petroleum retention leases in Commonwealth waters. The OPGGS Act requires regular five-yearly reviews of the commercial viability of oil and gas resources under the retention lease with discretion for governments to initiate a, commercially, a commerciality review within the five-year period if required. So, Madam Deputy President, this industry is incredibly important to Australia. It directly supports over 32,000 jobs and the National Energy Resources Australia estimates that each job adds 10 additional ones. It bears repeating 10 additional jobs. Further, Ernst & Young has estimated that over $310 billion will have been spent between 2010 and 2020, highlighting Australia's strong place in the upstream industry. So I think it's safe to say that this industry is not one that we want to put at risk of activists or activist courts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Bain. Senator Ayres. Now I'm here, and it's a very good time uh, this Monday morning to have a Western Australian uh, in the chair, although momentarily um, a proud uh, Labor Western Australian. There is, there is a concentration of Western Australians, I notice, in the chamber today. In fact, there are, there are two more 
Liberal senators here from Western Australia than there will be Liberal members of the Western Australian Legislative Assembly over the course of the next three or four years. Um, and I don't say that, um, I don't say that with uh, any uh, hubris or uh, glee or, or any of those things. Uh, no, no smugness from me about this issue, none at all. Um, but they could conduct future caucus meetings over there in a go-go mobile, I'm told. Um, so I look, forward to, I look forward to seeing that, and I look forward to um, the uh, Premier, Mark McGowan, continuing to represent the interests of Western Australians strongly, uh, even as he did last year uh, when the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, and Clive Palmer teamed up to try and stop Order. Senator, uh, please resume your seat, Senator S. Senator Hanson. Point of order. This is not relevant to the bill that's before the uh, chamber, so it needs to be drawn back to what is the bill. But thank you the for Petroleum that. The Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage um, Amendment. Yes, thank you, Senator Hanson. I'm wary that we do have wide-ranging debate in this place, but I will remind Senator Ayres to be relevant to the bill in question. So I will get back to it. Um, the bill, um, the bill as is constructed, has a series of objectives, and, and I listened to Senator Hanson carefully as she made her remarks in support of the bill. Senator Hanson is correct to point to uh, many, many years of energy policy failure uh, in this country. Uh, she is correct to point out, in particular, the failures of this government. Uh, on energy policies in particular in relation to gas and oil. And there aren't too many uh, ordinary Australians who can understand why it is that Australia exports gas uh, around the globe to uh, industrial and energy consumers around the globe at one price, but we're currently constructing import facilities on the east coast to import gas at a higher price. Allegedly, we're to have a gas-led recovery, but it's hard to see that there's any real policy or any real substance behind the, go the, behind the government's claims. From a legal perspective, this bill doesn't meet those requirements. The existing offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas Storage Act has two clear objectives. To provide an effective regulatory framework for petroleum exploration and recovery, and two, the injection and storage of greenhouse gas, gas substances in offshore areas. Adding a legal requirement that resource exploitation is for the benefit of the Australian community uh, doesn't, in our view, achieve the objectives that Senator Hanson has set uh, for the parliament or for uh, the bill that she's put forward. She is right to point in particular to those European economies and the way that they have handled these questions. Uh, the history of uh, Norway in this space over the course of the last 40 or 50 years is a history of not just careful public management of public uh, reserves in the interests of the citizens of Norway, but also for all of the Scandinavian countries, a careful management of uh, energy policy and industry policy. That means that those countries are net exporters of manufactured goods. She's right to point to the German example, where German manufacturing continues to be our mainstay of the German economy, and in fact, Germany has a uh, trade surplus in manufactured goods with China, the product of generations of careful industry policy, of active government, of making sure that the energy policy requirements of German industry are met, a complete counterpoint to the abject failure over successive governments of the Liberal and National Party to actually do the serious, long-term, beyond-the-political-cycle hard work that is required to deliver manufacturing industry, 
to deliver trade surpluses that deliver good jobs and to lower energy prices for households and for industry. Um, offshore petroleum developments are already subject to a range of vastly more specific regulations to test if they are for the benefit of the Australian community. The existing Act already gives responsible state and Commonwealth ministers the capacity to suspend leases if it is in the national interest. It's a political test, subject to the judgment of an elected official, as it should be. We don't include, for the benefit of the Australian community clauses, in other regulatory frameworks. It's implied. Uh, it is clear that public officials and elected officials should act in the community interest. When the parliament legislates, it legislates in the interest of the Australian community. Of course, that is open to political debate. It's a very source of political debate. Um, adding a redundant for the benefit of the Australian community clause doesn't mean that oil and gas developments are environmentally sustainable. It doesn't mandate that Australian oil and gas investments should employ Australian workers and offer them decent wages and conditions. It doesn't deliver the objective that, it should, that they should create real tax revenue that can be spent on protecting vulnerable Australians and making the country stronger. And it doesn't mean that cheap natural gas produced here could be used in Australian industry. Now, those are all objectives that I'm sure uh, Senator Hanson shares with um, most of the other senators in this place. Um, if senators were interested in pursuing those objectives, they would have voted for them in previous legislation and would have forced the government over the course of this uh, last miserable eight years uh, to do its job in the interests of Australian citizens and the interests of Australian industry. If we wanted to deliver a result in this parliament that meant that more tax revenue uh, was extracted from these projects, we won't deliver that objective by amending this piece of legislation. If we were concerned in this parliament about the wages and conditions of workers in offshore gas, well, where was this parliament when workers at the SO offshore rig in Longford had their pay cut by 40 per cent? a picket line for 742 days to try and defend the rights and interests of those workers, 742 opportunities for senators in this place to show their support, while well, this week we'll be considering legislation which would strengthen the hand of companies who want to cut the wages and conditions of ordinary workers. There will be an opportunity this week to be on the side of ordinary workers in collective bargaining trying to defend their jobs and wages uh, against companies uh, who will use every trick in the book, every opportunity in the legislation uh, to reduce costs and to act against the interests of ordinary people. The public interest test is capable of managing concerns about offshore gas developments. It does require some leadership. As even a recent example, the application by Advent Energy to open up petroleum exploration from Manly to Newcastle, as close as five kilometres offshore. The licence, called PEP 11, would have opened up some of our most densely populated and most tourism-dependent coastline to gas exploration. It was an absurd, it was a dangerous proposition. It didn't stack up from an economic perspective, an environmental perspective or, indeed, an energy perspective. Opposition to the proposal included the local tourism industry, the local fishing industry, local surfing groups, indigenous communities, local Labor MPs, local independent members of parliament, such as Ms Stegall, local Liberal MPs, such as Ms Wicks and Mr Falinski, and even the New South Wales Nationals, not known for their environmental credentials, opposed the project. But the minister who had the power to sign off on the proposal wasn't swayed. The member for Wide Bay said that he was concerned about some of the exaggerated claims being made by groups who are opposed to the permit. He went on to say, I mean, this exploration area is over 4,000 square kilometres. 
a well, if one is actually successful in terms of an exploration permit, is only the size of a dining table. I mean, I think we just need to have some perspective about what's being proposed. And right now, this is an extension of the exploration permit. He said, any rig is unlikely to be visible from the coast. So the minister at this point was completely contemptuous of community and industry concerns, legitimate concerns. And it took the Prime Minister being dragged by the only thing that this Prime Minister understands, that is negative public opinion. It took him being dragged to that conclusion by public opinion to stop it. And where did he do it? He did it at the place this Prime Minister does all things, at a press conference. Uh, and there is uh, in this process, in this place, the right that the, the changing the act won't fix the problems that Senator Hanson has pointed to and that many other senators around the place have pointed to. Changing the Prime Minister might have that effect. Changing the minister might have the effect, because what it requires is public officials and members of parliament and senators and ministers who are prepared to act in the public interest. We are the second largest exporter of natural gas in the world, and yet our domestic gas prices are consistently higher than international ones. Uh, while the port of Gladstone is exporting over 20 million megatons of natural gas annually, other ports along the east coast are building import terminals. The coalition has promised a gas-led recovery, but their record on fuel security is abysmal. It is just bunkum. Instead of focus group tested targets designed to wedge their opponents and to try and dig, uh, dig themselves out of catastrophic policy failure, the government should try actually delivering. Regional Australia, Australian manufacturing, needs this Prime Minister like a hole in the head. The gas-led recovery is nothing but a slogan. Like Goldilocks, we need just the right amount of gas enough to deliver certainty of supply and low prices to manufacturers who use gas in their production processes, enough to, secure, uh, um, enough to deliver certainty of supply for, uh, for manufacturers who use gas in their production processes at the right price, enough to secure grid stability to facilitate more cheap renewables as batteries and other storage technologies fall in price. But gas is very expensive. We don't want so much in our electricity that it lifts prices for households and business. A recent example of the government's policy failure, in the 2021 budget they announced that they were investing $200 million in a, you guessed it, competitive grants program to build an additional 780 megalitres of onshore diesel storage. But by October, BP announced they are closing their refinery in Quinana at a cost of 750 jobs. Minister Taylor then announced that they were speeding up support for domestic refineries, that they would create 1,000 jobs. And yet last month, ExxonMobil announced that they are closing their refinery in Altona, Victoria, at a cost of 350 jobs. Since the Morrison government announced that they were securing Australia's long-term fuel supply, half of our domestic oil refinery capability has closed. Industry doesn't need the kind of help that the Morrison government offers. Nationals like Minister Pitt and Senator Canavan might like to parade around in high vis and makeup, but they are killing jobs with their disastrous energy policy approach and their fuel security failures. They are like myxomatosis for jobs, these characters. Eight years of blue collar jobs going backwards. In the end, in the end what they are really prosecuting is a sort of weird culture war. They are importing American political rhetoric and exporting blue-collar jobs. That's all the nationals and liberals in this place know how to do. They can write the leaflet, they can post the meme, but they can't deliver on energy policy, they can't deliver on energy security, they can't deliver on lower prices and they can't deliver for Australian industry. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, I rise in support of the uh, 
uh, the Offshore Petroleum Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Benefit to Australia Bill 2020. For decades, the predominantly international oil and gas companies operating in Australian waters have engaged in economic pillage and plundering on a national scale, and nothing has been done to stop it. The intent of the Offshore Petroleum Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment uh, uh, Benefit to Australia Bill is to make benefit to the Australian community a guiding principle uh, in the intent of the Offshore Petroleum Greenhouse Gas Storage Act. Now, we've uh, heard uh, a couple of, on a couple of occasions what the objectives are, centering around effective regulatory framework for petroleum uh, exploration and recovery and the injection and storage of greenhouse gas substances in offshore areas. Now, I just want to make sure everyone in the chamber and any, everyone listening understands what Senator Hanson's bill seeks to do. It seeks to add these words, and to ensure that the exploration of these natural resources is for the benefit of the Australian community. Now, I am just flabbergasted that the members on both sides, both Labor and Liberal, are going to vote against these words. So the Liberal Party is going to vote against this and to ensure that the exploration of these natural resources is for the benefit of the Australian community. The government is going to vote against that. Labor is going to vote against it, again, for Labor, and to ensure that the exploration of these natural resources is for the benefit of the Australian community. And Labor is going to vote against that too. Now, I think I might have to go and look into the statutes for the, for the words treason and treachery. And I, I guess you'll be relying on parliamentary privilege to prevent you from, getting, uh, to, from being found guilty of such a thing. Because that's exactly what's happening here. A very mild amendment that seeks to uh, direct officials' attention, the, uh, ministers' attention to the fact that we should not be conducting these operations without considering whether or not the activities are for the benefit of the Australian community. Now, the balance is all wrong, with the scales firmly tipped in favour of exploration and extraction companies. Now, unsurprisingly, they're all standing there saying, no, don't, don't change anything. Don't change anything, because it's great for them. They try to spin and say that they're doing the right thing, but they're not. I've, uh, I saw uh, uh, Chevron's um, uh, submission to this inquiry, and they talked about employing uh, workers. They talked about they pay income tax. Well, I'm sorry, workers pay income tax. They're trying to chalk that up as their credit, that somehow we benefit because the workers pay income tax. Now, let me just uh, explain to you what the, the corporate tax situation is for some of these companies. And thank, thankfully, for, because of we, we've got ATO tax transparency data, we can now see what's going on. ExxonMobil Australia, $56 billion in revenue, rounded, and no tax paid, no corporate tax paid. Chevron Australia Holdings, $28 billion in revenue over five uh, tax years, and not a cent in, ta in corporate tax pay. ConocoPhillips Australia Gas Holdings, $7 billion with no, not a brass razoo of tax paid. They take our resources and they, they pay no tax. They pay us nothing for it. Santos, $23 billion in revenue with only $3 million in tax paid. Beach Energy, $6 billion in revenue with only $360 million paid. Now, we've heard in the chamber this morning correctly that Australia has become the largest supplier of liquefied national, uh, natural gas, 
Yet, for the financial year 2018-19, that delivered a paltry $1 billion through PRRT. By comparison, Qatar generated $26 billion on less gas. How does that work? How does that work? Now, I've been around long enough to, to have watched what happened in 2015, and the Labor government is to blame for this. They, they set up gas trains in, in Gladstone, and we saw uh, the, the production of gas uh, uh, go up significantly to the point where, in 2017, there were constituent companies in South Australia coming to, to my former uh, boss's office, uh, Senator Xenophon, and saying, we it's not that we can't get uh, a reasonable price. We can't even get a gas offer. We can't even get an offer to supply gas because all of the gas was being ripped out of the local uh, domestic supply so that companies could export it overseas. Now, of course, uh, as a result of negotiations, uh, and I was heavily involved in these for the, um, the Australian Domestic Gas Security Mechanism. We have seen the supply aspects of this addressed, but uh, has been, as has also been pointed out in this chamber, we have a situation now where we're the largest exporter of LNG, but we pay more here in Australia than what people in Asia pay for our gas, for our gas molecules. How does that work? It's unbelievable. But wait, there's more. There's more. Woodside Petroleum, one of, these, uh, one of these companies, an Australian company, dumped a floating production and storage, uh, an offloading asset, the Northern Endeavour, on, this, on a small undercapitalised company in 2016. So we're seeing this. We're seeing these uh, stranded assets now being palmed off to little players. And what happened? Nopsema uh, uh, intervened after uh, the new company took over the platform and drove the, drove the Northern Endeavour's owners into liquidation. And the end result is that the, FS, uh, the FPSO is now laid up in the Timor Sea, being crewed and maintained in lighthouse mode at taxpayers' expense awaiting decommissioning. Now, the cost thus far to the Australian taxpayer has been $100 million. Go and have a look at it in the, in the budget papers. You'll see a line item associated with the Northern Endeavour. So Woodside finished up with this, uh, this platform. They offloaded it, and then Nopsema puts the company out of business. I'm not speaking from, high, from hindsight. In 2019, I talked to Nopsema at estimates. I said, you run the risk of having this company go under and the Australian taxpayer owning the platform and having to pay for an oil platform. And they said, no, no, Senator, that's not going to happen. And that's exactly what did happen. So these companies come into Australia, they take our oil and gas, they don't give us any, any uh, return in terms of corporate tax. And then they offload their ageing platforms, and we're paying for that now. The, cost, the total estimate of cost to fix the Northern Endeavour, to uh, uncouple it from uh, its oil field and decommission the site and the vessel, is somewhere between $350 and $1 billion that the Australian taxpayer will pay for Woodside's aged vessel. And the, and the ironic thing is, the sad thing here is, the government went to Woodside and paid them, paid them by way of a contract to advise them on how to decommission it. That's right. So Woodside takes this platform, they offload it, and now they're charging us back to give advice on how to get rid of it. It's just unbelievable. You couldn't read about it. So Woodside's conduct in this is grossly immoral, bordering on criminal, and what the government has done is mind-numbingly stupid. Now, 
What's happening here? We've got a, a bill that's before the Senate that seeks to place uh, it, uh, as an objective in the Act some very, very sensible words, and that is that when NOPTA and NOPSEMA are carrying out their work and when ministers are looking at uh, things happening in the oil and gas industry, they must ensure that the exploration of these natural resources is for the benefit of the Australian community. But no, the government can't bring itself to vote for that, and neither can the Labor opposition. Now, I listen to Senator Ayres. He's normally quite articulate. He's very, normally very, very clear in what it is that he uh, says to this chamber. But he's all, he was all over the place. He talked about lo, uh, a, 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 lo, a lack of jobs. He talked about uh, the fact that uh, we're not getting any uh, return from, uh, from, these gas, uh, from these gas companies. He talked about uh, uh, a whole range of, uh, of things such as uh, you know, the, the fact that we're paying higher prices, the fact that we've got these import terminals. How crazy is that? We're the largest exporter of gas in the world, yet at the same time we're building import terminals? Seriously? That's how broken this is. And yet the government wants to maintain the status quo supported by the opposition. It's disgraceful. Very simple, uh, very simple words in Senator Hanson's bill to require people to consider the benefit to the Australian community and traitors on both sides of the chamber are simply saying, no, we don't want that. Senator Ayres recognises the problems but doesn't accept what Senator Hanson said, that this is a small nudge in the right direction. Why wouldn't you take it? It's unbelievable. I commend this bill to the Senate. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment benefit to Australia bill uh, 2020 seeks to insert a new objects clause within that act that reads as follows, to ensure that the exploitation of these natural resources is for the benefit of the Australian community. One nation have claimed that this will have ramifications for the operation of the Act, including the cancellation of underutilised oil and gas leases and the implementation of gas reservation requirements. The Department thinks otherwise, warning that, in its view, the proposed amendment is worded broadly and it is, in, it is unclear what benefit is being measured or how it could be quantified. As far as the Australian Greens go, we want to place a couple of things on the record. Firstly, the gas industry in this country is uh, one of the worst corporate actors in Australia's history. They have made obscene profits by cooking our planet, trashing our environment, trashing cultural heritage. And while they've been doing all those despicable and disgraceful things, they've avoided paying almost any tax, have employed barely anyone while funnelling billions of dollars offshore in profits. They have corrupted our politics with political donations and one of the uh, most smoothly operating revolving doors in this country, where former ministers, uh, former major party politicians in this place uh, once they've retired, roll out into cushy consultancy work with the gas sector. Now, of course, the gas sector is not alone in that. The, the banking sector does that. The gaming sector does that. Um, the coal sector does that. But the gas sector is right up with those, uh, with those other rent seekers, with those other parasites, with those other destroyers of our democracy in regards to a very, very a uh, smoothly operating rolling door, which has very, very deleterious impacts on our body politic. Now, let's make it clear uh, what gas is in this country. It is the fastest growing source of pollution 
in Australia, which is driving the breakdown of our climate. And of course, even as we give the, these speeches today, even as we debate this bill, our climate is breaking down around us. Gas is as dirty as coal. And of course, like coal, the overwhelming majority of the gas which we extract or mine in this country is exported overseas. But interestingly, of the gas that's not exported overseas, the biggest user of that gas, the biggest domestic user of gas in Australia is the gas industry itself. It's not the manufacturing industry, it's not domestic consumers. The biggest domestic user of gas in Australia is the gas industry itself, and that's because it requires massive amounts of dirty energy just to extract the gas and to process it into liquid to get it ready for export. Now, we heard some very interesting facts and figures from Senator Patrick, so I'm going to uh, add uh, some further facts and figures for uh, this chamber now in regards to, uh, to gas, um, the, the abject failure of the gas industry to pay its fair share of tax and uh, the extent to which the gas industry is, um, is polluting our environment and driving the breakdown of our climate. In the 2018-19 financial year, 28 major gas companies sold 55,112,837,464 dollars worth of gas and paid no tax whatsoever. No tax whatsoever paid by those 28 major gas companies who sold over $55 billion worth of gas. They paid no tax. It's about time we crack down on the tax avoidance industry in this country. It's about time we forced big corporations to pay their fair share of tax so we can fund the supports to our people that the Australian population expects. Those public services that they expect, like a functioning hospital system, like a strong public education system, like extra support for people with, uh, people with disabilities, like extra support for people in aged care, like extra support and investment into public transport to help us reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Those things we can fund if we make the big corporates pay their fair share of tax. Now, tax, big corporate tax avoidance is not limited to the gas sector in this country, but boy, oh boy, they are right up there in terms of their uh, absolute tax avoidance. And I'll just read out, uh, uh, I'll just mention a few companies uh, on the way through. Uh, for example, Chevron Australia Holdings Proprietary Limited in 2018-19 emitted 13.1 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent gases. In that financial year, Chevron Australia Holdings Proprietary Limited gave over $124,000 in political donations in this country and paid zero company tax in that financial year. Woodside Petroleum Limited in 1819 financial year, 9.2 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent emitted, over $280,000 given in political donations and no company tax paid whatsoever. Santos Limited, 5.8 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent emitted in the 18-19 financial year, $150,000 plus of political donations, zero company tax paid. These corporations are, are leeches on our body politic. They are leeches and parasites 
on our country, and they are getting away scot-free by avoiding their tax obligations in Australia and paying zero tax whatsoever. And why are they doing that? Because they've got the two major parties quite comfortably in their pocket. And there is no surprise to the Australian Greens that we are seeing a unity ticket on this legislation between the LNP and the ALP, because of course they both support the so-called gas-led recovery. They both support um, opening up massive new gas fields for fracking in places like the Galilee Basin and the Beetaloo Basin. And of course, they both love a bit of coal hugging and, and support uh, on a unity ticket the Carmichael coal mine proposed by Adani. So not only do these 28 major gas companies dodge their tax obligations, but they only employ uh, less than 0.2 of a per cent of the Australian workforce. And of course, over the journey, they've given tens of millions of dollars of donations, and now in return, you've got Mr Morrison and Mr Albanese wanting to give the gas industry our public money to expand. Well, enough is enough. Stop selling yourselves out. Stop selling Australians out. Stop selling our climate out. And stop coming in here and shilling for a gas industry that is buying your votes with their dirty political donations. Now, an expansion uh, of our gas industry uh, uh, using public funds, as supported by both major parties in this place, will not only squeeze out cheaper and cleaner renewables, but will actually lock this country in to decades of higher pollution, particularly greenhouse gas pollution and higher energy prices. The International Energy Agency has said we cannot have one single new piece of fossil fuel infrastructure if we want to meet the Paris Agreement. But of course, while both major parties in this place love to pay lip service to the Paris Agreement, when you look at what they're actually doing, they are both actively seeking to undermine it. Gas has no place in a clean, modern economy, and we need to be building a clean, modern economy so we can drive thousands of jobs in construction, tens of thousands more in smart manufacturing, and tens of thousands more in reforesting and rewilding so that we and urban greening so that we can actually help nature to draw carbon down from our atmosphere. The Greens have proposed, uh, are proposing a second reading amendment, which has been circulated um, uh, in the chamber. And that's based on our view that while, of course, we should be utilising our natural resources to the benefit of the Australian community, but we have to be careful about defining what that benefit actually is. Fossil gas is cooking our planet, and it's doing so uh, in the main through the methane released during extraction and transport, through the liquefaction of gas into LNG for export and through the combustion of gas in buildings, energy and the electricity sector. Benefit to the Australian community, particularly if you, as the Greens do, place value on the wellbeing of future generations of Australians, must take into account these climate impacts. If we're going to have any hope of meeting the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement and prevent us uh, driving over the climate cliff into significant collapse of our civilisation, we must have a plan to keep gas in the ground. That is why we are proposing a second reading amendment as follows that the Senate is of the opinion that Australia's offshore oil and gas industry is a large contributor to climate change and it is to the benefit of the Australian community to hold the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursue, limits, uh, pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. I mean, as I said, uh, what a surprise uh, we are now facing to watch the LNP and the ALP on a unity ticket on gas 
doing the bidding of their dirty corporate donors in this place, preparing their post-parliamentary careers through one of the most smoothly operating revolving doors in this place. And don't even get me started on uh, how we negotiated uh, the treaty over the Timor Sea um, uh, gas with uh, Timor-Leste when we bugged the Timor-Leste cabinet when they were uh, deliberating over the treaty and, uh, and uh, as a result uh, some of the big gas corporations absolutely made off like bandits, made obscene profits while uh, Australia's government actively worked to, um, uh, to ensure that Timor-Leste, one of the poorest countries in the world, was dudded through those negotiations. And the ramifications of that are still happening today, as Bernard Caleri faces court over a politically motivated set of charges. And Witness K uh, has, uh, has pled guilty, and, uh, and we are awaiting developments uh, in, the, in those legal matters. Now, uh, I say to colleagues, I say to colleagues, if you want to have a look at the corporate power, at the power of big corporate gas, uh, read Mr. Caleri's book. Read his book, and weep at the way that the gas industry in this country, like the coal industry, like the banking industry, like the gaming industry, uh, own politicians in this parliament, how they capture those politicians with their dirty corporate donations and how they, uh, they buy votes in institutionalised, with institutionalised bribery and the promise of cushy, uh, well-paid jobs once people have finished their efforts shilling for the gas industry in this place. I move the, I move the second reading amendment. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. This is a simple bill that does a lot, and I have to say well done to One Nation. I sort of wish I thought of it myself. All the bill does is it says that the benefits that come from Australia's natural resources should go to Australians. Not overseas, not to big multinational companies. Those resources belong to us, every Australian, and they should benefit us. They should be going back into our public hospitals. We shouldn't have people waiting on level one for months and months and months to get operations. We've got educational problems out there. We should be throwing money at everything we've got from there. Aged care, NDIS, mental health services, the list goes on and on and on. I don't understand how, in God knows how many years, Australia has come to this much of a mess when it comes to our resources that are sitting in our ground, how we've missed out on so much share of that. You've outsold us and you've undersold us. And the both of you parties in here should be absolutely ashamed of yourselves today. That's what we're talking about. And that's all this bill does. It says it should benefit Australians, it should come back to us. If at anything from here on in the future, if you're going to make deals and sell our resources, then make sure 51 per cent strays in Australian hands. Can't we at least do that from here on in? It does that by saying that the regulators that approve offshore mining projects have to make sure those projects benefit Australians before they can go ahead. It's simple, it's effective and it's common sense. Common sense. Who could be against making regulators make decisions about what's in the national interest? What's in Australia's interest? I'll tell you who, the Liberal and Labor parties. That's who? They've been underselling us out for years and you've ripped us off and you've ripped off the Australian people. And it completely blows my mind. It blows my mind that the major parties think that they're expecting our regulators to do the right thing by the country, by the country is controversial. What could possibly be controversial about expecting our regulators to put Australians first, eh? How about that? How can that be something you would worry about? This is the sad reality of where we are today. Liberal and Labor, they think it's fine to sell off Australians, sell out Australians, and that's what you've been doing for years. I'm surprised we own anything these days. They talk big on doing what's right by the country when it comes down to it, and they'll sell us out every time and as cheap as chips. That's where things are at. This sort of attitude is why Australian industry is in the state it's in. And don't even go into manufacturing. 
It goes well beyond offshore mining. They're selling the country out from under our feet, and you've been doing it for a very long time. The Tasmanian farmers know that's true. I say this to the major parties. Go and talk to them for five minutes, and in five minutes you'll see how much of a problem we have here. We're selling all our farmland to China. We're letting foreign investors buy up our country. Where's, what happened to our food security? You sold us out and everything else. What about our food security for our future, our children, our grandchildren? All our iconic Aussie brands, we're letting them go overseas. We're letting all our profits and benefits, the fruits of Australian workers' labour, get carved off overseas. The Australian companies that keep regional communities working, the companies that hold up and support entire regional towns, we're letting overseas investors come in and just buy them up. Just buy them up. And it's all going on under the mantra of free trade. Free trade? Free trade? Well, someone's getting something for free and ain't the people of Australia. They're not getting anything for free. The cult of free trade has made Liberal and Labor blind to what's going on under their own noses. They don't want to see the truth. They don't want to see what your decisions in the past have done to this country. Quite frankly, you should be ashamed of yourselves. I just don't get it. I don't know the reason why. I don't know if it's their political donors, more than likely so. And by the way, you can buy yours as cheap as chips. That's even more embarrassing. Or it's just plain arrogance. But they don't want to admit that we have a problem here. This is why I've been saying that we need to get our country making things again. Make Australia make again. Don't just sit out there and talk the talk. I want to see you walking the walk. And so do the people of Australia. We want to see manufacturing up in here. We want to be self-sufficient. That's what we want. Stop selling us out. Because I'll tell you what, there's not a lot left. There's not a lot left. And if there's anything that the past year has shown us, it's that we have, start, we have to start backing ourselves and backing our industry and backing the people here in our own country. Stop undermining us. Stop undermining our resources. Stop undermining the people of this country. If you don't think we're smart enough to carry it out, then have the courage to stand up and tell us so. We need Australian-made free trade. That's the lesson of the coronavirus. And yet uh, you've learnt nothing. You've learnt nothing out of this. That was your warning, and there'll be more to come, no doubt. God works in mysterious ways. It's called karma. If you haven't learnt from this and you haven't got manufacturing up and going, and you're out there just talking the talk and not walking the walk, then watch it come back to bite you fair on the backside, because it will. We've got to be self-sufficient again. We've got to start owning our own resources and owning our own industries, because what we make, we control. We control. Nobody else controls us. That's what the major parties don't seem to understand. They just don't get it, or maybe they don't want to get it. Maybe it's so far gone they have no idea how to fix it, is more to the point. This is what I say to them. We have to start backing our manufacturing sector. We have to strengthen the rules around foreign purchases of our key assets. And we have to diversify what we're making and who we're selling it to, so no other country can control the fate of ours. There's so much work that needs to be done. But every time the crossbench tries to get started, the major parties drag their feet. They put their fingers in their ears and their hands over their eyes. They just don't want to hear it, and it's terribly sad. This bill won't fix everything. As I said, it's a simple little bill. There's a lot, there, there's a lot that needs to be done. But what we're talking about today is it deals with one small part of a bigger problem. It's a start. It's pointing us in the right direction. It's clever and it's common sense. And once again, I thank One Nation for bringing it up in the chamber. And once again, I hear very little out of the major, major parties. Because, let's face it, the reason that we're in the situation we're in today is because of both of you. And that is shameful in itself. And that you can't even admit that these days, because apparently everything's rosy out there. I don't know where you guys sit. You might want to get out of your bubble and see what's really happening out there on the ground. Because I can tell you what, it'll bring tears to your eyes and where this country is right now. That's why I support this legislation. Everyone else in this place should do, do so as well. Shame on you that who do not. For once in your life you can make a difference in here today, which you will not, because you can't see through your own faults. You cannot see that. This country is a mess, if you haven't noticed. It is a mess. We've been selling it out for way too long. 
You've sold the Australian people out for year after year, and there's bugger all left out there. Well, I'd like some of that back, like the millions of others out there. We want that money going back into our health system, our aged care system. Don't worry about cutting the NDIS like you're already doing over there, the Libs, because exactly what you're doing, because if you'd invested in it in the first place and done the right thing, you wouldn't have to worry about money, because all those resources were out there giving cheapest chips to everyone else could have been coming back into the country. That money could have been serving in our schools, making our kids smarter by investing more into them. And this is where we're at today. Quite frankly, it's shameful. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, well, I rise to make some remarks on uh, this private senator's bill, uh, and I accept that there are laudable objectives uh, that are being pursued here by the crossbench. Uh, I will start by making it known that I have a particular philosophy of government, for government, uh, which I would describe as a form of Menzian liberalism, which, when it comes to these matters, uh, Menzies himself dealt with in a 1961 election speech where he said, governments have no money to spend except that which has been earned and paid over by tax or loan by the men and women of Australia. Now that is that is my philosophy for for government. That is my philosophy for government. Now when it comes to the conduct of large companies, uh, there is a basic judgment that governments need to make as to how these are regulated, how these are taxed uh, in the public interest. And in this country we have regimes to deal with that. But it's got to be based on the idea, in my view, uh, that the government itself can't be the generator of, of revenue, it can't be, the, um, it can't be the, the, the driver of the economy. That needs to be done by the private economy. And in our uh, world, where we live as a, with a small domestic population, but the 12th biggest economy on earth, uh, we must rely upon foreign investment, uh, private investment, both, in order to fund our lifestyles uh, into the future. And as I say, I think that there are some laudable objectives uh, in this bill where it comes to the question of uh, regulation and tax. There is no doubt uh, that the debate about large companies in, in terms of uh, banking institutions, technology companies, oil and gas companies is an important topic for this chamber. Uh, and it is one where good people will, will have different views. Uh, my view has been uh, that big tech should have more regulation. My view, especially following the Hain Royal Commission, was that there should be more regulation in the banking space. Uh, my view on oil and gas uh, is that there is a case, I think, that can be made that there should be more taxation paid. But taxation, uh, by the way, is not levied on revenue. Taxation is actually levied on profit. I think that is a, a sound principle. Uh, but I think we could look at this again uh, as we, we have a regime, the PRRT, which deals with these matters. And it is something that we need to be working in the interests of our country. Now, there has been an industry which has been driven by my former colleagues in the accounting profession designed to harness base erosion and profit shifting for large companies, and, and that has been a major issue. It's not an issue that Australia, by the way, can solve on its own. A base erosion and profit shifting is like climate change. Uh, you can only solve it through a multilateral framework, through uh, international agreements. Uh, I think most attempts to deal with it unilaterally are pretty futile. And so, of course, we can, we can consider going back to 1973 and 4 and talk about Rex Connor and his plans to nationalise resources. Uh, and that is not a good plan. I mean, that was not a successful period. Uh, the, you know, inflation of 15 per cent, and it took 20 years to get the budget back in the black. Uh, so I don't think we should do that. But I do think that these issues around the way that uh, large resources projects 
uh, have their tax arrangements set is an issue that we should pursue. Uh, I think there is a case to be made that more tax could be paid, but tax has got to be paid on profit. And of course, the two key outputs of the, the gas and oil industry, in my mind, are the large amount of investment that it creates, that it brings, largely foreign, uh, because we haven't got enough money in this country to develop our own country. We never have, we never will. Um, especially not the way the superannuation system has been allowed to run so poorly. Uh, and the other thing, of course, are, are jobs. So 30,000 direct jobs, 80,000 indirect jobs, uh, those are important things. Uh, but again, if the crossbench is seeking more taxation to be paid on profit, then I think that is something that could be pursued, but obviously not through this exact bill. And I think I now seek leave to continue my remarks. I now Thank yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Are you, you seeking to continue your remark? Seek leave to continue my remarks. Excellent. Thank you. Clerk. General Business Order of the Day number 43, National Consumer Credit Protection Amendment, Small Amount Credit Contract and Consumer <coughs> Lease Reform Bill 2019 number 2. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator Perez. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to support uh, the bill that's before the Senate. Uh, while it's moved by Senator McAllister, this particular piece of legislation, it's very important to understand that this is the government's bill. It's the government's bill that it hasn't brought forward to this place. It was commissioned by then Assistant Treasurer Mr Frydenberg in August 2015. It was later developed by then Assistant Treasurer Kelly O'Dwyer. She said at the time, legislation will be developed subject to the government's other legislative priorities, but at this stage is expected to be progressed during 2017. Well, they were heady days indeed. The legislation that she developed imposed a ceiling on the total payments that can be made under rent to buy schemes. It restricted the amount rental companies and payday lenders can charge customers. On 23 October 2017, then Minister McCormack released the exposure draft, promising the government will introduce legislation this year to implement the SACC and consumer lease reforms. More than three years later, here it is, word for word the government's bill. Disgracefully, it's not part of the government's own legislative agenda. What has taken the government's three years to fail to introduce legislation in this area. It's a confusion on the other side about whether they are for the shonks or the chances or the sleaze bags in the payday lending area, or whether they are for the interests of the banking industry, or whether they are for the interests of the high fee, low return retail funds. They are completely confused. The one thing that we know is that the people who claim to form the government of Australia in the area of finance regulation are never on the side of ordinary people. They are always on the other side of the ledger. What's the relevant minister been up to that was too important for this bill? Well, in December 2017, the member for Deakin, Mr Sukar, took responsibility for this portfolio, and the new assistant treasurer was very busy indeed. If media reports are to be believed, Minister Sukar's staff had previously taken a very close interest in Minister O'Dwyer's affairs and the affairs of the Liberal Party uh, in her, uh, in her uh, previous seat. There was even a Department of Finance in investigation into exactly how interested the electorate officers of Mr Sukar were in the, in the branch affairs of the Liberal Party. Bigger stacker in Victoria. Mr Sukar. However, the investigation conducted indeed by Mr Sukar's old firm ultimately found that he'd done no wrong. One could say that the Morrison government's narrow definition of the rule of law prevailed there too. No, despite the member for Deakin's considerable interest in local Liberal Party affairs, he failed to introduce this legislation to the parliament for ideological reasons. As The Australian reported in December 2018, 
The changes have run into opposition from some Liberal backbenchers who have raised concerns the crackdown imposes too many restrictions on the operation of the free market. They weren't alone. The Institute of Public Affairs sent a research note—a generous term—to all parliamentarians criticising the proposed law as just more red tape and based on paternalistic assumptions. And of course, there was all of the lobbying by appliance rental industry and payday loan providers. And the Treasurer was just too busy. And the misery that payday loans have created have simply become more entrenched over that period. Why was the Liberal government prepared to legislate then, but not now? In 2017, ASIC had reported instances where some consumers had been charged lease fees equivalent to an interest rate of 884 per cent per annum. One company, Signo Finance, was particularly notorious. It used a complex company structure to avoid regulators. It charged up to 1,000 per cent interest on the loans that it wrote. It aggressively marketed loans to vulnerable people, single mothers, Indigenous Australians, welfare recipients. There is an important relationship indeed between the failures of our welfare system and the payday lending industry. For Signo, one opportunity was the introduction of income maintenance in remote Indigenous communities in Western Australia. A community manager in the remote town of Warburton described how it would work. The government gives people these key cards to control how much these communities spend their social security payments. But they are rubbish, she said. It's hard to pay the bills with them, and they don't work when they need to. Then suddenly you have someone promising to transfer $200 in a couple of hours. That's powerful. So word gets around. Here are examples cited by ASIC when they finally shut Signo down. Firstly, a borrower who was an unemployed New Start recipient. The loan began at $120, became a $263 advance because of handling fees. I mean, for some people in this place, that's lunch. But for this person, $263 is a very significant amount of money indeed. Repayments were set at four fortnightly payments of $66. The borrower immediately defaulted. The total amount owed became $1,189. Another borrower, a DSP recipient, living on $850 a fortnight, loans of $200 and $150, Combined fortnightly payments $265, completely unconscionable. When he defaulted, the amount owed jumped to $2,630. When ASIC fi finally announced that they were cracking down, Signo Finance rebranded. They are still in business, trading as MyFi Services, completely brazenly, completely without any action from this government. Normally, Economic distress leads to an increase in payday lending, but so far the pandemic has been bad for payday lending. Some estimates have put cash converters at 70 per cent of the Australian market share for payday lending. In 2018 alone, they reported a $104 million revenue stream from their loan books. But the pandemic has slowed those rivers of gold, mostly coming out of the pockets of poorer Australians. The CEO of Cash Converters said in their latest annual report, our loan books, the engine room of the company, finished a combined 24.2 per cent below 30 June 2019. ASIC Chair Mr Hughes has speculated that the reason for this decline in lending is that borrowers from payday lenders are accessing support from other avenues, such as government support programs. It turns out that when you make the welfare system livable, people don't take out payday loans. Mr Hughes then told the COVID committee, when we get to what has been colloquially referred to as the cliff at the end of various support programs, we think that there will likely be an increase in utilisation of those payday lending programs. Of course, the payday lenders are all out there for the cliff. They want to see the end of job keeper and job seeker, because poverty pays for that industry, uh, and the government is at best a bystander. 
At the end of this month, job seeker, the job seeker rate will return to below poverty levels. Job keeper will end entirely. Not all sectors, industry and communities have been part of the recovery. In December, there were still one and a half million workers who rely on JobKeeper—10 per cent of the workforce. They are about to be left behind by the Morrison government. The Commonwealth Bank estimates that 110,000 workers will lose their jobs by the end of March. Two-thirds will be in what the bank calls high-risk industries—transport—22,400 job losses, accommodation—31,000 job losses, arts and recreation—15,400 job losses, according to the Commonwealth Bank. Those workers will now be forced to live on $44 a day by this government and will become victim and prey to exactly the payday lending industry that this government supports and props up. That economic pain will be concentrated in the regions that rely upon those high-risk sectors for employment. It will be felt in the local businesses that rely on that income being spent in their communities. That means that too many Australian families will, will go back to a position where they cannot afford the basic necessities of life, with no support from this government, no plan for jobs. And when Australian families are forced to make desperate financial decisions, they will be left at the mercy of an unscrupulous industry that preys upon them. The Morrison government is trapping Australians into poverty. The Senate inquiry into this bill led to a strange conclusion. Despite hearing clear evidence that the current regulation of payday lending is deeply flawed, the bill's proposed reforms would directly address those challenges that there are alternatives to consumer leases that allow low-income people to have access to credit at competitive rates, at conscionable rates. Government senators advocated not passing a bill written by their own team. It's an extraordinary proposition. The opportunity to help, the opportunity to provide a regulatory framework that supports the interests of low-income Australians when the only people on the other side of the argument are the payday lenders and this government chose to support the payday lenders and leave ordinary Australians uh, in poverty and to the mercy of this industry. A bill they drafted in response to their own inquiry into exploitation in the pay that the, they, they wrote, the committee acknowledges the commercial reality that those with higher credit risk ratings are charged more to access credit. The committee considers it appropriate that regulations are commensurate with this risk and that, at the same time, the regulation is sufficient to ensure customers are appropriately protected. What is the commercial reality for the 110,000 additional workers who are going to lose their jobs and be on $44 a day, prey to the payday lending industry? The heart of a P uh, on the other side uh, in terms of these issues are the decisions that those families have to make commensurate with the risk that they face? There was a brief moment in 2017 when members of the Liberal government—I lose track of whether it was Abbott or Morrison or Turnbull at the time—but members of this government were prepared to do the bare minimum to protect vulnerable people. The heady days of 2017 and 2018, when they actually understood what their responsibility in government was. But when Minister Sukar decided to reverse course, he chose a side. He chose a side, all right. He chose to ignore the suffering of Australia's most vulnerable people. He chose to support the worst elements of this industry that profit from the misery of ordinary people. The government members of the Senate Economics Legislation Committee they made the same choice. Government members who failed to stand up for vulnerable Australians in their caucus room are complicit with that choice. Government senators who vote against this bill 
and do nothing to deliver accountability from what passes for their finance and economics team are complicit with the government's failures in this area. The simple fact is that people like Minister Sukar and plenty of people on the other side of this chamber simply do not understand the decisions that desperate people have to make because they will never have to make them themselves. Their failure to imagine the lives of the poorest Australians, uh, whether they are long-term unemployed people and families or people who have been displaced by the government's failures to deal with the end of the JobKeeper program and the 110,000 additional people who will be thrown onto the ranks of the unemployed. It's their failure to actually be able to imagine their lives that means that they will continue to fail in this area, to, to continue to create additional misery and poverty in our communities. And it's that kind of failure of leadership, a failure of economic capacity that continues to hold this country back. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, and before I get to the substantive matters of the bill, I just I will take uh, a, a couple of points that Senator Ayres raised uh, uh, to task, because I think you really build the cat, Senator Ayres. You very much revealed through your speech that this is nothing more than a Labor Party stunt. You take a government bill and reintroduce it as a stunt. And that's because things do change. Things do move on. The structural frameworks under which we operate, particularly in our financial services sector, sector are extraordinarily complex. And um, as the environment in which we operate change, so too does the way that governments and the institutions of civil society, institutions including things like uh, uh, banks, uh, need to change as well. And so we see uh, the government that is responding. In fact, what Senator Ayres' speech completely failed to acknowledge, which is not particularly surprising, but that there is another piece of legislation in this identical space that has been introduced to parliament. In fact, the Senate uh, Economics Committee, which he talked about a bit, uh, has just finished considering that bill and uh, it will be debated in this place, I believe, shortly. Uh, so we have a situation where this bill, this particular bill, as a government bill, was overtaken by events. Uh, and now we have a, a government response that in, includes a response to more general uh, circumstances uh, in the economy caused particularly uh, by the pandemic uh, uh, that will address uh, the issues uh, in this bill and wider economic issues in the economy to do with uh, the provision of credit by banks and other financial institutions. Uh, the reforms are designed, the reforms that will uh, come, towards this, come to this place um, that cover a lot of the area uh, also covered by this bill, are designed to enhance financial inclusion and ensure that Australian consumers accessing small amount credit contracts and consumer leases are better protected. In fact, the government's uh, reforms uh, in the other legislation, again, which covers the broad area uh, that is covered by this bill, uh, those reforms strike the right balance between protecting consumers and maintaining a viable sector to provide these products. Uh, and I'll just pause briefly there. And it is important that, that these products are seen not merely through the prism uh, of, of their own uh, the nature of the product itself, but also through what other options are available to people in society. And sometimes those options uh, are not, not good. And we, and we heard in uh, committee hearings that people do seek to access credit through uh, non-legal means if no credit is available through legal means. And I think that is something that this place has to be cognizant of. The other options are actually very, very negative. Uh, when people go uh, and look at non um, non-regulated means of, of obtaining credit, then they're entering a very dark world indeed. Um, 
So while making it easier to, for, for Australians to access credit, the Morrison government uh, will not stand for predatory behaviour by small amount credit lenders and consumer lease providers. Uh, for the first time, consumer leases will be reg regulated by the Commonwealth to provide greater protections for consumers. The reforms include a person who receives 50 per cent or more of their net income from Centrelink cannot devote more than 20 per cent of their net income to small amount credit contracts and consumer lease repayments, with no more than 10 per cent of this being allocated towards SAC repayments. A person who receives less than 50 per cent of their net income from Centrelink cannot devote more than 20 per cent of their net income to small amount credit contracts or consumer leases. Uh, consumer leases uh, and these are separate caps. Uh, the reforms also include providing legislative support to ASIC for prescribed information to be disclosed by lessors and clarification of the penalties for imposing prohibited or excessive fees, charges and interest or breaching lease cost caps. Uh, responsible lending obligations will continue to apply to both of these products. And I, I think that's a really important point to make because it's something that has been lost in the public debate about, around, uh, about around responsible lending, that those responsible lending obligations are disappearing. They actually are not. For small amount credit contracts and consumer leases, they are not disappearing. It's important to note that these products play an important role in many people's lives. Um, the proposal that the government is bringing forward uh, strikes the right balance between protecting consumers and maintaining a viable sector to provide these products. Um, we make our position very clear, and the Labor stance and point scoring on this issue get us nowhere. Um, just some more detail on the small amount credit contracts. Um, we will implement those reforms, as I've talked about, to enhance financial inclusion and that the consumers of those types of products are better protected. They are a high cost form of borrowing, there's no doubt about that, and are more typically accessed by some of Australia's most vulnerable consumers. While these products can be useful for consumers, uh, and in the end, um, individuals uh, have to be given the right to decide their own financial futures. Uh, and, and can be useful as an emergency source of funding, repeated borrowing can lead to repayments and this can consume a great proportion of people's income and become increasingly unaffordable over time. So the reforms that we are putting forward are designed to limit consumer harm while maintaining access for small amount credit contracts and consumer leases. Uh, to this end, we will impose a cap on total payments that can be made under those consumer leases. The permitted cap on costs will be equal to the sum of the base price of the goods hired under the lease, permitted delivery fees and permitted installation fees multiplied by 4 per cent per month up, up to a maximum of 48 months. Lessors will additionally be able to charge a one-off establishment fee of 20 per cent of the goods base price. As part of those uh, wider reforms the government is introducing, we'll also introduce a new protected earnings amount for small amount credit contracts and consumer leases. Small amount credit contract providers and consumer leases will be prohibited from providing uh, such a contract that would result in a person who receives 50 per cent or more of their net income from Centrelink, devoting more than 20 per cent of their net income to small amount credit contracts and consumer lease repayments, uh, with no more than 10 per cent of this being allocated towards small amount credit contract repayments. A person who receives less than 50 per cent of their net income from Centrelink from devoting more than 20 per cent of their net income to small amount credit contracts or consumer leases. These protected earning amounts will maintain access to credit while ensuring enhanced protection for the most, most vulnerable consumers. Again, getting back to the broad framework that we have in place, this is an area that has undergone a significant change over a long period of time. Um, going back to 2009 with the National Credit Framework being established, which involves such things as a licensing regime, responsible lending, dispute resolution and a national credit code. Uh, in 2011 we saw changes for improved disclosure, restrictions on unsolicited credit, 
uh, prohibited fees being charged. Uh, in 2014, we have comprehensive credit reporting introduced, allowing for posit positive credit information on borrowers to be shared. Uh, in 2018, I think this, is, this will be looked back at in the future as, as a very important date, uh, the establishment of AFCA. Because AFCA has provided a forum by which individuals can take complaints uh, in, the, in the lending space to an independent authority um, at no cost to themselves. Again, very important. This is not weaponising and forcing people into the courts at extraordinary cost, because we all know that that, we all know that, that cost barrier uh, entering the legal system on, particularly on small amount credit contracts, but even, even on larger amount contracts for, uh, for average income earners can be very difficult. I mean, going to court is an extraordinarily expensive business, even if you believe you have a very, very good case. Uh, so AFCA uh, and the, the, the delivery of AFCA as a, a low-cost uh, independent authority where disputes can be resolved uh, in a way that is um, advantageous to consumers has been a great step forward. And uh, I think the, the information coming out of AVCA to show that, um, I, I, I believe, and I'm doing this off, off from memory, but I believe that some 70 per cent uh, of um, claims are found I, I to, um, to favour uh, the, the um, consumer, uh, of resolutions are found to favour the consumer in AVCA proceedings. So I think uh, I will correct the record if I'm wrong on that, but I'm, I'm reasonably sure I'm correct. So we have, a, we have a relatively new 2018, so it's only been in place for, for three years, uh, dispute resolution uh, body, which is proving to be very advantageous to consumers and is something that I think that uh, as a government we can be very proud of, but as a society we've now got an avenue towards the re resolution of disputes. Uh, and where people perhaps are sold products or enter into arrangements that that um, that are not advantageous um, to them and have some some legal problem in them, uh, where those disputes can be resolved in a way that is low cost uh, to all parties and uh, results in a fair outcome for consumers. So I'll leave my remarks there. Again, this bill, putting this bill up in this way is merely a stunt from the Labor Party and we will not be supporting the bill. Senator Gianneke. Uh, thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. And uh, I listen with great interest to my colleague uh, Senator Brockman's comments there, but uh, uh, fundamentally it's, uh, it's quite a distinct issue from just mere politics. Now, I just want to put a couple of uh, pieces of evidence on the, on the record before I uh, get into some more substantive issues. Uh, the Consumer Law Action, uh, the Consumer Action Law Centre noted the lure of these products. I think people will often act in the most simple, convenient way to deal with hardship in front of them. When someone is faced with a stressful situation, when they're experiencing some form of desperation, They'll be attractive to what seems the easy option, and I think that that would be generally uh, accepted as a as a proposition when people face a uh, you know a calamity, a, an illness, a, a loss of a job, uh, the inability to put uh, you know milk in the fridge because the fridge is blown up. Uh, I think people will look for a solution very immediately, and we do live in a society where. You know, you can't not have, you know, a TV, a fridge, and, and the like. So, I think that's quite uh, an instructive piece of evidence. And I think it's also important to go back to um, Commissioner Kenneth Hayes' final report, where he said, "My conclusion about issues relating to the NCCP Act can be summed up as apply the law as it stands." Commissioner Hayne made a clear recommendation relating to the NCCP Act. The NCCP Act should not be amended to alter the, sent, the obligation to assess unsuitability. And I think these are uh, <clears throat> very clear, uh, clear pieces of evidence that point us in the right direction. You know, when people get into trouble, 
they're going to look for the, you know, the solution. And the solution is a loan. They're not going to read the fine print. They're not going to examine the punitive or penalty, uh, uh, punitive interest rates. They're going to deal with the immediacy of their situation. And I think it is incumbent on the, uh, <clears throat> the government. And I think uh, Senator Brockman's contribution about the uh, uh, about the um, <clears throat> uh, limitations on how much a Centrelink uh, uh, recipient can uh, can borrow uh, are, are very good, very good, and and should be in place. And my experience in that area, uh, dealing with a friend of mine, is that uh, once they get to that stage uh, where they're you know getting a uh, uh, a deduction from Centrelink. They quite often have access to a no-interest-free loan uh, run by the various not-for-profits, which are really good. And he's told me ad infinitum that once people have been through the mill a couple of times, and they do get to the stage where, you know, they have to make decisions about, um, you know, how they afford the normal necessities of life, they become very skilled at it. But it's an inordinate journey to there. Quite often they're under tremendous stress and strain through punitive interest rates and penalties. And I think the, uh, you know, the Royal Commission uh, did point to a, a period where there was substantial redress for people who were um, you know, given money um, when it was clearly unsuitable for them. They couldn't repay it. And the, uh, <clears throat> the, the situation there hasn't really improved much, and I don't think that weakening the standards is simply going to improve the lot of people who are very vulnerable to predatory uh, loans. I mean, I, I saw an ad on the TV the other day which says, don't worry about payday, payday can be today. So I don't know what that's about. It basically, do you, do you hand over your... Uh, your income to a third party and you can just withdraw it early. I mean, how does that help you? <laughs> Payday is Thursday and you can take your money out on Monday. You're still broke by Saturday. You know, so there are all sorts of things going on in this space which I think we should be uh, cautious about. And if we look at the, you know, the end of uh, JobKeeper, and look, great program. Great program. Can't go on forever. <coughs> But it may well be that uh, we're going to see more people moving to Job Seeker, which, albeit has had a slight increase, is still a very, very uh, meagre amount. Now, people will borrow when faced with a, uh, a crisis in their life. And I'm not sure that this is the way to go forward with it. And I mean, the government's been uh, uh, failing to act, if you like, since 2017. Um, delivering more business to pay their lenders and consumer lessers at the expense of ordinary Australians. Now, I don't know what we do in terms of um, you know, people having access to credit when they desperately need it, other than we should go and fund the no interest loan providers to the maximum we can possible. Because there is proven uh, track record there of people coming to terms with their financial uh, uh, budget, making plans which work, and going on to making smart commercial decisions. And how they work, is, as has been explained to me, is that people will sit down with, uh, with the consumer. They will then go to uh, their budget. They'll go through the budget, and they will say, look, Here's your amount that you can spend. It may be $1,300. That's the amount that you would qualify under a no interest loan. And we want you to go out into the consumer world and get a deal. Get three deals. But don't make any commitments till you come back to the no interest free loans uh, uh, advisor and we'll see how you went. And they do. And they're very proud to go out and get three quotes. And what normally happens is they the, the advisor will say, look, fine, you've done good work here. This is how the world actually works. But what I want you to do now is go and see this provider because I'm pretty sure he can beat 
the three loans you've got. And the lesson learned is get quotes. Check the market, see what you've been offered, count the cost of the loan. And the no interest free loan uh, situation has a great deal with the good guys and invariably they, uh, they meet and match whatever's available and undercut, if you like, what's in the marketplace. And the, the consumer, and it's usually a woman, it's usually a woman, a uh, single mother, who for whatever reason is in a precarious circumstance, but she will learn through that process to take power and take control of her own budgeting and, and grows exponentially during this process. This is what people tell me. So rather than making it easy for payday lenders to prey on people, we as a national parliament and the government particularly should be making it much better to in increase financial literacy in this sector. Increase the financial literacy in this sector where you perhaps don't need so much regulation or, or um, regulation or legislation. Because clearly at the moment it's desperation versus opportunity. Desperation versus the need for that fridge, the need for that computer, the need to keep the household going. And in that environment, people are not making great decisions. And I, you know, I do say it's two sides of the street. Uh, a credit provider can offer it, and if they disclose the terms uh, and someone takes it, it's not a great decision by the consumer, but often it's driven by desperation. And we do know that those on you know, uh, part-time employment, those on the minimum wage and those on job seeker and the like, uh, disability payments, they're not in a position to make too many uh, discretionary decisions about expenditure. It's virtually, it's happened, I need to fix it, let's go and do it. Now, some of the things that are, uh, are, are currently uh, at odds with the, uh, what we would say is the norm is that payday lenders can charge equivalent interest rates of more than 200 per cent per annum. And there is no cap at all on the cost that can be charged by these lease providers. Lenders continue to sign up people to loans and leases with unaffordable repayments, which cause people to wind up in a debt spiral and struggling families left in debt or poverty. I mean, surely the federal government is not in favour of that. Surely the federal government is not in favour of a, a predatory system that you know, ends up with people entrenched in debt and poverty. Now this bill directly challenges these, uh, uh, addresses these challenges. It's got a cap on the total repayments that can be made under a consumer list. There's better regulation of repayment and repayment intervals. Removal of fees from the loans that have been fully paid. Prohibition of door-to-door -door selling. Anti-avoidance protections. And stronger penalties for wrongdoing. And then penalties for wrongdoing is one area in this, uh, uh, right across the whole financial, uh, financial area. I don't see too many penalties being applied to people. The Royal Commission pointed to a, a good area of success, but this bill removes some of that protection. I don't see, and I know that uh, Senator Brockman uh, referred to ACFA, but I don't see that there's any particular trail of evidence that they've been the good cop on the beat. I don't see the evidence to that. What we are seeing is evidence of, uh, you know, perhaps a lack of uh, uh, protection for people. And this bill would make, uh, you know, this bill would make it much better for consumers. The 2019-20 summer bushfires, COVID-19 pandemic, has increased financial vulnerability and rendered more Australians vulnerable to the promise of small amount credit contracts and consumer leases. Also, young people are increasingly concerned about their financial security and are more likely to be taken on debt as a means of relieving immediate financial stress. Consumer protections are needed more than ever. I think that's a very important point. Consumer protections are needed now more than ever as we move into the uncertainty of uh, the post-pandemic, if we get vaccinated, if we can start moving around this country again, if people get back to reasonable amounts of employment, if you know 100,000 people don't drop onto the 
uh, Centrelink uh, job seeker market. You know, we need to be cautious. So this bill, I think, it should be supported because it's not doing anything particularly underward. We know that in certain areas the economy is actually overheating. We know that the uh, housing area is just blown out of the water. It's exponentially um, overheating. And, and there will be other bills that come before the uh, parliament also uh, moving, uh, you know, sort of uh, discretionary sort of uh, limitations for the purpose of driving the economy. <coughs> now, I'm not sure how we can drive the economy from this point. From this is the point of the most vulnerable consumers in the economy, from those who are going to face stress, who are going to face uh, an immediacy, immediate problem which they're going to require to borrow some money from. For. And I'm not sure that we can see clearly that this is going to drive the economy forward. It may well just drive another bubble along the way, which is a bubble of disaster and despair, of poverty and debt, where families, um, disproportionately you know, low-income families, are going to find themselves in an awful predicament uh, in the not-too-distant future. Because if the economy doesn't improve and they don't have full employment and they slip further into job seeker or less than full employment, if they have one of these uh, payday loans, which is up to 200 per cent interest, it's got predatory uh, fees in it, it's going to be tough. And there are only one, you know, one dose of COVID. There are only one dose of COVID away from disaster if their income dries up altogether, if they're casual and they get sick, you know, or if there's a, an illness in the family, an accident in the family. They end up with this sort of uh, uh, predatory debt which will push them down further at a time of most vulnerability. So I support Senator McAllister's uh, efforts here to bring back fairness and equity into this sector and keep prudent, prudent um, regulation in place which would limit the ability of people to prey on the most vulnerable section of our community. And I would also like to finish up by saying if the government wanted to do something smart, it would put a whole lot more money into no interest free loans and the not for profit groups that administer those schemes so very well across this country because they improve the financial literacy of the recipients exponentially and will go some way to relieving the need for any of this legislation. Senator MacDonald. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, I rise to speak against uh, this private senator's bill. Uh, and I you know, do acknowledge that it has been brought with good intention, but uh, just a lack of understanding of the, both the environment, uh, the financial environment, as well as um, the existing and uh, additional uh, changes that are being made by this government. I listened very carefully to uh, Senator Gallagher. He is a um, a very significant contributor to the Economics uh, Legislation Committee, and under the, uh, the um, steady hand of the chair, Senator Brockman, um, we had a very good investigation into the government's proposed uh, changes to SAC lending. And, uh, and so I have a very good understanding of both the environment that has been that is in place. Uh, the changes that are proposed by the government by this bill, but also um, we heard a great deal of evidence from uh, a, a huge number of community groups of lenders um, and, uh, and consumer representing organisations. And you know there was so much detail that uh, was useful to the committee, um, and I reflect on a number of the things raised uh, today that have already been discussed. Uh, but one thing that I would um, remind um, the opposition about is the, is the reality that exists in regional Australia, particularly in my part of the world, of far north and western Queensland, where the access to capital um, is sometimes difficult for small credit, uh, particularly uh, given uh, that banks uh, banking, the large banking institutions are withdrawing from that part of the world. 
and uh, COBRA-operated uh, banks, which are so important to the successful uh, financial environment in northern and western Queensland, uh, still have a huge amount of regulation that it makes it difficult for them to compete, but they do provide a terrific service. But as far as um, uh, other sort of lending goes, it is critical that there be an environment that allows for uh, easier access to finance, um, uh, which remains still well regulated and overseen uh, for people who are in difficult circumstances. Um, Senator Gallagher used the example of the fridge going. I mean, that is a very good example of, um, uh, of a requirement for uh, finance you know, people urgently need access uh, to something that otherwise would be a difficult and long process to go to. Um, and I also want to draw um, the Chamber's attention to uh, AFCA. AFCA is a free, fair and independent authority which manages uh, complaints and claims, and we heard evidence from them about the speed and the success that they have in attending to uh, complaints that consumers have around uh, any poor practice that may exist um, in the financial industry. I also acknowledge uh, contributions made around the lack of financial literacy uh, in the community. This is something that disturbs me enormously and it's something that I think we would be uh, well served to provide education to uh, young people and uh, particularly as they leave school and they start working. Uh, I remember that when I started working as an accountant on Friday afternoon, I would receive my pay uh, in a little envelope in cash, and you can imagine uh, just how difficult a temptation that was to manage not spending that over the weekend. Uh, so that is a, a, you know, fortunately with the reduction of cash and the economy, that is less of a challenge to young people today who now generally receive a direct debit or other form of payment. Um, the government is on the record about making its position clear on these reforms and will not support Labor's and others' political point scoring on this important issue. The purpose of the laws is to reduce the risk of SAC consumers who are often on lower incomes and in potentially precarious financial position or at risk of becoming unable to fund their basic needs or other necessary commitments as a consequence of entering into a SAC. It will also make it easier in some respects to obtain credit, ensuring the sector's viability and allow people who utilise such lending on a regular part as a regular part of their lives to continue. The reforms also includes providing legislative support for ASIC to prescribe important information to be disclosed by lessors to customers and a clarification of the penalties for imposing prohibited or excessive fees, charges and interest in breaching cost caps. While making it easier for Australians to access credit, the Morrison government will not stand for predatory behaviour by small amount credit lenders and consumer lease providers. And the bill amends the Credit Act to establish a mechanism for restricting the payments that are allowed under a SAC for all consumers and we will cap repayments at a maximum of 10 per cent of a, of a customer's net income. There are some terrible stories on supported incomes of people on supported incomes being trapped in a never-ending debt cycle after being lured into unsuitable credit arrangements. And news reports recently highlighted a woman who borrowed $75 but to have to pay back $110 with interest and fees. Another woman on Centrelink borrowed $250 but her total debt repayment totaled $880. Another woman, woman claimed she'd borrowed $100 to buy food and ended up repaying over $1,000 due to late fees and interest. And so for this very reason, the reforms also include that a person who receives 50% more or more of their net income from Centrelink cannot devote more than 20% of that to consumer lease repayments, with no more than 10% of this being allocated towards SAC repayments. 
Additionally, that a person who receives less than 50 per cent of their net income from Centrelink cannot devote more than 20 per cent of their net income to SACs or consumer leases. And these are separate caps. The permitted cap on costs will be equal to the sum of the base price of the goods hired under the lease, permitted delivery fees and permitted installation fees multiplied by 4 per cent per month up to a maximum of 48 months. Lessors will additionally be able to charge a one-off establishment fee of 20 per cent of the goods base price. SACs and consumer leases are high cost forms of borrowing and are more typically accessed by some of Australia's most vulnerable consumers. And while these products can be useful for consumers as an emergency source of funding, repeat borrowing can lead to repayments consuming a greater portion of income, becoming increasingly unaffordable. This proposal strikes the right balance between protecting consumers and maintaining a viable sector to provide these products. I think it is also important that we understand the cost of regulation on this industry. Uh, this cap of uh, 4 per cent per month up to 48 months will mean that there will be a number of credit providers who will no longer be able to afford to provide credit in this space. These are people who previously were able to provide uh, credit to to consumers, to customers who are in urgent need of finance, but uh, the cost of regulation will mean that that cap, that cap on the interest rate will not allow them to cover the cost of doing business. And that is of some concern to me because currently they are providing a service, a service to Australians who for one reason or another need urgently to access finance in a regulated market. And I think that is the critical part. If we do not provide a regulated market for credit lending, then people are forced to go outside of the market. They are forced to move outside of the regulated market where you can have very, very bad outcomes indeed. And I don't need to go further into that. I'm sure we all understand uh, what some of the criminal activity has been in the past. And that is why it is important that uh, this government provides a strong regulated environment, a safe environment for Australians to access credit uh, as, they are, as they require to. Thank you. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, to Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, just observing what Senator Macdonald said then about this bill being misguided, I think we've got to actually have a look at the basis of this bill, uh, which was actually the exposure draft legislation that this government actually put out for consultation. Um, so that is the actual substance of what we're putting forward here, um, which we have done so continuously now since the government failed to act on this back in 2017. I wanted to condemn uh, con mend the work of Senator McAllister uh, and the work that she has been doing, and also my good friend, the member for Oxley as well, Milton Dick, um, who's also been highlighting government inaction on this. And the consequences of inaction are issues that are being felt by the community right across the country. And it is unfortunate that these challenges have been accentuated by the pandemic and what Australians are dealing with at the moment where there, is, there are a lot of people out there who are feeling uh, the pain of the economic challenge that Australians are confronting. And the reality is, is that the inaction of this government is actually making that challenge worse for so many Australians. We saw that with what the government have done in regards to superannuation with allowing early access for people, um, which has accentuated this problem. And we're also going to see it in a couple of weeks' time when the government and JobKeeper as well. And I certainly know from my travels through regional Queensland last week that that is going to have a devastating impact on so many people across Queensland, but no doubt across the country at the same time. So it is disappointing that 
the government haven't used the opportunity that we've presented to them today with this bill to actually tackle one of those challenges head on, and that's uh, in regards to the Consumer Credit Protection Amendment. Uh, and as I said, this does replicate the exposure draft legislation that was released for consultation by the government in 2017. And the bill was the response to a review the government commissioned in 2015 to tackle the increasing exploitation of people who entered into small amount credit contracts and consumer leases. Stakeholders and the broader community responded to the draft legislation, but the government has so far failed to act. Uh, Senator Chisholm, the time for debate has expired. You will be in continuation. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business. I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number two, higher education support amendment, freedom of speech bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Betts, I believe you're in continuation. In the few moments left, I turn to the issue of how this bill intersects with faith-based higher education institutions. As my colleague Mr Lisa advised, the other place, the former Victorian Crown Counsel Mark Sneddon, uh, made this observation. The current Western secular notion of academic freedom used in the French report implicitly values knowledge derived through empirical, scientific and closed universe knowledge, rather than knowledge which is in part derived through faith, traditions and revelation. That sets the scene for an academic staff member or a student to claim an academic freedom to deny the faith, tradition and revelation on the basis of the empirical data and secular logic. The French and Walker reviews didn't ask nor consider this issue in their reports. There are real, albeit thankfully few examples of academics at faith-based institutions who have recanted on, their, on the core beliefs underpinning their particular institution. And when eight institutions with an, with an enrolment of about 10,000 students express a concern, it's appropriate to take note. Our schooling system rightly acknowledges Islamic teachers for Islamic schools as being an essential requirement for maintaining the school's ethos. So too Christian teachers for Christian schools. Similarly with broadcasting in our community, we expect a particular standard from our publicly funded broadcaster, which may rightfully differ from our private or community radio stations, be they Joy FM in Melbourne or 106.5 in Hobart, southern Tasmania. Protecting the integrity and reason for being of our faith-based institutions is vital. At this late stage, I would respectfully suggest for consideration by the government the inclusion of the following statement in the explanatory memorandum. And it is as follows. Higher education institutions which have a religious ethos may require their staff and students to exercise their freedom of speech and academic freedom in a manner that does not denigrate and is respectful of the beliefs and practices of the religion and its adherents and the religious ethos of the institution. Now, I acknowledge the procedural issues with this request uh, might. Uh, be in the uh, current state where we are with this uh, bill. And so, as a minimum, could I invite the minister with carriage of the bill to include in the summing up the statement made in the other place, confirming that this bill does not intend to impact on the right of faith-based institutions to hire and continue to employ staff in accordance with their religious ethos. That said, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I commend the bill to the Senate, but with the last uh, comments that I've made, invite the uh, government to uh, consider the protection of faith-based institutions. Senator Scar. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I, speak, uh, I rise to speak in favour of the bill before the Senate. And in doing so, I'd like to open with what I consider to be the best articulation of the essential purpose of a university. And that was by the founding member of my party, Sir Robert Gordon Menzies, who said, and I quote, 
The university must be the custodian, custodian of mental liberty and the unfettered search for the truth. End quote. And I think that concept, that idea, that articulation of what goes to the very essence of a university goes to the heart of all which I'm going to contribute in relation to this debate. And when Sir Robert Gordon Menzies spoke about the unfettered search for the truth as being core to the university's mission, our universities need to be unfettered by codes of conduct which overstep the mark and go too far into the realm of freedom of speech and academic freedom. They need to be unfettered by uh, a sense of managerialism which does not give appropriate recognition to the essential essence of the university. And they need to be unfettered by any submission to the wishes of donors or powerful stakeholders with respect to uh, free intellectual inquiry which occurs on our campuses. And this principle, in my view, needs to be absolutely embedded into the culture of all of our universities. Because if it isn't, then I would say that those institutions which do not recognise those principles going to the heart of their essence, their very being, should not be referred to as universities. There are a number of important concepts which came out of the French Review in relation to, in relation to the issues relating to free speech and academic freedom of our camp, camp, campuses. And I think there are two concepts coming out of that review which, from my perspective, go to the heart of the recommendations. And the first, that freedom of lawful speech on our campuses is a paramount value. It's a paramount value. It's not another value to be recognised. It's not something to be considered in the course of 51 clauses in a code of conduct. It is a paramount value. And there's no better articulation, in my view, with respect to the importance of freedom of speech than in John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty, where he talked about the importance of freedom of speech from two perspectives. First, the perspective from the, per from the point of view of, of the human of human rights, of the individual, of the individual's right to speak their mind in a lawful manner and to give voice to their ideas and their concepts. And secondly, the second perspective, just as important, is the right of others to listen and hear that point of view so that they can, they can consider that point of view, reflect on what they believe, and out of that exchange of ideas come out with a better understanding of the reasons why they believe what they believe. And that paramountcy needs to be reflected by our universities. The second concept coming out of the French Review was that academic freedom is a defining value. Again, not another value to be considered in the 51 clauses of a code of conduct, but a defining value, going to the essence of what it means to be a university. Ultimately, the French Review made a number of recommendations, and these recommendations these recommendations were made with a view to strengthening freedom of speech and academic freedom on our campuses. And it was recommended that, the, that freedom, protection for freedom of speech and academic freedom be strengthened within the sector by the adoption of umbrella principles embedded in a code of practice for each institution. And we've seen over the course of the last 12 months the putting into effect of that recommendation. And I'd like to refer to the findings coming out of the review of the adoption of the Model Code on Freedom of Speech and Academic Freedom, which was prepared by Professor Emeritus Sally Walker and released on December 2020. And there are a number of findings there which I think go to the importance, firstly, that the French Review occurred, and secondly, that that process of strengthening freedom of speech and academic freedom on our campuses needs to be done. And the first reflection I'd like to make in terms of the finding of that recent review in relation to implementation is this, that a number of the universities, when their codes were reviewed, seem to just value freedom of speech and academic freedom. They seemed not to go to that extra step of actually being committed to it. It is not enough 
simply to value academic freedom. Academic freedom must be a defining value of our universities. It is not enough simply to value freedom of speech. It must be a paramount value. And I do call upon all of those universities who did not, in my view or in the review, or in the review of the professor who undertook the review of the implementation of the, of the codes at the relevant universities, I do uh, call upon those universities to reflect and consider the primacy which, with which they give academic freedom and freedom of speech in their university policies. The second observation coming out of the review by Professor Walker was that a number of the universities added provisos or qualifiers to academic freedom and freedom of speech as values. And let me give the Senate some examples. Some universities wanted to qualify freedom of speech and academic freedom with provisos such as, and I quote, standards of scholarship, close quote, professional standards, or academic freedom and freedom of speech must be conducted, open quotes, reasonably, professionally and in good faith, close quotes. And unfortunately, in a number of these articulations of their codes, there was a lack of definition given to what does standard of scholarship mean? What are the relevant professional standards? What does it mean for an academic to engage in good faith? And the issue with all of these qualifications and provisos is that they water down the fundamental concepts of freedom of speech and academic freedom. Freedom of speech, a paramount value. Academic freedom, a defining value of our universities. The third point I'd like to make in relation to Professor Walker's review is to give my congratulations, my heartfelt congratulations, to the institutions who Professor Walker identified as exemplars, exemplars in terms of their introduction of the code. And there were three. La Trobe University's Protection of Freedom of Speech and Academic Freedom Policy, the University of Sydney's Charter of Freedom of Speech and Academic Freedom, and RMIT University's Intellectual Freedom Policy. So each and every one of those institutions should be congratulated with respect to how they have implemented the French Review recommendations. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, a senator on the other side of the House who I always listen very carefully to. No, Senator Ciccone, I'm not referring to you in this case. I do listen to you very carefully, but uh, not in this case. Uh, is uh, amongst, amongst others, including Senator Ciccone and Senator Watt, I won't leave him out, is uh, Senator Carr. And Senator Carr did uh, tend to focus somewhat with respect to the fact that uh, French, in his review, did not find did not find that there was a crisis of freedom of speech or academic freedom in our campuses. And I think Senator Carr did make a reasonable point that that was certainly the finding that uh, was contained in the uh, outcomes, the recommendations from the French Review. However, that is not to say, that is not to say that there aren't issues which need to be addressed, because there are issues which need to be addressed and addressed very carefully. On 13 February 2021, I was listening to Saturday Extra with Geraldine Duke, as I sometimes do, on the ABC. Senator Ciccone, you obviously uh, are also uh, a frequent listener of uh, Ms Duke. And she was uh, interviewing uh, Mr Greg Craven. Now, Mr Greg Craven is a very esteemed academic in this country. He was Vice-Chancellor and President of Australian Catholic University from January 2008 to January 2021, and he had a long esteemed career prior to that. And whenever Mr Craven uh, writes an article or gives a, a view, I listen extraordinarily carefully. And I want to read you a quote from that interview, which caused me great concern, and I quote, People in conservative parties who think about intellectual conservatism are now looking at universities and saying, this is odd, you are meant to play both sides of the intellectual street. We don't think you could be a conservative at your university. We don't think you could get tenure. We don't think you could publish. It has moved on to become a very serious question. 
If we have universities which are, by definition, meant to be universal, but really are only prepared to tolerate one side of debate, then it's not surprising that the political expression of the other side of the debate is suspicious. Mr Craven continues, and this is perhaps the most damning indictment I've read for some time about the state of academic diversity in some of our universities. And I quote again from Mr Craven. As someone who has been an academic for 39 years, I have seen universities in multiple contexts pretty well crush conservative academic careers. If I had a young conservative thinking, brilliant academic come to me and say, would it be a good idea to pursue an academic career in Australia in history, law or political science or literature? I would say no. I would say no. And that's what Mr Greg Craven, who was Vice Chancellor and President of ACU from January 2008 to January 2021, said, and that would be his advice to a young conservative thinking brilliant academic embarking on their career. And that troubles me greatly, Mr Acting Deputy President, and I think it should trouble our chancellors and vice-chancellors of universities that Mr Greg Craven, someone who has been a vice-chancellor and an esteemed academic, comes to that view. These are his words, not mine, that if I had a young conservative thinking brilliant academic come to me and say, would it be a good idea to pursue an academic career in Australia in history, law or political science or literature, I would say no. Well, that, Mr Acting Deputy President, is not good enough. And our universities need to be, do better to make sure that we have diversity of academic thought. And in conclusion, in that respect, in terms of diversity of academic thought, I reflected uh, on a great professor who I had, and I know Senator Watt, I think he went to University of Queensland. Senator, yes, he did. He went to uh, University of Queensland. So hopefully he would fondly remember, I'm sure he would, being the fair, magnanimous person he is, uh, a great uh, university academic by the name of Dr Suri Ratnapala, who was a professor of jurisprudence when, when I went to university. And Professor Ratnapala was one of the world's leading experts in relation to the writings of Frederick Hayek, who is one of my heroes in terms of academic thinking, and who wrote uh, the most, uh, I think, powerful rebuttal of socialism that has ever been written in his text, Road to Serfdom. And the story I want to tell about Suri Ratnapala is how he assessed, how he assessed the exam, which was written by one of my friends at university, who was of a totally different political persuasion to mine. This was someone who would declare himself as a Marxist, unashamedly Marxist. And he did Dr Ratnapala's course with me, and he wrote in his exam, his main essay, was a Marxist critique on Hayek's theories. A Marxist cr critique of, uh, of Hayek's theories. That's what he did in his exam. Now, my exam contribution was somewhat dif different from my Marxist friend, but my Marxist friend got a high distinction from Dr Ratnapala, a seven as we used to call it. He got a high distinction from Dr Ratnapala in terms of his Marxist critique. I got a distinction, I was pretty happy with that, but my Marxist friend got a high distinction. Why? Why? because the professor was impressed with the critical thinking, the, uh, the contribution, the intellectual thought that was put into that exam. There was no favouritism given to one political perspective or the other. There was a recognition of a student who had put a lot of thought into the material, had read the material and made an extremely uh, well thought out, prepared critique of Hayek. And that's what our universities should aspire for. They should aspire to the whole breadth and width of intellectual thought, and our students should be taught how to think, not what to think. Senator Soker. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Speaking at the University of New South Wales, Sir Robert Menzies described the right and duty of universities and academics to pursue new knowledge 
as one of the most vital for human progress in all fields of knowledge. He noted that a university, treated, a university that treated an academic as no more than a person hired to study, as directed and to teach in accordance with rules laid down by other people, would be an extremely strange university. It would have failed to understand the immense importance of academic freedom. And as you know, Mr Acting Deputy President, intellectual freedom and freedom of speech are two things I feel very strongly about. And it's not for ideological or um, dogmatic reasons. It's for really practical reasons. If we can't speak with one another about things about which we disagree, respectfully, with care, with listening, with engagement, then we don't sharpen our ideas. We don't make them better. There's a biblical expression that as iron sharpens iron, as conflicting ideas meet, they are refined, they are improved. And that is how we prepare the minds of the people who come through our universities to engage with difficult problems and to solve them. It's how we equip our society with the tools it needs to be able to solve the challenges it will face going into the future. Take away that on any basis, whether it's the desire not to offend, whether it's the desire to make people feel safe, whether it's the desire to make people feel cocooned. Well, we, we can indulge feelings too much in an environment that is supposed to be about the big ideas. When I think back to Sir Robert Menzies' statement, it was 56 years ago, 56 years on, our universities have failed to live up to this important standard of academic freedom. Over the course of the last decade, we've seen a number of disturbing incidents and anti-free speech policies permeating our university campuses. The list is long, Mr Acting Deputy President. We've seen policies restricting the use of unwelcome, quote, mildly unpleasant or sarcastic language. There was once a time where satire, sarcasm and humour were indicators of a great mind and a source of good and helpful social commentary. We've seen restrictions on the personal use of social media, definitions of bullying so broad as to include terms such as unintentional offence and emotional injury. We've seen the introduction of trigger warnings and safe spaces to protect people from exposure to mainstream ideas that they simply don't agree with. We've seen the termination of academics, including at James Cook, Peter Ridd, for having a view that challenged the professional research of his colleagues based on his own professional research. Fancy having an employment contract that limits your ability to engage intellectually. We've seen the withdrawal of a textbook because a quiz question offended international students um, from China. And these, this is just the start of a very, very long list. It is of serious concern that universities, the institutions designed to facilitate a flourishing debate, have instead become hotbeds of censorship and entirely lack viewpoint diversity. Now, I'm proud to say that I played an important role in making the case for the establishment of the French Review into Intellectual Freedom in our universities. It was in Senate estimates, following some really egregious cases of deplatforming, that I took the public servants from TEXA through the legislation, through the funding agreement between the universities and the federal government by which the taxpayers give to our universities their financial support. And I asked, in the context of these egregious breaches of free speech and intellectual freedom, how I could be assured that universities were doing their job in enforcing the funding agreement where it provided by incorporation of um, different terms of the Act, a requirement that academic freedom and intellectual freedom be respected. And the answer was they were doing nothing. Nothing. I'm pleased that led to the establishment of the French Review. 
And while those opposite have made an awful lot of hay out of one line in the French Review that said there wasn't a crisis, I can tell you it also didn't give a good bill of health either. The French Review identified a lot of room for improvement, and I think that might be the world's biggest understatement. And so, following that, Mr French, he's on a former Justice French, recommended that our universities adopt a model code to protect academic freedom and freedom of speech. Following that point, after a little time had elapsed, I took to estimates again to check universities' performance by the measures that have been set up in the model code. Mr Acting Deputy President, you will be shocked to find that for the most part they failed dismally. And I'm pleased to say that following that examination, though I may not have made many friends at TEXA, um, I did succeed in um, encouraging our minister, doing an outstanding job in the portfolio, to commission Professor Sally Walker to review the progress that our universities are making towards implementing the model code. Now, I'm a senator for Queensland, and so I am reassured to see that all Queensland universities have made some commencing steps to put into effect those principles. But I've got to tell you, Professor Walker's review was not all good news either, as at the release of her report, only nine of Australia's 42 universities had academic freedom and freedom of speech policies that were fully aligned with the model code. Alarmingly, nearly half of Australia's universities have been rated by Professor Walker as not aligned or having significant areas of policy not aligned with the model code. They continue to fight against the idea that a university should have, as a foundational principle at its very core, the idea that there is a contest of ideas. <laughs> Crazy stuff. It's further concerning that no Queensland universities have been held out by Professor Walker as exemplars for free speech and academic freedom. Indeed, there's only one in the country that has done a full replication of the French model code, and that's Victoria's La Trobe University, and I salute them. It's good to see a university prepared to show that the sky won't fall in if they're prepared to act in accordance with their founding principles. Professor Walker identified further deficiencies in current academic freedom policies. Thirteen universities were found to be diluting their policies with quite imprecise restrictions on academic freedom limits of one's right to speak strictly to their areas of expertise, substituting terms like standards of scholarship for the more fundamental freedom, or trying to sub in alternate but more restrictive concepts like professional standards and restrictions so that speech is only allowed when done in good faith, greying the edges to be able to keep people in fear about what they can and can't do and say and speak about and learn about without facing the ire of university disciplinarians. They're also diluted when they're spread over multiple documents or undercut by other policies, which leave room for the exercise of administrative discretions that could limit freedom of speech or academic freedom. The result is academic freedom in name only. So as we work to implement the model code, Amendments to the legislation are necessary to ensure consistency between legislation and university statutes, to support regulators and universities alike in promoting academic freedom. This bill does just that. The bill amends the Higher Education Support Act to repeal and replace the use of the phrase free intellectual inquiry with the more precise reference to freedom of speech and academic freedom adopting the language of the Moral Code. It defines academic freedom in the Higher Education Support Act, and the amendments appropriately distinguish freedom of speech as a common freedom from elements of freedom of speech and intellectual inquiry that are central and distinctive aspects of academic freedom. The consistency of language to be achieved by the measures in the bill will facilitate compliance with and adoption of the Code provide for more consistency and more transparency in the policies that are adopted by universities, and it will result in stronger protections for academic freedom 
and freedom of speech in Australia. But can I say, Mr Acting Deputy President, an on-paper commitment is not enough. We need all of our universities to have a clear cultural commitment to academic freedom and free speech. The French Review makes this very, very clear. Culture here is key. The policy is not the end of the story. It's only the beginning. And universities have to actively create and engender a culture of free speech and academic freedom so that the words they must live by match the words they now say they so strongly support. Vice-chancellors have an important role to play in this, and they need to lead from the front. That's how we send a strong message that this matters, and it matters every, at every level of the institution. The academic board should have a prominent and direct role in this too. Professor Walker also suggests more novel measures like induction programs for new students on academic freedom. I'd suggest there should be consequences for those who are intolerant of free thought and expression, and that those should be made very clear to academics and students alike. When we wrap our universities in cotton wool, when we protect people like snowflakes from ideas that challenge them, we deny them the opportunity to argue their case strongly. We deny them the opportunity to become the iron that is sharpening the iron of the ideas in this country that will solve the problems we face going into the future. And we deny ourselves the resilience that it takes to be able to confront our most challenging problems. But it's important that we make it very clear this isn't designed to have unintended consequences. There are some parts of the sphere that have different needs. And one example I'd give you is higher education institutions that are established and funded and structured around their religious ethos. In that circumstance, say, a theology college needs to be treated in a slightly different category because for them to require their staff and students to exercise freedom of speech and academic freedom in a manner that doesn't denigrate from the beliefs that the establishment was set up to teach and uphold and defend uh, would, be a very, um, it would be very strange to see a departure from the core ethos of an institution like that. Very important that we don't, um, in establishing this important principle for public universities, have the inadvertent effect of undercutting the foundation of institutions that are established for specific purposes. It's very important that in these institutions the beliefs and practices for the faith for which it is established and the beliefs and practices of adherence and the institution and the staff that work there are able to be maintained in a way that ensures it is meeting its purpose. While a public university is established to pursue intellectual freedom no matter what as its core and defining belief, a religious educational institution actually might have a different purpose. It might be balancing trade knowledge or professional knowledge with a faith-based rigour um, that puts it in a slightly different category. And so I'd make that distinction as we, um, as we put in place this very important regime. This government is steadfast in its commitment to ensuring that education is effective. And that means making sure that intellectual freedom is meaningfully operating in our university campuses. This bill is just another example of the steps the coalition is taking to restore universities to their traditional role as the bulwarks of free speech, as crucibles of original thought, and as a place that meaningfully and genuinely prepares students and academics alike to not only confront ideas with which they may not initially agree with tolerance and respect and dignity, but then to use those ideas to solve the problems we face as a nation. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to start with the statement that central to scientific endeavour 
is an environment that gives permission for the work of talented people to challenge the status quo, to develop ideas, and to deepen our knowledge and understanding. This work demands a creative and innovative spirit, courage, objectivity, and a deep respect for the scientific method. Universities had, and should once again have, a central role to play in advancing thought and finding better ways of doing things. So therefore, their scientific staff must work in an environment that supports academic freedom. The Dalai Lama said, quote, in order to exercise creativity, freedom of thought is essential. One Nation introduced these concepts and requested action from the then Education Minister, Dan Tian. And I commend Senator Stoker for commenting that they support, the government supports this initiative. Senator Tian took these comments from One Nation, this, these concepts from One Nation, in particular from Senator Hansen. And he made sure that the now Education Minister, his replacement, Minister Tudge, continues to champion true freedom of speech in academia. One Nation wholeheartedly therefore supports the new and expanded definition of academic freedom and hopes that no one will ever need to endure what Peter, Professor Peter Ridd is still going through to fight, these funda fight for these fundamental academic freedoms. Professor Ridd and it was an employee of James Cook University for nearly 30 years. And he describes his experience of standing for academic freedom against that university as feeling hunted. Peter's crime, so-called crime, was to question the quality assurance of research outcomes related to reef science. But it is his duty as a scientist to question, to be rigorous, and to protect the integrity of science. Every scientist's first duty is to be a skeptic and to challenge what he or she is being told. Quality assurance is a concept that many corporate organisations are familiar with. and They do not invest money, time, energy, effort without that quality assurance. Yet it seems some of our universities have strayed away from the discipline of the scientific method so much that they don't feel the need to justify research outcomes or deal with challenges to quality and assurance. Considering that billions of dollars of taxpayers' money is funneled into policy development based on so-called research, then it is not negotiable that these research outcomes must be above reproach. And when we consider that the opportunity cost and the consequent cost is in the trillions of dollars for a whole nation of some policy based on so-called science, it is essential that, that science is challenged. Now, I have listened firsthand to many cane farmers and industry bodies from North Queensland and Central Queensland who attended the hearings into water quality in the Great Barrier Reef. These farmers, these community members, are exasperated and say they've trusted reef scientists to get the science right. But that trust has been destroyed, and instead cane farmers are being publicly demonised. And the reef regulations reflect a systematic abuse of science based on assumptions, not evidence." End of quote. Communities are being gutted. Apart from the destruction of so many livelihoods, think of the cost to our society, to Queensland, to communities and to our nation when policies are knowingly based on poor science, which by definition is not science. Energy policies, climate policies, renewable energy policies based on so-called science are costing $13 billion in additional costs above the normal costs of electricity. That's an average $1,300 per household across Australia in addition to the cost of electricity. For every job, so-called green job, created, there are 2.2 jobs in the real economy destroyed. The Murray-Darling Basin Act, the Water Act of 2007, is now destroying communities across the Murray-Darling Basin, our number one food bowl. And it's based on rubbish that contradicts the empirical evidence. Any scientist worth their professional reputation should have the freedom to stand against poor scientific outcomes and the lack of appropriate peer reviewing. 
I'll go beyond that. It is the duty of every science scientist to do so. The professional integrity of scientists should compel them to defend spending billions of dollars of taxpayers' money on policies that do not have a robust scientific basis, that are destroying people's livelihoods. Now, Professor Peter Ridd has over 100 scientific publications, and he has co-invented a worthy list of instrumentation, including an instrument for monitoring the effect of sediment on the reef, which is technology now used around the world. A water current meter that is marketed by James Cook University worldwide. An optical system for measuring pipe wear used in mines Australia-wide. And a system for man managing agricultural weeds marketed through AutoWeed. Now, this is an impressive list of achievements. And after three decades of work, such a scientist ought to be held in high esteem. So if a scientist of this academic cali calibre and commercial achievements and practical nous can still feel hunted down by a university for challenging the quality of research results in other departments and hunted to his emotional and financial detriment, how the hell can we ever expect our upcoming brilliant minds with far fewer runs on the board to ever have the courage to do the same? We can't. The simple, lesson, simple answer is these newcomers will not challenge because they do not have the safety of freedom of free, free speech and can't risk their careers crashing and burning before they've started. Instead, these upcoming brilliant minds will fall into line and continue to expand the increasing pool of homogeneous groupthink. And there is the death of creativity and the narrowing of truly great solutions to tomorrow's problems. In recent decades, we've seen our, our society, our country, being decimated by policy-driven science. And that is not science. It's costing us trillions. We need to return to science-driven policy. Policy that is driven by science. True science. That passes quality assurance tests and, and questions from skeptics. Professor Ridd has become the modern-day Galileo for daring to challenge the common myth that farming methods in the Great Barrier Reef catchment areas are damaging the reef. Professor Ridd's Research shows that commonly held myth to be incorrect, to be a lie. James Cook University didn't like it, maybe because there is no doubt in their view that there would be a gaping hole in James Cook University's funding for Great Barrier Reef research if water quality was indeed just fine, as Professor Peter Ridd's work and the work of others confirms and suggests. Now, I acknowledge that universities are required to enshrine in their policy statement clear messages around freedom of speech and academic freedom. While we cannot intrude upon the enterprise agreements between universities and their employees, the amendment I will put forward today in committee stage requests that higher education providers must take reasonable steps to ensure that enterprise agreements include provisions to uphold the freedom of speech and academic freedom. This commitment to academic freedom needs, wherever possible, to move beyond the policy statement that sits on the shelf in the enterprise, to, enter, to enter the enterprise agreements, since that is where the cultural change will be brought about. We cannot afford to be timid and ordinary when it comes to scientific endeavours. One Nation supports this bill because we must give our scientific staff the academic freedoms they need to be at their creative best. Universities, businesses, and governments all need to be prepared to update their outdated views when our brilliant minds in academia show us a better way. I'll finish with the words of Steve Jobs talking about his company, the late Steve Jobs talking about his company Apple, one of the leaders in the world in new technology. He said, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise today to speak on the Freedom of Speech Bill and the proposed definition of academic freedom. Um, this uh, Higher Education Support Amendment Freedom of Speech Bill is uh, incredibly important. Incredibly important. Uh, which will provide stronger safeguards for academic freedom and freedom of speech 
uh, within our universities and higher education institutions. Uh, I, as uh, many uh, my colleagues uh, know, have a uh, I have children, and uh, and many here do, and they are growing uh, quickly, all too quickly, all too quickly, uh, and I, uh, more quickly than I'd like to admit. And soon enough, uh, they'll be leaving school, and will be pursuing a, 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 a you know their, their post schooling uh, education, uh, weighing up their their post school options, uh, and they may choose to pursue the path of uh, tertiary education and settle themselves into university life. Uh, for several years. Now, I note at this point, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, that uh, I'm one of the possibly the few people uh, in the Senate here that uh, chose uh, not to go down the uh, higher education path. Uh, I undertook a, a trade when I finished school as, a, as an electronic technician. Uh, and, uh, but this bill provides a new definition of academic freedom that protects through law the very important principles of freedom of expression, which are just essential to seeing these institutions uh, kept accountable. Uh, this bill will ensure that current university faculty staff, students and the generation to come will have the opportunity to engage in opinion-rich education, educational settings. Staff will be free to speak in the fields of their academic research and study, with unrestricted comment and no fear of academic bias or suppression from the dominant university culture, which may unjustifiably limit the range of perspectives that are welcome on campus and in classrooms. Now, in some ways, Mr Acting Deputy President, it's a shame that we actually have to legislate uh, these freedoms for our students and professors of today. Uh, but there have been significant examples uh, of threat that, have, uh, that warrant this bill. Universities should be bastions of free speech, not foment a culture in which censorship and intolerance of opposing uh, viewpoints abound. This is certainly something worth fighting for. Higher education in Australia has a very, very rich history. In 1852, the University of Sydney opened its doors to students as Australia's first university and was among the first public non-denominational universities in the British Empire. When William Charles Wentworth proposed the idea of Australia's first university in 1850, he imagined the opportunity for the child of every class to become great and useful in the destinies of this country. Now, I, today I believe that the way that we stay true to Wentworth's original value and purpose is not by enticing our universities with funding which twists their arm to become more like mega businesses, scuffling to meet their KPIs for the next funding injection. Institutions for higher education must foster the growth of informed, autonomous students who bring rich skills and thinking to their perspective vocation, uh, prospective vocations. This is what will truly make such institutions and their product useful in the destinies of our country. Equally, the rights of our academics and teachers must be protected as they remain free to speak and share their research and professional uh, views openly. In 2015, over 1.3 million people were enrolled as students throughout, the, uh, throughout Australia's higher education institutions. Now, these students were all taught by academic faculty who answer to the powers that be in their terms of their research, teaching and uh, how openly they might uh, share their beliefs. As outlined in the recommendations from the 2019 Independent Review into Freedom of Speech in Higher Education, undertaken by the Hon. Robert French AC, former Chief, Chief Justice no less of the High Court of Australia, a change in wording from free intellectual in inquiry to freedom of speech and academic freedom will align the language of those requirements with the French model code. This will further protect staff and students in sharing honestly about their research, finding and conclusions. And there's been a growing view among the general public that universities are becoming more and more woke, advocating for their version of free speech, their version of free speech, and making space 
for the voice of minority groups. However, it's clear that this advocated free speech and support for minority groups seems to be very, very selective, while it stifles unpopular conservative views. Religious groups, professors of science, history academics, medical experts and, and, and many more uh, who, through their fields of proficiency, have traditional views to share, seem to be the targets of the growing radical left culture of the university campus. In some cases, these academics have had their research papers refused for publication because this finding support conservative worldviews. There are even instances where tutors and lecturers have gradually had their teaching hours reduced to nil because their work was considered uh, a little too right of centre. Now, with the Morrison government's record funding to higher education sector, we have to get this right going forward. We must ensure that our universities are encouraged to remain places of free thinking, environments that promote curiosity and celebrate, celebrate the sharing of diverse and informed ideas. The main element of this bill in the introduction of the following definition beg your pardon, is the introduction of the following uh, definition of academic freedom in legislation. Firstly, that the freedom of academic staff to teach, discuss and research and to disseminate and publish the results of their research. Secondly, that the freedom of academic staff and students to engage in intellectual inquiry, to express their opinions and belief and to contribute to public debate in relation to their subjects of study and research. Third, that the freedom of speech, uh, sorry, the freedom of academic staff and students to express their opinions in relation to the higher education provider in which they are, in which they work or are enrolled. That the freedom of academic staff to participate in professional or representative academic bodies. That freedom of students to participate in student societies and associations, regardless of what that might be that the autonomy of the higher education provider in relation to the choice of academic courses and offerings, the way in which, these, uh, in which they are taught and the choices of research activities and the ways in which they are conducted. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, before I close, I would like to just touch on what I heard Senator Abetz uh, say earlier in his contribution. Now, he suggested that adding the following paragraph to the minister's summation, and I just want to put my support behind that. He said that, that he'd like to see an inclusion here where higher education institutions which have a religious ethos may require their staff and students to exercise their freedom of speech and academic freedom in a manner that does not denigrate and is respective of the beliefs and practices of the religion and its adherence and the religious ethos of the institution. Now, I support the inclusion of this paragraph, whether it be in the minister's summing up or possibly even in the, the memorandum uh, of uh, the explanatory memorandum of the, of the bill. Uh, freedom of religion is another one of the great freedoms, one of the great freedoms which Western civilization is based. And if we were to see anything undermine that, then it would be a great loss to uh, our free and, and democratic and liberal society in which we live. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, this bill seeks to strengthen protections for freedom of speech on campus. Strengthen it. This is a good thing. This is a good thing. And there are many different views, and those views should be able to be freely spoken. Of course, there's a responsibility when it comes to sharing those views, and, and people must be mindful and careful about how and what they say, of course. But it's important that students or faculty are not in any way held back because they may have a view that is different to the prevailing view of that particular institution just because it might be seen as something that's more conservative or possibly even more uh, to, to the left. It, it, frankly, we need freedom and we need to be able to ensure that that continues. This is an increasingly, increasingly important arena for free speech. 
not only due to cancel culture and political correctness running amok, but also due to foreign influence and the potential for, for influence on students with families and assets overseas. Uh, through this lens, freedom of speech on campus becomes not only important but incredibly necessary. So I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Small. Thank you, President. And, uh, I, I can only concur wholeheartedly with the comments that our previous uh, senators have raised, because without freedom of speech, no good idea ever becomes a great idea and no ridiculous idea ever founders under the weight of reason. So where Justice French found that even a limited number of incidents were seen to affect or impinge freedom of speech, the adverse impact on the public perception of the higher education sector and, indeed, the future of our nation remains very real. The amendments to the uh, Higher Education Support Amendment Bill are a necessary and functionally sound improvement that improve the alignment uh, of academic freedom and freedom of speech more broadly. The amendment improves that existing uh, language uh, with where it relates to free intellectual inquiry, which I would have thought was in fact self-evident. If a university cannot be a place of truly free intellectual inquiry, we don't have much hope as a nation. It is important to note that the intention of the bill is to protect freedom of speech and is not to be used to impinge the beliefs and religious ethos of the higher education institutions around Australia. So while staff and students will remain free to exercise their right to free speech uh, uh, in the respective academic inquiries that they undertake, the institutions themselves will not uh, be forced to undermine or contravene the fundamental religious precepts that underpin their existence. This is an important delineation. Uh, between the freedom of academics and students uh, to engage in that free speech through the academic environment uh, and the freedom of speech that they rightly enjoy as Australians in their personal capacity. Speech made in an academic capacity is more uh, correctly and descriptively categorised as an academic freedom of speech, while speech made in any personal capacity is more appropriately considered under the broader definitions enshrined in Australia. For the benefit of both students and staff, this amendment is essential in improving the definition of academic freedom and highlighting the importance of that freedom uh, to the future of study and research in Australia. It's also essential in underpinning the important role of freedom of speech in Australian statute. Freedom of speech is a basic and fundamental component of our society, and I think it's the duty of all senators in this place to clarify and protect this freedom when it is under attack from the woke, from the cancel culture uh, and from the left, who ultimately uh, would rather control that thought and expression in Australia such that those views which run counter to what they hold to be believe uh, what they hold to believe, rather, um, be dismissed rather than debated rigorously. So I think that discussions around freedom of speech are often overcomplicated and overthought. It is simply uh, a personal liberty that must not be impinged by government. It isn't given to us by government. It is an inalienable right that we're born with in a free democracy. It's our primary duty as representatives of the Australian people to guard this right from governmental uh, interference or, in fact, interference from any other source. Freedom of speech must be protected in our society, uh, but most especially on university campuses where the very purpose of the work and study undertaken on that campus is to challenge and further intellectual pursuits and broad understanding of the issues we confront as a nation. No matter where the results in research or even the context of that debate may lead, because in fact it is often speech that we most fundamentally disagree with that is that most important to protect. 
As Noam Chomsky said, even Goebbels was in favour of free speech for the views that he liked. So was Stalin. If you do not support the free speech of ideas that you disagree with or even rightly despise, you are not in favour of free speech at all. So why not uh, support this cautious and incremental uh, reform to maximise freedom in all areas of society, particularly uh, one as important as academic study in the universities? I would contend that it is better to have a dangerous, if I can use the term, level of free speech rather than have a limitation on free speech that is controlled by anyone at any point in time. In the context of an Australian university, that even limited number of incidents that Justice French found does have uh, a, a negative impact on the public perception of the higher education sector. So it is important to set a solid and clear standard to not only protect freedom of speech but to more appropriately delineate uh, the freedom of academic inquiry that is undertaken or ought to be undertaken uh, on a university campus. I emphasise that freedom of speech as a fundamental right here in Australia should be as simple and a clear uh, concept as possible. And this amendment improves the definition for that academic freedom of inquiry whilst preserving the tenets of freedom of speech in Australia. That delineation is essential in preventing students and academics uh, who engage in free intellectual inquiry from being cancelled or otherwise affected by the woke revolution that we seem to be in the grips of. This is critical to the success of our nation and indeed the universities that operate here. By aligning uh, the Act with the model code as proposed by Justice French, this will strengthen uh, the principles of basic freedom of expression and unequivocally support a culture of freedom that must be enshrined in all of our university campuses. The freedom to express a countervailing opinion is essential because the progress of our society is reliant on this natural and very basic freedom. This shouldn't be controversial. The antithesis to full freedom of speech is controlled speech. And that control resting in any individual's hands at any time should be of grave concern to all in this place. Universities that receive public funds shouldn't want to, much less be permitted to restrict the outcomes of academic research uh, or in any way punish those who undertake research in those uh, institutions, even where the conclusions are controversial. Why? Because if the, if the conclusions are wrong or not supported by a rigorous, interrogated debate, then they will naturally go by the wayside. That is the point of freedom of academic inquiry. Ignoring the outcomes of research is simply sticking one's head in the sand, and that is where the matter should rest. In my view, this is an essential reform to protect a fundamental freedom in Australia and help ensure our prosperity as a nation into the future. The academic environment and the culture of freedom on our campuses will be all the better for it, as will our success as a nation overall. Having any top-down pressure on research outcomes in, in a higher education institution might be expected in an authoritarian regime, but it absolutely cannot be permitted in Australia. The unique characteristics and influences on those higher education institutions in Australia require this government to ensure that academics and students, when functioning in that academic capacity, have the freedom of their academic inquiry protected. The existing phraseology of free intellectual inquiry is too broad, and we've seen that through the cases that my colleagues have cited here today, most notably the dismissal of Professor Ridd. It is imperative to this government's continued support for the culture of free thought and inquiry that this bill be accepted. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise in support of the Higher Education Support Amendment Bill 
Uh, I must say the word freedom gets thrown around a lot, uh, and sometimes uh, I sometimes think it's uh, thrown around without the true meaning of the significance uh, of, of the word and, and, and the impact and how hard it has been uh, for us to uh, get to the freedoms that we have today uh, and the sacrifices that have been made uh, to obtain those freedoms. And of course, for me, when I hear the word freedom, I often go back to that uh, recent movie of recent times, uh, Braveheart, uh, which was so elegantly uh, played by Mel Gibson about uh, William Wallace. And there's a great scene at the end there where uh, William Wallace uh, is basically being executed, uh, and he yells out freedom at the end. Uh, now, there's a lot of criticism about that film, whether it's all uh, correct or not. But what was true was that William Wallace was indeed executed in the name of what he thought was freedom. And I'm just going to read out to you the exact details of his death, because I think it's worth remembering how hard our freedoms have been fought for and how hard um, we need to fight to make sure we strive them. After he was captured, uh, Wallace was transported to London where he was tried for treason and atrocities against civilians in war. Um, he was then crowned with a garland of oak to suggest he was the king of outlaws. He responded to the treason charge, I could not be a traitor to Edward I, for I was never his subject. Following the trial, Wallace was taken from the hall, Westminster Hall is, to the Tower of London, then stripped naked and dragged through the city at the heels of a horse. He was then hung, drawn and quartered strangled by hanging, but released while he was still alive. He was then emasculated, and for those of you who don't know what emasculation is, that's where you have your entire crown jewels removed. He was then eviscerated, where he had his internal bowels removed. His bowels were then burned in front of him, and he was then beheaded. His head was then dipped in tar and placed on a pike atop London Bridge, and it was later joined by the heads of the brothers of John and Simon Fraser, fellow Scottish patriots. His limbs were displayed separately in Newcastle, Berwick, Stirling and Perth. And a plaque was unveiled uh, in 1956, and it stands in a wall of St Bartholomew's Hospital near the site of Wallace's execution at Smithfield. It includes in Latin the words dicto tibi tibi verum libertas optima rerum nunquam servili sub nexus vivato filae. And in English that translates says, I tell you the truth. Freedom is what is best. Sons never live like slaves. And I think that is an incredibly inspiring story of the sacrifices that people have made throughout history in order to fight for freedom. Now, of course, uh, nine years later, in the year of our Lord 1314, as so eloquently put uh, in the movie, a bloke by the name of Robert the Bruce went out and he won that freedom. And of course, you know, whether or not it's uh, true or not, I'm going to quote it anyway, but as he said before he ran out to battle, you bled with Wallace, so bleed with me. And today, as we put this bill forward, I ask that the people on this side of the chamber bleed like Wallace and fight like Robert the Bruce and make sure that we stand up for academic freedom. Make sure that we stand up for academic freedom. Because without freedom of speech, without freedom of thought, we are nothing more than slaves. We are nothing more than slaves. And so I'm pleased to uh, promote this bill because it will provide st stronger protections for academic freedom and freedom of speech at our nation's universities, uh, something that seems to be lacking on today's campuses around the nation and indeed the Western world. And I know while this bill only applies to uh, un univers uh, university uh, freedom of speech, uh, I think it's um, something that we should also look at in, in other spheres as well. I mean, I know out there in the digital world of uh, social media, there's a lot of digital lynch mobs out there today that are more than happy to come on and abuse people to the point where they're actually afraid to say what they really think on social media. There's a lot of bullying going there, and in my view, it's just as big a threat uh, to freedom of uh, speech and freedom of thought as is um, the suppression of free thought at universities. And we should also give a, a big shout out to, of course, Peter Ridd, uh, who has fearlessly uh, stood up for what he believes in, as well as Drew Pavlov. He was uh, kicked out of university, uh, at the University of Queensland uh, for standing up for what he believed in. And indeed, our own Craig Kelly, 
uh, was kicked off Facebook for standing up for what he believed in. So, you know, we're always up against uh, the command and control tendencies of those who wield the power, and we must always make sure that those who don't wield the power. Well, I'm thinking. Well, uh, I'll take that interjection, thanks, Senator McAllister, because. At the end of the day, having been in this chamber for almost two years, I actually think the bureaucrats wield a lot more power uh, than the elected uh, members of parliament do. You've only got to look at the RBA. They have the autonomous control over the monetary policy, our currency. We have an Australian Research Council who, in the law, it says uh, that they are responsible. They have ultimate control over the $3 billion and how that money uh, is granted. Uh, we have the ABC, who have no independent review body on how they behave. Uh, so there are plenty of examples whereby the bureau bureaucrats are basically today uh, unaccountable for their actions. So I'm more than happy to stand by my assertion that uh, we need to make sure, and, and indeed the universities—I forgot to include the universities in that—that that to make sure that where taxpayer dollars are being spent, uh, the bureaucrats are held to account. Um, and in, in many cases, that means we're going to have to take back the idea of an independent statutory authority, because ultimately, at the end of the day. The bulwark of democracy is accountability and transparency. And whether you like it or not, bureaucrats aren't elected. You mightn't like politicians, but we are elected, and what we do, we are held uh, to account for. We are very transparent. We have to stand here in the chamber. We have to stand up, to, uh, stand up in front of the media uh, and in front of our constituents. So, uh, very, very important that uh, we are held to account um, as well. So anyway, the purpose of the Higher Education Support Amendment Bill is to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 to repeal and replace the two references to free intellectual inquiry with references to freedom of speech and academic freedom and insert a definition of ac academic freedom. This bill gives effect to the recommendations from the 2019 Independent Review into freedom of speech in higher education which was undertaken by the Honourable Robert French, former Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia. This bill will provide a new definition of academic freedom that enshrines in law principles of freedom of expression that are an essential part of our life at universities for both academic staff and students as, as, as were when we went to university. The this definition closely aligns with the definition recommended by the French Review, with a minor technical modification recommended by the University Chancellor's Council developed in consultation with Mr French. This modification excludes one element, the freedom of academic staff without constraint imposed by reason of their employment by the university to make a lawful, lawful public comment on any issue in their personal capacities. That was part of the definition originally recommended by Mr French and included in his proposed model code. As part of the consultations on the proposed definition, it has been suggested this element is more about freedom of speech than academic freedom and shouldn't be conflated in a definition of academic freedom. I recall when universities were once the bastion of, of freedom of thought, speech and once drove political and social discourse. Now, courtesy of council culture, the far left, disguised as neo-Puritans, are busy trying to shut down debate under the guise of safe spaces for fear of offending. A survey commissioned in 2019 asked students how they saw the current state of freedom of speech in universities. The survey included students of all political persuasions. 39 per cent of respondents supported the ALP, 28 per cent supported the Greens, 14 per cent supported the Coalition and 20 were other and undecided. The results were concerning, to say the least. 41 per cent of students felt they are sometimes able, unable to express their opinion at university. 31 per cent of students have been made to feel uncomfortable by a university teacher for expressing their opinion. 47 per cent of students feel more comfortable expressing their views on social media than at university. 59 per cent of students believe they are sometimes prevented from voicing their opinions on controversial issues by other students. 82 per cent of students agreed that university students should be exposed to different views, even if those views are challenging or offensive. 
86 per cent of Green supporting students, 82 per cent of Labor supporting students and 82 per cent of Coalition supporting students agreed with this statement. In my home state of Queensland, we have had the highly publicised drama involving Drew Pavlov at the University of Queensland. In August last year, the University of New South Wales media team deleted Twitter posts from one of its academics, now adjunct law professor and human rights watch Australia director Elaine Pearson, which drew an online backlash, backlash from foreign students. The University of New South Wales, after receiving a barrage of angry responses from Chinese students and state-owned media, responded with, the, opinion of, the opinions expressed by our academics do not always represent the views of the University of New South Wales. We have a long and valued relationship with Greater China going back 60 years. The New South Wales University provides a welcome and inclusive environment and is proud to welcome students from over 100 countries. And do we know what the offending tweet said, Mr President? Quote, now is a pivotal moment to bring attention to the rapidly deteriorating situation in Hong Kong. Fair income. The central and allegedly the most controversial element of the proposed amendments is the introduction of the following definition of academic freedom in the legislation. The freedom of academic staff to teach, discuss and research and to disseminate and publish the results of their research. The freedom of academic staff and students to engage in intellectual inquiry, to express their opinions and beliefs and to contribute to public debate in relation to their subjects of study and research. The freedom of academic staff and students to express their opinions in relation to the higher education provided, provider in which they work or are enrolled. The freedom of academic staff to participate in professional, professional or representative academic bodies. The freedom of students to participate in social societies and associations. And finally, the autonomy of the higher education provider in relation to the choice of academic courses and offerings. The explanatory memorandum includes the following explanation. The statutory definition in item 4 closely aligns with the definition in the French model code but includes a minor technical modification recommended by the university chancellor's councillors. <laughs> Professor Sally Walker, who is currently undertaking a review of the university sector's implementation of the French code, has advised that this approach is preferable the freedom of academics and students to engage in intellectual inquiry, to express their opinions and to contrib contribute to public debate are deeply connected with the role of an academic and the role of a university, and therefore are key elements of academic freedom. However, this is quite different from an academic making a comment in their personal capacity. Any such comment is not connected with their role as an academic and is more appropriately considered to fit within the ambit of a broader socialist, uh, social freedom of speech. To quote from Brendan O'Neill, a UK columnist who, who himself has felt the wrath of the university, of universities, it is undeniable that we live in a society where a freedom of expression is in crisis. Whether we are being censored by the state, by self-styled guardians of correct thinking, by mobs, or by ourselves. We are being censored, and this matters. It matters because at both the individual level and the social level, freedom of speech is essential to human flourishing. Freedom of speech gives real power to the individual. It liberates us not only to express our own views, which is of course incredibly important, but also to listen to the views of everyone else and to use our mental and moral muscles to decide for ourselves if what they are saying is right or wrong. Freedom of speech is the foundation stone of moral autonomy. It demands that we take ourselves seriously, weigh things up, make moral judgments and correct error as we find it. Censorship, by contrast, destroys us, weakening our, weakening our mental and moral muscles by inviting us to instead rely on judgments of our superiors on those who will decide on our behalf what we may see, what we may read and what we should think. And if I could just reflect one more moment on those words of Wallace, as he said, they can always take our lives, but they can never take our freedom. 
Mr. Pres uh, Acting Madam Deputy President, I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Hanson. Academic freedom is and should always be one of the cornerstones of our learning institutions, part of the bedrock upon which our universities and our society as a whole are built. Without academic freedom, we lose the magnificent contest of ideas. That contest is the catalyst that generates the research that ensures the success of future directions, and it's gone. Without academic freedom, the ability to think, to develop ideas, and expand our view of the world is lost. Without academic freedom, our learning institutions across every age group, from earliest childhood to universities and beyond, become places where students are taught what to think, not how to think. And as we see to the detriment of us all, the cancel culture takes over. You're either right or wrong, in or out. Step outside the party line, upset the online trolls, say anything beyond what social media demands, and you're out. History is obliterated because it's offensive to the fringe. It doesn't fit the agenda of the thought police. Gone is the premise that history is there to be learned from. Gone is any criticism around lack of rigour or of falling standards in academia. Criticise and your career is over. Our halls of learning are becoming dungeons of dogma. Our schools are becoming indoctrination centres. Our children aren't learning how to think, how to inquire, how to question. They're not learning how important their intellectual curiosity really is and how critical it is will be for them for, uh, in years to come. They're being dumbed down and taught what to think. They're being taught there's right and wrong. That's it, nothing more. And they're learning the terrible consequences of being wrong, the loss of friends, the expulsion from groups, even the loss of jobs, all because they question the accepted dogma, as are their teachers. Just ask the highly respected Dr Peter Ridd after his outrageous sacking by James Cook University, or read about the treatment dished out again by James Cook University to the late Professor Bob Carter, or Dr Howard Brady, a victim of the appalling cancer culture at the increasingly intolerant ANU right here in Canberra. Exercising academic freedom takes more than curiosity. To push the boundaries, often of long-established, well-accepted beliefs, takes courage, often in bucket loads. I can speak from the benefit of personal experience when I say that speaking truths that don't fit the current long-accepted dogma will inevitably result in criticism, personal attacks, vile abuse, ridicule, and sometimes much worse. I'm also aware of an incident that occurred more than 20 years ago when a university lecturer was told to remove a segment of a course he was teaching that included a number of the views and policy that I had expressed both in parliament and publicly. He was told that even though the issue in question referred to my belief that all Australians should be treated equally, he should stop teaching his students that topic and remove my name from the course. And today, young children are being indoctrinated with issues around their gender or what and how their parents should speak to them. And express your religious views and you're guaranteed ridicule and isolation, even expulsion from many places. It's classic socialism designed to create another generation of Alinsky's useful idiots. And it's going on around us every day in every state of Australia and I say, enough is enough. The left set themselves up as the gatekeepers of knowledge, and they proceed to shame, vilify, and excommunicate anyone who dares disagree. That's not my Australia, and I know it's not the kind of Australia most of us want. To expect our academics to work in an environment that shackles their freedom and restricts where their opinions, professional critiques, and research can go as wrong. It dumbs us down as a nation. It guarantees we'll be non-competitive internationally. It sends our future generations into lives of guaranteed mediocrity and disadvantage. The other requirement to be able to exercise academic freedom is, of course, freedom of speech. 
Contrary to popular belief, Australia doesn't have a legislated right to freedom of speech. Unlike the United States, we have no Bill of Rights. We have no specific mention of freedom of speech in our constitution that even remotely resembles what is enshrined and defined so vigorously as the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Why successive governments have avoided legislating freedom of speech protections remains a mystery. Of course, with freedom of speech comes the paradox of being forced to hear things you may strongly disagree with and the reality of saying things others may disagree with. The right to free expression carries with it the risk the cancer culture mob will rage against you for anything contradictory to their agenda. Conveniently, those in the woke world believe in free speech, but only so far as it fits their world view. And I can speak from experience with regards to that. Over the years, even going back to when I was first elected to parliament, that I had meetings around Australia and the halls were, were packed out because people saw me as, who is this woman? Who's this elected part, member of parliament? We don't hear people who speak with this truth, with this honesty. And most people have said to me, you're only saying what we're thinking, but you've got the guts to get up there and say it. And the people of, uh, of Australia are screaming out for that honesty, for that truth. Instead of being around the bush, and not being upfront honest with people, they saw in me something that was different. And it happens here in, in this chamber as well, that I may get up and say something and I get ridiculed for it because I dare speak beyond the boundaries what is accepted by whom? Who sets the debate? We're allowing people out in the academic world to set the agenda of what we should say and how we should say it. And that's why our kids are so confused. And the people of Australia are becoming like sheep. You can't say that. You've got to live in your own little world, in your own little box. You can't go beyond that. Yet we have other countries, other people around the world who would dearly love to have the freedom that we have. And we are so quick to give it away. And we're going to let others control what we say and think. I don't need to tell, have someone to tell me how to control what I say or think. As a member of parliament, the people will say that at the ballot box, they will judge me. And if they don't like what I say, then they will throw me out. But I won't have any other Australian with their own opinion or their own culture turn around and tell me what I should be saying or what I should be thinking. Because I have too much respect for the people that have fought for our freedoms. And with that freedom came the freedom of speech. And it rose the day when I have had lecturers come into my office 25 years ago and said, we have been told how we should teach in the university. If we don't teach that way, we are going to lose our jobs. Or I've had a friend who is learning to, to become a teacher. Hear it all the time. We actually have to agree with their, their way of teaching or we have to agree with their thought process, otherwise we will have our grades put down. This has been happening for decades, and yet no one intervenes or does something about it. This is why we've got these generations coming through who are being conditioned. And it's a real shame, because that's not the Australia that I want. It's not the Australia I want to hand on to my grandchildren and the future generations. Because for academic freedom to be genuine, we must recognise it carries with it the need for a hand and glove relationship with freedom of speech. And academics speaking on their research or the research of others must not be limited in the comments by the notion that freedom of speech is a right is not available to them. A reference to textbooks, the views of others, research or opinions must be allowed the freedom of open and unfettered discussion. We cannot ever have another case like that of Peter Ridd or a cancellation like that suffered by Professor Bob Carter. Academic freedom is something to be celebrated by every Australian, especially when it carries with it the right of free speech. I'm pleased that our discussions with the Minister have resulted in positive outcomes in relation to the sector. I particularly welcome the Minister's com commitment to work with us on a constructive amendments designed to reduce the ever-increasing overall HECS Health 
debt, which currently stands at over $50 billion. Simultaneously, any reduction in the overall debt must be done in a way that does not unnecessarily disadvantage users of the scheme. We are very fortunate in this country to have universities and colleges for our youth to go to. A lot of other countries don't have that. And that's where it's very important that I do support this bill and working with the government that it was very important to One Nation, myself and Senator Roberts, that changes had to be made with this. Our Mark Latham talks about it constantly in the Upper House in New South Wales. He's very much about education, about freedom of speech. It is the cornerstone of who we are as a nation. As I've said, many lives have been lost, sacrifices made for our freedom, and with that is freedom of speech. And if we want to live in a, in a society that is actually socialist, communism, then we are going to, um, <laughs> we're going to have to stand up for what we believe in. And it starts in this chamber for each and every one of us who have been given the opportunity that very few Australians have. There's only 76 senators here out of the whole population of 25 million Australians. That in itself, the importance of it, is that we must be true to ourselves and have that freedom of speech here to express what we truly believe in, because that's how the people judge us. We are supposed to be leaders of this nation. Never let anyone else shut you down of your true thoughts, of what you want to achieve for the Australian people, because they rely on us to make those right decisions. And that's why I will continue to speak in this chamber, or whether it's outside this chamber, my true thoughts, what I want to see. I won't be shut down with the call to, that I'm a racist. My racism, racism as, as they appear, is because I dare call for equality for all Australians. And I will continue to do that. Yeah. So it's about standing up for our rights, and that's why I support Peter Ridd and Bob Carter, what they've done, and even Craig Kelly. Craig Kelly's got the right as a member of parliament to stand up and have his say. He has the right to question it. Let the people judge him. And that's what's so important that we do um, that in a fair and just manner. And that's where One Nation supports this, this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's my great pleasure to rise and speak on the Higher Education Support Amendment Freedom of Speech Bill 2020. John F. Kennedy said that conformity is the jailer of freedom and the enemy of growth. In recent years, we have seen an increasing number of instances of conformity worming its way into the halls of our universities and research institutions. In August 2020, Elaine Pearson, Director of Human Rights Watch and adjunct lecturer at the University of New South Wales Faculty of Law, tweeted that she was very concerned about the human rights implications of Hong Kong's new national security law. Incredibly, the tweet was deleted by UNSW in response to criticism by pro-China students. The tweet was later reinstated by the university, but it should never have been deleted in the first place. This was an unacceptable betrayal of academic freedom. Earlier in 2018, Dr Peter Ridd, a distinguished marine physicist at James Cook University, was sacked after publicly questioning his colleagues' research on the effects of climate change on the Great Barrier Reef. As a result, he had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars of donated money, as well as his own savings, to make his case in the High Court. The purpose of our university is to be a place where academics can seek the truth and disseminate it to students. But this is not possible if academics cannot engage in free intellectual inquiry. The principle of academic freedom is the source of the university's capacity to produce meaningful, rigorous and independent research which benefits all. In this sense, academic freedom is a paradigm feature of any vibrant university culture and is essential if universities are not to become mere mouthpieces for ideology. 
and of course as they were in the Soviet Union and continue to be in many other countries around the world. This bill ensures that academics have that freedom. It does so by introducing a definition of academic freedom which allows academics to teach, discuss and conduct research at will. It enshrines the freedom of academics to engage in intellectual inquiry free from government or corporate influence. It ensures that academics can freely contribute to public debate on issues related to their research without fear of sanction. It also affirms the autonomy of universities in relation to their choice of academic courses and offerings and ways in which they are taught. This is a full and robust conception of academic freedom and shows that our government is committed to maintaining it. All of this is in keeping with the fundamental Liberal principles on which the Liberal Party was founded, the priority of individual freedom over collective inertia, the value of practical and intellectual enterprise, and the idea that the proper role of government is to protect natural rights and freedoms, not impose an ideology. Some might argue that the bill does not go far enough because it does not give academics a right to free speech, which would allow them to express their personal opinions on any matter whatsoever in public under the shield of academic freedom. However, academics can already express their personal opinions in public, just like any other Australian. They, like other Australians, do not require a stronger definition of academic freedom to do that. A nuclear chemist expressing a personal opinion on the price of milk is not an exercise of academic freedom. The definition of academic freedom in this bill helpfully preserves this important distinction. None of this undermines the government's commitment to maintaining a free and open society in Australia in which freedom of speech is respected and upheld. None of this undermines the government's commitment to liberal principles. None of this undermines our government's commitment to supporting free intellectual inquiry at universities. Our government understands that freedom of speech is the cornerstone of our democracy. It understands that the health of our society can be measured by the extent to which it upholds and defends freedom of speech. We understand, as John Stuart Mill said, when one's ideas are not challenged, one's ability to defend them weakens. Our government understands that legislation is sometimes necessary to ensure that when our ideas are challenged, we have the freedom to defend them. In this increasingly polarised age, it's easy to be taken up in the swell of ideological fervour on any given topic, whether it be climate change, gender and identity politics, social justice or even free speech itself. This can only do us harm, because ideology is the sworn enemy of free inquiry. Ideology is a ruinous fire which burns everything in its path. As Edmund Burke said, its rage and frenzy will pull down more in half an hour than prudence, deliberation and foresight can build up in a hundred years. It would be folly to think that our universities are immune from ideological pressure. It would be folly to think that political neutrality is always defended by university management. This is why we must remain vigilant and protect the principle of academic freedom, a bequeathment of an intellectual tradition going back almost a thousand years to the world's first university at Bologna in 1088. Today's academics are inheritors of that tradition, and it is one we must guard jealously if we are to maintain our universities as places of genuine learning places where we can learn to seek the truth for its own sake and not for the sake of ideological purity or political advantage. This bill ensures that academics, whatever their political persuasion, will not have that held against them in the course of their intellectual work. 
the bill strengthens free speech in this country by ensuring that academics like Elaine Pearson and Peter Ridd can pursue their research freely without illegitimate and undue restriction, whether from universities, students or governments. It ensures that conformity, that insidious, implacable enemy of freedom, is kept at bay at our universities. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Minister in a position to sum up debate. Yep. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, I thank all senators for their contribution to this debate. The Higher Education Support Amendment Freedom of Speech Bill 2020 will amend the Higher Education Support Act 20 2003 uh, to give effect to recommendations of the independent review of freedom of speech in Australian higher education providers conducted in 2019 by the Honourable Robert French AC, former Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia. The amendments will provide a new legislative definition of academic freedom that encompasses aspects of freedom of expression that are characteristic of the relationship of higher education institutions, academic staff and students. They will also enshrine the need for public universities to have a policy that upholds freedom of speech and academic freedom. These are fundamental tenets of Australian higher education, and this bill will provide stronger protections for both academic freedom and freedom Order. of speech. Senator Ruskin, debate will be in continuation. Questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Today, hundreds of thousands of Australian women are marching for justice, raising their voices saying enough is enough, that sexism, sexual harassment and sexual assault must stop. Instead of joining these women just metres from the front entrance, the Minister for Women sat in this chamber for the debate on a bill she had no responsibility for. Why? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, I welcome the exercise of open democracy that all of those who have participated today, men and women, uh, have taken up to provide their views, uh, both in demonstration and through the form of a petition. And the parliament and the government will, of course, give appropriate consideration to the March Order. for Justice petition. Order, The process of parliament and of being a minister means that we meet with hundreds of people every year in the parliament. And it's the responsibility of any elected government to form positions on those imported, important issues by working through those carefully as a government through the, and through the parliament. It's what we are elected to do. It's our responsibility to listen to the concerns of all Australians. Both the Prime Minister and I have sought to do that with organisers of today's protest uh, directly uh, and to hear from them directly uh, in, a number of, in a number of ways. I do take those concerns very seriously, as do my coalition colleagues. And the Prime Minister's offer of that meeting with organisers still stands. Supplementary question, Senator Wong. Order. Senator Wong. Instead of listening to the hundreds of thousands of women marching for justice by joining them on the lawns in front of Parliament House, the Prime Minister remained in this building. Why? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. I think uh, the Prime Minister has said uh, in uh, his uh, comments on this matter that it is not his uh, usual approach to, uh, to, take, uh, to engage in, uh, in an action such as that outside the chamber. That is not his usual approach. But he has, on a number of occasions, Order. a number of different uh, representatives of community uh, and on a number of different issues, always sought to offer uh, the opportunity for a private meeting directly with the Prime Minister. Uh, the highest office holder in our system, the highest office holder in this country, uh, in, in, Order the, on my left. in the context of this process, he has done the same, has offered that opportunity to those who have organised today's protest and to, to those who wish to raise these issues. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Ms Brittany Higgins spoke to the March for Justice 
on Parliament House lawns today. She spoke with great courage and she said, and I quote, this isn't a political problem, it is a human problem. Well, the Morrison government stop treating this as a political issue and start listening to Australian women. Order. Order. And start listening to Australian women. Order. <laughs> Order. I need to be able to hear the question. Order. And start listening to the Australian women who are saying across this country enough is enough. Senator. Order. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I have had the opportunity to uh, scan Ms. Higgins' remarks today, and there is a range of those statements that she has made today with which I agree, and in fact, the concerns that she has raised over recent weeks with which I also agree. It's one of the reasons the government has worked closely with those opposite, uh, with those around this chamber, indeed, uh, to uh, in support of the development of an independent review of this workplace, its cultures, uh, its, uh, its uh, unique qualities, to specifically and directly address these issues, because we do take this very, very seriously. We have heard those concerns, and my own personal remarks, which I am very happy to repeat in this chamber, Mr. President, are that we must own, as parliamentarians, all of us, these problems. We must own the failings that have caused these or enabled these events to occur, and we must own the Order. solutions. Senator Payne, Senator Askew. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is helping people to have the tools and confidence to ensure that disrespectful, disrespectful behaviours are not learned in childhood? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Askew for her very important question. I'm very pleased today to be able to advise the chamber that uh, last night the first ads in stage three of the Stop It at the Start campaign began airing on national television. We did this um, along uh, with a number of other measures to make sure that we gave the Australian public the tools and the confidence to be able to call out disrespectful behaviour when they see it. Because we know that early intervention is absolutely the key uh, in giving adults um, the opportunity to make sure that they can play a role in making sure that all Australians feel safe in their own home, in their communities and online. Um, last week, to mark International Women's Day, Minister Payne and I announced and launched uh, the third phase of, of this campaign, which is absolutely targeted at the prevention of family and domestic violence uh, perpetrated against women and their children. What the Stop It at the Start campaign does is it challenges disrespectful attitudes and behaviours that can often be learnt in childhood and, if left unchecked, may uh, escalate into violence. And specifically, the campaign is about telling Australians to unmute themselves, to speak up. If you see disrespectful behaviour, don't ignore it, don't excuse it. You need to speak up and call it out. We know that research um, which we've conducted shows that four out of five of us agree that disrespectful behaviour um, and violence against women is absolutely driven by disrespectful behaviour. But many people do not feel confident to call out that disrespectful behaviour when they see it, because each and every one of us does have a role to play in making sure that every one of us feels safe. So taking action um, on this issue may seem overwhelming, um, but if we all take small steps together and we show respect, then maybe maybe we actually can change the dial here, because we know that not all disrespectful behaviour results in violence, but all violence has started with disrespectful behaviour. Order. Senator ask you a supplementary question. Thank you. Order. Order. Senator Askew has the call. Order on my right. Senator Askew. Can the minister explain how the Morrison government is supporting Australians who are experiencing or at risk of experiencing domestic violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very Order much, at the Mr. President. Um, there is no excuse for family or domestic violence. And last year, during the COVID pandemic, we were faced with a potential crisis which 
we sought to respond to by providing $150 million of domestic violence response package to make sure that the states and territories had the frontline capacity to be able to respond to any increases in domestic violence as a result of the lockdowns from the COVID pandemic. This is in addition to the $340 million that we have uh, a record investment into the fourth action plan uh, and also the guaranteeing of the ongoing uh, commitment to the 1800 Respect 24-hour, um, seven-day-a-week hotline um, and making sure that future funding was locked in in perpetuity. We are currently in the process of out and we are consulting on the next plan, which will commence in 2022. And we want to make sure that we listen to all Australians, all people that are impacted, uh, to make sure that we have the best possible plan going forward. Senator, I ask you a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise what services are available for people experiencing domestic, family or sexual violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we certainly understand that reaching out for help can be quite difficult for people. So to make sure that free and confidential advice is at the end of the phone at all times, um, we have funded the 1800 Respect and will continue to make sure that this service is available to every single Australian who may wish to, uh, to access advice, counselling, support or just merely to find out what they should do next in a situation of domestic violence. As I said, you know, during the, the coronavirus lockdown, there was a shift how people decided that they wanted to respond, uh, and we saw a significant increase in the number of people that were seeking to use online and telephone services in, uh, in a way of accessing um, support. The national manager of 1800 uh, Respect, Melanie Sheehan, said that more people were calling the service in the very late hours, closer to midnight, and we also saw an increase in people contacting us via web chat, as this may be when and how people feel more comfortable or safer to seek that support. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Last week, after months of anxiety for the tourism sector, the government finally released their package for the tourism industry when JobKeeper ends. Why did the Morrison government announce a package that, as the Australian Tourism Industry Council has said, will, and I quote, fail to stem major job losses and closures now occurring among many small, family-run and larger tourism businesses? The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Farrell, for his uh, question. Mr President, uh, the Australian government's uh, tourism and aviation package, a $1.2 billion package, uh, combined with of course, our vaccine rollout, which is uh, underway, is part of the government's national economic recovery plan. And what that means is, for the tourism sector, in many ways, the recovery will be driven by Australians holidaying at home until we are able to re-engage with the international tourism sector. And so it does, I acknowledge Senator Farrell, continue to be a very challenging time for our tourism and travel sector. So in addition to the record levels of economic support that we have provided during COVID-19, including JobKeeper and small business cash payments of up to $100,000, which has sustained literally hundreds of thousands of tourism businesses and jobs across Australia. The Order. tourism and aviation package, Mr President, provides further targeted assistance to help the tourism sector, to help them rebound and to save as many jobs as possible. What we will see in Austra with Australia's Order. airlines, with hotels, with caravan parks, with restaurants and bars, with travel agents and with tourism operators is Order. a push from Australian domestic tourists as part of that new support package. And, Mr President, that mix of half-price airline tickets, of uh, cheaper loans for business, of direct support to keep planes in the Order. air and airline workers in their jobs is a bridge back to a normal way of life for Australians. So the centrepiece of the program, Mr President, is a demand-driven program of 800,000 800, half-price airfares to get Australians travelling, to support tourism operators, businesses, travel agents and airlines who continue to do it tough through COVID-19 while our international borders remain closed. It means taking Order. more tourists Payne, to our hotels and cafes. The answer has expired. Mm. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yes, I do have one. Thank you, Mr. President. 
In response to the only demand driving element of the proposal, the chair of the Tourism Restart Task Force, Dr Jeremy Johnson AM, has said, and I quote, the discount airfares will do nothing for tour operators, travel agents and wholesalers. Is Dr Johnson correct? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm not familiar with Dr. Johnson, but what I do know is that the tourism package itself will take more tourists to our hotels and our cafes, uh, taking tours, exploring basically their own Order. backyard. That does mean more jobs and the opportunities for investment from the tourism and aviation sectors. Senator and Green. It is important for local communities, especially in regional Australia, because we Order will continue right to financially well. support flights which are so key to health services, to employment opportunities and to social activities. The half-price ticket program will initially operate to 13 key regions, which includes the Gold Coast, Cairns and Townsville, the Whitsundays and Mackay region, both Proserpine and Hamilton Island, the Sunshine Coast, Darwin, Lassiter and Alice Springs, Launceston, Hobart, Devonport and Burnie, Broome, Avalon, Marimbula and Adelaide and Kangaroo Island. Now, Mr President, in this chamber in recent weeks and months, I have Order. responded to questions on these issues, particularly around Tasmania, Order. particularly Senator around Payne, Queensland. And I know that in my Senator Payne, Se Order across the chamber. Senator Farrell, a final so, supplementary question. If you can please uh, make sure the uh, the minister keeps to within her time. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I do have a further supplementary question. The Accommodation Association of Australia has stated the lack of support in this package will result in the loss of jobs and slow our recovery once borders open. Why has the government abandoned 300,000 Australian workers? Senator Payne. I absolutely reject the premise of, Ms. of Senator Farrell's question, Mr President. There's a number of other new measures in the support package uh, which I hadn't previously had an opportunity to, uh, to speak to, including the expansion of the SME loan guarantee scheme as part of our commitment to support up to $40 billion in lending to small and medium enterprises, precisely the sorts of business that Senator Farrell is referring to, I presume. Under the existing scheme, over 35,000 loans worth more than $3 billion have already been provided, which are Senator helping Watt. thousands of businesses get to the other side of this pandemic. What the SME scheme, recovery loan scheme will benefit from is an increased government guarantee, increasing from the current 50-50 split between the governments and the banks to an 80-20 split. Mr President, we also see the support provided through the new international aviation support, helping Australia's international passenger airlines to maintain more than 8,000 core international aviation jobs, support for regular passenger airports Order. to meet their Senator domestic Payne, security time screening for the costs. Has expired. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. In the 14 days since the Prime Minister has released the final Order. report Sorry, from the Royal please, Commission Senator into Small. Age. Senator Small, you can, I can't hear the question. Senator Small, you can commence the question again. I, I noted who it was directed to. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, in the 14 days since the Prime Minister has released it, can the Minister please update the Senate on the final report from the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and thanks, Senator Small, for your question. The final report, Mr. President, of the Royal Commission was provided to the Australian Government on the 26th of February and publicly released following the table, tabling in the Parliament on the 1st of March. It is a very significant report. The final report, Care, Dignity and Respect, comprises eight volumes, totalling more than 2,500 pages and includes 148 recommendations. The government thanks the Royal Commissioners, the Honourable Tony Bergoni, QC, Linnell Briggs, AO, and the Honourable Richard Tracy, AM, RFD, QC, for their considerable work in conducting the Royal Commission and to all of those who contributed throughout the course of the inquiry. The Royal Commission's report provided some very difficult reading. I thank all those brave individuals, families, carers, aged care workers who gave evidence to the Commission under difficult circumstances. Mr. President, and now we owe it to all of them.
to act on the recommendations of the report and acknowledge the significant and sweeping proposals required to reform the aged care sector, Mr. President, we must do better. It was this government that called the Royal Commission, and it will be this government that delivers. We will not shy away, Mr. President, Order. from implementing the reforms needed to deliver the care our senior Australians require and deserve. The scale and scope of the report and the expectations of the Australian community demand a comprehensive understanding of its outcomes and its recommendations. We intend to provide a full response to the report by 31 May, as the recommendations of the Royal Commission ask. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister advise the Senate on the Australian government's response so far to the Royal Commission? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and thanks, Senator Small. The government will immediately invest an additional $452.2 million as an initial step in responding to the, res to the report. This includes $18.4 million to enhance the oversight of the government's home care packages program to deliver better value for senior Australians and the Australian taxpayer. $32 million to immediately enhance the capacity of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission and greater regulation around the use of restraints in aged care, as we have previously committed, and $189.8 million to residential aged care providers to provide stability and maintain services. And this equates to around $760 per resident in metropolitan residential aged care and $1,145 for those in rural and regional areas. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister outline what other measures the government has undertaken to implement in response to the Royal Commission? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Small. And I can. Uh, we have committed $90 million to support a viability fund to assist those facilities which are facing financial challenges, particularly as the sector begins to restructure and to respond to the changing choices of people who to live at home for longer. $91.8 million to grow the skilled and professional aged care workforce, recruiting up to 1,800 sorry, uh, personal care workers into both home care and residential care, and $30.1 million to strengthen the governance of aged care providers and legislative governance obligations across the entire sector. Mr. President. Mr President, this will be a significant reform for this country and for the aged care sector. And as I've said a number of times, it is this government's determination to ensure that those reforms are undertaken. And of course, as the Prime Minister and I have said, we will respond more fully to the recommendations of the Royal Commission in the budget. Senator Waters. Thanks uh, very much, President. My question is to the uh, Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 100,000 people marched for justice today around the country, calling for an end to gendered violence and for equality and safety and respect. Brittany Higgins, Rochelle Miller, many survivors, powerful women of colour speakers were there. Uh, myself, our female senators, our Greens leader were there, as uh, many of our staff attended. Uh, many of the Labor MPs, their leader and their staff attended as well. Virtually no order. Liberal MPs attended order. Order. the march. Sorry, Senator Waters, I'll, I'll give you it. Order on my right. Order on my right. Order. Senator Waters, I'd ask you to commence from midway through the question I, I got through there, where, where you had up to staff attended. Thank you, President. Ask Virtually no Liberal MPs attended. I commend those who did. But the Minister for Women wasn't there Order and the Prime right. Minister wasn't there. Despite many people travelling a long way to be there, the Prime Minister wanted women to come even further and have a closed-door meeting with him. He couldn't find 10 minutes to go and meet with them. One of the asks of the petition which I seek leave to table, signed by 70,000 people, is for action to implement the 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work inquiry. My question is when will we see action to implement uh, those recommendations, and I seek leave to table this 70,000-strong petition Order. calling for that and, and other things. Is, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I'll call uh, the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President, and, uh, and I thank Senator Waters for uh, her question. Uh, and indeed, I do acknowledge uh, those who have rallied in Canberra and elsewhere around the country today. Uh, I acknowledge the many important messages that were conveyed uh, in the remarks made by uh, by various people speaking at those different rallies uh, and events. Uh, as Senator Payne has already uh, reinforced to the chamber, uh, the Prime Minister. Uh, invited, uh, and the invitation continues to stand. Uh, representatives of those uh, who organised the rally and conducted the rallies uh, to come and to meet uh, with him, uh, with any other senior members of the government, uh, as they wish. Uh, and indeed, that is consistent uh, with many such uh, protests, rallies, or other events that have taken place uh, over the years, uh, and the work and the offer that uh, that has been made on those occasions uh, and accepted by uh, event organisers and activists or others on those occasions. And I would encourage uh, those uh, organisers of this event uh, to reconsider uh, their refusal uh, to accept the Prime Minister's invitation uh, and, to, uh, and to have those, uh, those meetings. Mr President, in relation to uh, the recommendations and, uh, and calls for action uh, in the petition that Senator Waters has just tabled. Uh, there are a number of those uh, for which work is underway. I uh, thank all senators, including Senator Waters, uh, who cooperated uh, with me and the government in establishing the multi-party independent review into workplace practices uh, that, uh, that was an important action to get underway and is one of those, uh, one of those actions called for in the petition. In relation to the Respect at Work report, and the government is acting on a number of those recommendations already. Uh, that includes committing $2.1 million in the 2020-21 budget uh, to implement recommendations related to the establishment of the Respected Order, Work Senator Council. Birmingham. Time for the answers expired. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. The Prime Minister's ministerial standards require ministers to act with integrity, accountability and in the public interest. The Prime Minister can call for an independent investigation into whether ministers meet those standards. Far from being a breach of the rule of law, this investigation is commonplace. It happened in the High Court. It happens across the private sector. It does not replace police investigations. It is a separate question as to whether the Attorney-General is suitable to hold the position of the highest law officer in the land. When will the Prime Minister order an independent inquiry into Minister order, Porter's Senator fitness Waters. to be Attorney-General? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I do I do note that the uh, analogy is uh, is drawn, as it was by Senator Waters, and is often drawn by others uh, between uh, the investigation uh, that the High Court undertook uh, in relation to uh, to former Justice uh, Dyson Hayden, uh, and these other matters. Uh, indeed, the matters uh, the matters that the High Court investigated, as many other um, entities do, uh, relate to. Uh, workplace harassment matters and allegations of what occurred in that particular workplace. Uh, there is a significant difference in relation to the type of investigation you would expect conducted on those matters compared with uh, criminal law allegations uh, that date back uh, a considerable period of time. Uh, the right and appropriate Order. way for criminal law allegations Order. to be investigated uh, in this country uh, is through the appropriate legal channels, uh, and the government absolutely stands by and supports Order. all of those independent law enforcement agencies to do their jobs. Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. On a day when women are asking to be heard, Minister Porter is suing the female journalist uh, and the ABC, and that sends a message about silencing women. If this is designed to alleviate pressure for an internal Order inquiry, right. it won't work. Did the Prime Minister ask Minister Porter to launch the defamation action, and was it so that the government could try to brush aside further questions by claiming this matter is before the courts? Order. I ask for silence during the question so I can hear its terms. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, in relation to whether the Prime Minister requested any such action, I am confident the answer to that is no. Uh, in relation to the action uh, that Mr. Porter has initiated, uh, as, uh, as I have said publicly previously, all Australians, all Australians are treated equally before the law. That includes the rights of all Australians, 
not to be defamed and, if they believe they have been defamed, to take action in relation to those matters. That's what Mr Porter is doing. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. When the government announced its much-anticipated support package for the tourism industry, 13 regions had been identified for support. At that time, Darwin, Adelaide, Hobart and Townsville were not included in the successful list. A document quoted by the Hobart Mercury shows that these locations were in fact originally included but then removed by the government at the last minute. Why were Adelaide, Darwin, Hobart and Townsville dumped from the government's announcement? The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Chisholm for his uh, question. I uh, believe that I indicated uh, the locations uh, for the um, half-price ticket program uh, in my earlier response. Uh, I listed those to the chamber. I indicated that uh, the uh, number of questions which I have received uh, on these matters from those opposite uh, in recent uh, times have specifically asked about uh, those locations. Uh, that these, what I was going Order. to say, Mr. President, before I completed my uh, or Order. before my time expired in my earlier response, was that uh, destinations were chosen in consultation with airlines in regards to relevant routes and using Austrade data to determine the regions who were uh, most impacted by the loss of international tourists. There is capacity to add to the list based on further consultation, based on consumer order. demand, Payne, based on the capacity of 13 of destinations. I have Senator Payne, I have Senator Farrell on a point of order. Senator Farrell? The um, point of order is uh, relevant, uh, Mr President. The question is a very simple one. Why? were those four towns, Townsville, um, Hobart, um, Adelaide and um, Darwin, uh, originally on the list and taken off the list? Uh, I'm listening very carefully to the minister's answer. I allowed you to restate that part of the question, Senator Farrell. I'm going to continue to listen, but the minister was going to the very point of the de determination of which places were included, which it might I'm, I'm going to consider that to be directly relevant. I can't instruct you on the terms in which to answer. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. As I was saying, the destinations were chosen in consultation with airlines in regards to relevant routes and using Austrade data to determine the regions most impacted by the loss of international tourists. I indicated to the chamber that there is capacity to add to the list based on further consultation, based Order. on consumer demand and the capacity of the 13 destinations Order and the success of the program. As I understand it, Mr President, the Prime Minister has said that this is in an initial list of destinations destinations and that more routes will be added. Indeed, after further consultation Order. with airlines, industry and advice from Austrade, Townsville, Hobart, Darwin and Adelaide have been added to the initial rollout list. Order. Order. Con Senator Payne has concluded her answer. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. In a confusing and embarrassing series of backflips, Darwin, Adelaide, Hobart and Townsville have now been re-added to the list, only days after the announcement. If these locations were chosen based on actual need rather than political targeting, why were they dumped from the original announcement only to be embarrassingly re-added? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'm very disappointed that those opposite do not seem to support the inclusion of Townsville, Hobart, Darwin, and Adelaide. Order. I'm deeply disappointed Order. by that, Mr. President, because that would Order. seem on that my, would seem right. to not Order. be particularly Payne, representative of their obligations of as senators right, in Senator this place. Payne, I have to Senator their... Wong on a point of order. Order. I'll call Senator Wong when there's silence. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. The point of order is direct relevance. The question isn't uh, whether what, what the opposition's position is. The question is why the government, why the government, took them, took these locations out, then put them back in. It's a very simple proposition. Now the minister might want to obfuscate by creating straw people arguments, but the question is. Your announcement, why were they taken out and then re-added? So on, on the point of order, it is 
it is not directly relevant to be making observations about the motives of those asking questions. It is, however, directly relevant if the minister is talking about the determination of the locations. I can't instruct her to inspect a premise, but it is not, a, it is not directly relevant to assign a motive to the uh, qu people asking a question. Senator Payne to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. I believe, Mr. President, that I had said to the chamber that after further consultation with the airlines and industry and advice from Austrade, Townsville, Hobart, Darwin and Adelaide have been Order. added to the initial rollout list. Order. But, Mr. President, what I don't understand, what I don't understand is why Order. those opposite don't support that. Order. Why don't they support Townsville and Hobart Senator and Darwin Payne. and Adelaide? I have Mr. Senator Wong on a point of order. Order. I'll call Senator Wong when I can hear her point of order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Point of order direct relevance. You, you have just made a ruling that assignation of motive is not, does not meet the direct relevance rule, and then the minister immediately goes to assigning motive. I'd ask you to pull it into order. Senator Payne on the point of order. On the point of order, Mr. President, what I said immediately after your ruling was, after further consultation with the airlines, industry and advice from Austrade, Townsville, Hobart, yeah, Darwin okay, and Adelaide Payne, have been I, added I, to the I, initial I'm, rollout list. I, I'm very happy to order, keep saying I'll, that, I'll Mr. Rule, President. Um, on the point of order, Senator Watt, I'm, I'm trying to rule on your leader's point of order. The move from relevance to direct relevance has always been interpreted to contain the nature of an answer. Now, when ministers answer a question, further material that is provided, in my view, still needs to be directly relevant and to meet that test. I can't instruct a minister to accept the premise of a question, however, so the minister can answer it in the terms that a minister deems fit. But it isn't appropriate to assign a motive to, the, to, to a person asking the question. Senator Payne concluded your answer. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. After being dumped from the list, Darwin was re-added within hours, while Hobart and Townsville took three days to be re-announced. Was Senator McMahon more convincing in her arguments, or did Senators Abetz and Canavan just take longer to complain to the Prime Minister? Order. 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 I'll call Senator Payne when I can hear her answer. Order I, across the chamber. Senator Watt. Senator Payne. Mr President, uh, I've been very clear to the chamber uh, in relation to the addition of routes. I have also said the Prime Minister has indicated this is an initial list of destination and more routes will be added. I indicated that further consultation with airlines, with industry and advice from Austrade uh, enabled Townsville, Hobart, Darwin and Adelaide to be added to the initial rollout list. Mr President, what I would also say is those senators to which Senator Chisholm referred on this side are superb advocates for their communities, superb advocates for their states and their region. And, Mr President, I definitely uh, Crickets Order. on the other side in terms of their own advocacy. Order. Sorry? Order. I'll, Senator, uh, can we have silence so I may call Senator Roberts? Senator Roberts. Senator, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Senator Cash, and relates to net migration, which is the difference between the number of arrivals each year and the number of people leaving. In the October budget, the figure for net migration in 2021 2020 to 2021 was negative 71,600. The budget made the statement that permanent migration will not resume until the second half of 2021. Minister, are these two statements still accurate? The Minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship, Migrant Services and Multicultural Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Roberts uh, for his question. And Senator Roberts, uh, you would be aware uh, that, in fact, it is now 12 months. Uh, since we had to close the international borders uh, due to COVID-19. As a result, uh, there is no doubt that immigration to Australia has been impacted. Uh, this has had a number of effects, as you know. The government is completely aware of this, and uh, I know that I have discussed this with you previously. Uh, we are doing everything that we can uh, to keep Australians safe, and in particular, 
in relation to the rollout of the vaccine. Uh, but from our perspective, um, immigration, as you know, at this point in time has been stopped as a result of COVID-19. Our priority as a government is to keep Australians safe, and that is exactly what we are doing. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. The Immigration Minister's Office receives passenger manifests online daily. The Australian Bureau of Statistics data for, data for settler arrivals has not been updated for 2021 data. I asked the Minister for Home Affairs for updated information on the 16th of February, and this information has not yet been provided. Minister, how many settler arrivals and how many other arrivals have occurred nationally in 2021 to date? Order. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Senator Roberts. In relation to the exact figures, you did mention the Minister for Home Affairs. I would need to seek those figures from the Minister for Home Affairs. I don't represent uh, the Minister for Home Affairs. What I can confirm, though, is the 2020-21 migration program, as I said to you in relation to uh, the answer I provided to your first question is the migration program has had to be shaped and has had to be adapted uh, to changing circumstances and to support Australia's economic and health recovery from COVID-19. Um, I think you would accept that that is a fact. In terms of the migration program ceiling for 2020-2021, uh, it has been retained at 160,000 places uh, to maximise flexibility for program delivery. In relation to those places, what I can advise you, though, is this. 79,600 places were allocated for the skill stream. 77,300 places were allocated for the family stream. 100 places were allocated for the special eligibility stream. Senator and 3,000 places for the has child. Expired. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. Thank you. In the last three days, Sydney Airport processed 50 international passenger flight arrivals. Each day, Australia receives more than 10 overseas passenger flights. Arrivals and returns are broadly equal, so there can be no talk of empty planes. Now, my office is fielding a question over and over again, so I ask that question. Minister, who specifically is on these planes? Students, temporary workers, refugees, partner arrivals for migrants already here, other categories? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you. And again, Senator Roberts, you actually have um, asked a question that should be more appropriately directed to the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs. So, in relation to that, uh, I will take uh, the, the question um, on notice for you and provide you with uh, what advice I can. Uh, but as you know, and I think as um, the Prime Minister and uh, the Minister himself uh, for Home Affairs, uh, Minister Dutton, have been very, very clear in. Our priority is to get as many Australians home as possible. Uh, that continues to be our priority. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the fabulous Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison-McCormack government is continuing to support a new generation of skills reform through the extension of the Boosting Apprenticeships Commencements Wage Subsidy? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I do thank um, our great senator from the Northern Territory for her question. Uh, and, Mr. President, I am pleased to advise the Senate that last week the Prime Minister and I announced that the Morrison government would be turbocharging our commitment to create new apprenticeships in Australia. And Senator Wong, actually, the word turbocharging is exactly uh, what we are doing, and that is because last year in October we announced that the government would create. 100,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships through our Boosting Apprentice and Commencement Wage Subsidy. It provides, Mr President, 50 per cent um, of uh, the apprentice's wage uh, to the business that takes on the new apprentice. The program has been incredibly successful. And I would like to thank all of the employers out there, because it's the employers who have provided opportunities to these apprentices. And we created the 100,000 new commencements, Mr President, in less than five months. 100,000 new commencements, apprentices and trainees in less than five months. And, Mr President, as a result of this, we announced that we are now uncapping the program. Any business 
that now takes on a new apprentice or trainee up until the 30th of September 2021 will receive the 50 per cent wage subsidy for a full 12 months. Mr. President, we've seen the creation of over now 100,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships within that five-month period. And what we now want to see is the creation of tens of thousands of more. Mr President, this is all part of the skills-led recovery um, getting us out of COVID-19. This is about backing opportunities for Australians, uh, particularly young Australians, but also helping Australian businesses get the workers with the skills that they need. And this, of course, is, I said, thanks to the fantastic employers out there around 40,000 of them who have put their hand up and have taken on a new Order. apprentice or trainee into their business. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister explain to the Senate how this builds on essential support being provided to keep Australian apprentices on the tools and in work through the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, Senator McMahon is right. It does exactly do that. It builds on measures that we've already got in place. And of course, the first measure that we put in place was our supporting apprentices and trainees uh, wage subsidy. That has now kept around 122,000 apprentices and trainees in work in around 60,000 small and medium businesses across Australia. And these, of course, would be apprentices and trainees that, but for this government's support, would have been let go, because the first people to be let go during a pandemic, COVID-19, are, of course, apprentices and trainees. In relation to the Building Apprenticeships Commencement Wage Subsidy, I can advise that the initiative has so far supported the creation of over 8,000 bricklayers, 6,000 electricians and almost 11,000 people in retail and hospitality work. They are people that, but for the wage subsidy, may not have been taken on. But employers, because of the wage subsidy, have been able to put up their hand and take on that Order. new apprentice Senator or trainee Cash, time for into the their business. Has expired. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline how these investments are continuing to support Australia's economic prosperity into the future? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, the Morrison government is providing record levels of funding to our vocational education and training sector to rebuild our economy, but to also prepare for the future. This includes the boosting apprenticeships wage subsidy, as I've talked about, the supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy, and the $1 billion job trainer fund. And that was, of course, the $1 billion fund that we put together with the states and territories to create around 320,000 additional places, that is, new places in the training market that are either free or low fee. Working with the states and territories, all states and territories signed up to the $1 billion fund. Um, and the key to the success of this, of course, was ensuring that those training places were in areas of skills demand. In other words, people are actually training so that they can get a job. Training in areas of demand, that will get them a job. Mr President, we are providing record funding to vocational education and training in Australia because, as the Prime Minister has said, Order. this is a Senator skills-led Cash, time recovery. For the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In 2019, when answering a question on women and the reporting of rape, Mr Morrison said, and I quote, one of the things that often happens with that is they're not believed and their stories are not believed. And it's important that their stories are believed and that they know that if they come forward, their stories will be believed. When deciding whether the Attorney General was a fit and proper person to remain in his role, why did the Prime Minister listen to the Attorney General but not bother to read the alleged victim's own words? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, uh, as I said in relation to uh, the response to Senator Waters' questions earlier, uh, we have um, in Australia, with uh, sound uh, legal and other establishments in place, uh, practices and processes that are well established for the handling uh, of allegations. The Prime Minister uh, and his office uh, acted in accordance with advice from law enforcement agencies uh, that, that allegations of a criminal Order. nature uh, ought be provided 
where possible to police at the earliest opportunity, and that is what the Prime Minister's office did. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary um, question. The former Solicitor General Justin Gleeson has said the allegations against the Attorney General should have been referred to the Solicitor General. Given John Howard had no issue with twice asking the Solicitor General for advice on allegations against his Workplace Relations Minister, why has the Prime Minister failed to listen to advice and refer the allegations against his Attorney General to the Solicitor General? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the allegations in question uh, are allegations of uh, and relating to uh, a, an alleged criminal event uh, dating back to 1988. And the Solicitor General uh, or indeed uh, any other individual office holder uh, outside of uh, a court uh, and its legal process uh, is not in a position to be able to determine uh, the veracity of those allegations. That's what we have Order. courts for. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, why won't the Prime Minister establish an independent inquiry into the sexual assault allegations against his Attorney-General, which would listen to the complaint and consider the alleged victim's own words and the testimony of James Hook and others? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, as I've said in, uh, in a few answers now, uh, we have established legal processes to handle such allegations. As I also said in response to Senator Waters's question earlier, uh, the Attorney General has exercised the same rights as any other Australian in relation uh, to the initiation of defamation proceedings, and I have no doubt that such matters will be heard uh, in a court of law. Uh, in accordance with uh, all of the normal rules of Order. that court of law uh, in the future at some point. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister advise the Senate what the recent announcement by the International Olympic Committee about the 2032 Olympics means for Queensland and the rest of Australia? The Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Australians and Queenslanders, in particular, Mr. President, Senator McGrath, are excited by the International Olympic Committee announcing that South East Queensland is the preferred bidder for the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics. This decision means that we are now a step closer to hosting the Olympic and Paralympic Games with the IOC entering into exclusive negotiations with Queensland for the 2032 event. The announcement is a game-changing de development for the bid, which has been long supported by all levels of government. Since the government announced its support for the bid in 2019, we have been working with the Queensland government, the councils of South East Queensland, as well as the Australian Olympic Committee and the Paralympics and Paralympics Australia to put forward the best possible bid for South East Queensland in 2032. Not only will this event etch a new chapter in Australia's sporting history, as it did with Melbourne in 1956 and Sydney 2000, it will also deliver an economic boost for jobs in Queensland Mr. President, and for Australia. Today's announcement, uh, the announcement from the IOC is a positive development, but we still have a lot of work to do. The Australian government will, over coming weeks and months, continue to work closely and cooperatively with the bid partners during the exclusive negotiation period. Mr. President, we want to make sure that we don't miss this golden opportunity for South East Queensland, all of Queensland and, in, in fact, indeed, for all of Australia. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister explain how securing the 2032 Olympics will build on the work done by the government to showcase our nation to the world? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Australia has a rich history of hosting world-class international sporting events. The 1956 Melbourne Olympics and the Sydney 2000 were enormously successful and gave significant confidence to our nation. In recent years, Australia has hosted the AFC Asian Cup in 2015, 
the 2018 Invictus Games, the 2018 Commonwealth Games and the ICC Women's T20 World Cup. Next year we will host the ICC Men's T20 World Cup, the FIBA Women's Basketball World Cup and the UCI Road Cycling World Championships. In 2023, we will co-host the FIFA Women's World Cup and, the in 2026, the UCI BMX World Championships. We are also in with a great show of securing the 2027 Rugby World Cup. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the ministry outline what are the next steps in securing the 2032 Olympics for Queensland? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator McGrath, for the question. While the IOC announcement was very welcome news, Mr. President, there remains a lot, of, lot more work to be done to secure the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics for Australia and Queensland. The Australian government is continuing to work with the Queensland government, the South East uh, Council of Mayors, the Australian Olympics Committee, and Paralympics Australia. As the exclusive negotiations or targeted dialogue dialogue with the IOC occurs over the coming weeks and months. The targeted dialogue specifically addresses our capacity to host the 2032 Games and conveys our preferred host status. Only the South East Queensland bid has this status, Mr President. We are very clear and must, that we must continue to work hard outlining our vision for a successful 2032 Olympics so that our bid can be successful when the winning bidders are announced later this year. Senator Walsh. The question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Today, despite repeated attempts by this government to undermine and delegitimise her experience, Ms Higgins spoke to thousands of women at the March for Justice and called for action. Will the Morrison government now stop shifting blame and listen to Ms Higgins? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President, and, uh, and Mr. President, indeed, uh, the government um, respects very much uh, the statements made by Ms. Higgins, uh, and, uh, and can I say that I appreciate the engagement of uh, quite a number of uh, staff representatives and former staff in relation to the establishment of the independent uh, review that the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, uh, Ms. Kate Jenkins, is undertaking on behalf of the parliament in relation to parliamentary workplaces and the input um, made both publicly and privately uh, of some of those former staff as well as current staff into the terms of reference and the nature and the conduct of that review uh, is greatly valued. Uh, and I now hope that, uh, that the uh, manner in which that review has been stood up uh, can provide confidence uh, to individuals to participate fully in the review process and to share their experiences as the terms of reference invites them to do so uh, and to work with Ms Jenkins uh, as she independently uh, assesses recommendations that can be brought forward uh, to uh, the government and this parliament in terms of action to be taken. Uh, we have also, uh, as an interim measure, uh, put in place uh, a new hotline uh, to uh, handle critical incidents and, uh, and provided details to uh, parliamentary staff, uh, both current and former. Uh, in terms of their ability to use uh, that service and to reach out to that service, uh, which has um, uh, staff uh, who are equipped to handle uh, trauma counselling type matters, uh, who have been trained and advised in relation uh, to the referral services that are available, uh, such that uh, they can assist in referral, be they of criminal matters through appropriate pathways with appropriate support, or be they of uh, harassment, workplace bullying or other matters uh, which can be referred again appropriately through uh, for investigation and, uh, and assessment again with appropriate support. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Today Ms Higgins spoke of watching the people she had dedicated her life to deny and downplay her experience in question time. The Minister for Women, Senator Payne, has said that, and I quote, the only way it will change is if we as parliamentarians own the problems, own the failings and make the necessary changes. And she repeated those comments today. Exactly when will the Morrison government listen to Australian women and own its failings? Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, indeed, uh, we do. As Senator Payne has rightly said, uh, both in her um, International Women's Day address, but also in question time today, uh, need to acknowledge that we all have a responsibility in relation to uh, the many issues that have been raised uh, over recent uh, weeks. In particular, we have a responsibility to ensure that this place sets an example for the nation in terms of the type of workplace practices uh, that are here, workplace practices that need to uh, ensure, as far as possible, that we stamp out instances of bullying, sexual harassment or sexual assault, that we provide appropriate support services and investigatory services and support where such instances continue, and that we set example in all of those processes, procedures and practices uh, for others to follow. That's the type of work that I'm committed to, uh, to supporting, uh, and I trust that Ms Jenkins, in the review she's undertaking, will deliver recommendations that assist us in that regard. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. The Morrison government didn't listen to Ms Higgins when she needed support after the alleged rape, didn't listen when she went public with her experience, instead calling her a lying cow, and even today refused to listen when she spoke at their very doorstep. Why is the Morrison government refusing to listen to the voices of Australian women calling for justice? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, uh, we certainly are committed to supporting uh, Ms. Higgins and cooperating and assisting with uh, the police investigation that is underway uh, as extensively and fully as we possibly can. Uh, the government has always been willing uh, to cooperate and assist in relation to those investigations. We are also determined to continue our work in relation uh, to the broader issues, not just those in the parliament that I've referenced in the previous two answers, uh, but those more generally uh, across the community. Uh, I was asked earlier about the Respect at Work uh, report, and we are implementing the first nine recommendations of that report. Uh, many others uh, that uh, apply to the private sector, we are working uh, with the private sector in relation to aspects of that. Uh, we are pursuing implementation of those around training resources. Uh, we are seeking to make sure the portal with information for employers and employees on how to eliminate uh, and deal with sexual harassment uh, and the establishment of the Respect at Work Council that I referenced before. Order, we Senator are committed Birmingham. to working on Time all of these the issues. Has expired. Senator Birmingham. And I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Kitching. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Kitching, if you wouldn't mind resuming your seat. I've got Senator Seselja on his feet. Yeah, previous, just a moment, Senator Seselja. I don't, I'm not sure your microphone's working, but we'll just try again. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was a question on uh, the 25th of February from Senator Roberts. Uh, so, additional information is the Western Australian government manages the WA electricity market, and while it is not connected to the national electricity market, ensuring all Australians have affordable, reliable power is a priority for this government. The Morrison government is focused on delivering policies that ensure that Australian families and businesses have access to the affordable, reliable power that they rely on. We want to ensure that there is a balance in the system, and that includes a range of technologies. Batteries have a role to play alongside other technologies like pumped hydro, coal and, of course, gas. Thank you, Minister. As Senator Kitching. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Understanding Order 745A, I rise to seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. The unanswered portfolio questions number, numbers are as follows. 2026, 2027, 2029, 2030, 2031, 2045, 2051, 2052, 2053, 2055, 2059, 2065, 2066, 2072, 2077, 2078, 2272, 2357, 2358, 2426, 2427, and at long last, Madam Deputy President, 2972. 
These questions have been, remained unanswered for some time. And it's not just the problem of not answering those questions or not providing responses to those questions on notice. There's a larger problem for the Prime Minister and for his government. Clause 74 of the Senate Standing Orders provide that a minister has 30 days in which to provide an answer to a question. As at midday today, the 15th of March 2021, there are 22 overdue questions on notice lodged via the table office, and the oldest, oldest of those is 151 days overdue. As an ardent question on Senator notice lodger, Kitching, if I just might remind you, you've listed the questions that remain unanswered, and then I think we seek a response from the minister, and then you can take note of that response. I'm happy to seek a response. Thank, thank you. you, Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, thanks, Senator Kitching. I will be brief in my response. Um, uh, I. Uh, I understand and I thank Senator Kitching for uh, some uh, advance notice in line with the, uh, the traditional courtesies on these matters. Uh, I understand the questions uh, relate to uh, questions in the Prime Minister's portfolio. Um, I, uh, I have, uh, in the short time since uh, advice, uh, sought to raise these issues with the Prime Minister's office, uh, and together we will enable to have them tabled as soon as possible. Thank you, Minister. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. As at midday today, the 15th of March 2021, there are 22 overdue questions on notice lodged via the table office. The oldest is 151. And, uh, Senator Kitching, I note that you're moving to take note of the minister's response. I am response. moving to take notice of the minister's response. Thank you. Thank you. And I thank the minister for um, his explanation. And I do hope that, given the oldest of these is 151 days overdue, the Prime Minister's office might seek see a way forward in responding as promptly as possible, given they've had so much time. Um, as an ardent question on notice lodger, um, both because I believe in the principle of government accountability and because I believe this government in particular is quite an unaccountable government in the history of governments of the Commonwealth. Yet this is one of the most flagrant disregards of, for the Senate and its standing orders that I have ever seen. And remember, we are all bound by those standing orders, except it appears the Prime Minister's office. Um, the Prime Minister is meant to lead by example, an example that flows down to his ministers and his backbench. But this is more than five times overdue the mandated time frame set by this chamber for the return of answers. There's a clear pattern of disrespect and a lack of transparency and accountability by the Prime Minister and, by extension, the minister representing him in this place, Senator Birmingham. Beyond just my questions on notice, there are presently nine freedom of information requests from, the F from FOIs lodged with the Prime Minister's office, under review with the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. All nine FOIs, FOI requests were refused by the Prime Minister's office. And this is an extract from a recent Office of the Australian Information Commissioner email that they sent to me. As set out below, the OAIC continues to experience a year-upon-year -year increase in the number of Information Commissioner's review applications received. The OAIC's annual report 2019-2020 indicates that there has been a focus on resolving matters which are over 12 months old. While the OAIC continues to face resourcing challenges in the FOI area, we implemented further process improvements and resolved more IC reviews during the reporting period than ever before. We achieved a 26 per cent improvement, resolving 829 IC reviews in 2019-2020. The significant increase in the number of applications after sustained increases in previous years, along with our focus on reducing the number of cases over 12 months old, meant we finalised 72 per cent of IC reviews within 12 months, short of our target of 80 per cent. As stated in the annual report, the OIAC continues to face challenges in the FOI area. The OAIC continues to see an increase in the number of new applications lodged, which in turn impacts on the ability to finalise existing reviews. The percentage of matters finalised relates to all matters on hand and includes those finalised through our intake and early resolution processes. These processes often result in matters being withdrawn or closed on the basis of jurisdictional issues. As noted in the annual report, the OAIC received 1,066 IC review applications last financial year. 
We remain committed to finalising all IC review as quickly as possible. In doing so, we have been focused on resolving the oldest matters first. As you can see from the extract of that letter uh, from the Information Commissioner to me that I've just read out, the OAIC, which is an independent umpire, is clearly starved for funding. And this would appear to be a deliberate move by the Morrison government to avoid accountability, and I think that is a great shame. As some of you may know, and Madam Deputy President, you may know as well that there's been a gold standard set in this building for constant evasion and masterly obfuscation by the Department of Parliamentary Services. But as someone who has entered, I hate, almost hate to say this, over 11,000 questions on notice over the life of this parliament alone, I have never seen a question on notice 151 days overdue. So what can you do in 151 days? Well, if you're in Victoria, you can have a lockdown in a quarter. You can also, in 151 days, you can get more than halfway to Mars. You can walk nearly a third of the way along the Great Wall of China, and you can easily walk from Melbourne to Cairns. That's what you can do in 151 days, except if you're the Prime Minister's office, who doesn't respond to questions on notice within the time frame that most other departments and agencies, most other portfolio ministers manage to be able to do. This is disrespectful to the people, the Australian people who are paying all of our salaries. They're paying the salaries of the people in the departments and agencies, and they're paying the, the salaries of the people in the Prime Minister's office. And these same people are going to put, you know, what we've seen is a well before coronavirus, a half a trillion dollars in debt. All the Australian people are going to be paying for that debt for a long, long, long time, as will their children and probably their grandchildren as well. But what we would ask is that the Prime Minister and his office respond to questions on notice. They do not get to remove themselves from this process, and I would like them to answer those questions on notice. You know, Australia is one of the oldest democracies in the world, so we just don't deserve a culture where there is a lack of transparency, lest we believe that the old adage, and I hate to say that this might actually be true, that the people who keep the most secrets have the most to hide. So I would like those questions on notice answered. I'd also like the FOIs dealt with as well, but you know, we one step at a time. This is a Prime Minister and a government that is not transparent about how it spends public money. This is a Prime Minister and a government that kept secrets about its plan to sack a quarter of this country's posties under the cover of a global health pandemic. But perhaps the biggest, deepest and darkest secret of this government is, keeping, is that that is keeping the member for Chisholm in the other place as a national security threat. Some here might, be, uh, might know of the federal court documents that our own domestic security ag agency, ASIO, had made an adverse security assessment of H. Wei Feng, known as Ha Ha Lu. No relation to the member for Chisholm, though they are close, because he has actually donated money. If not for its serious security implications, we would put this story in the truly bizarre pile. An ex-Chinese PLA soldier turned businessman, nicknamed Ha Ha, doesn't speak English, yet somehow becomes a go-to community representative and party donor for conservatives in this country. It almost reads like a John le Carre spy novel, except when it comes to Ha Ha, the joke's really on all of us. Some members of the government have actually risked national security by courting donations from this man, and in the case of the member for Chisholm, this just confirms more of what we already know. The member for Chisholm hasn't been disendorsed, but that's partly because of factional issues in Victoria. But what I would say that that's the, uh, the deepest, darkest secret of this government, because what happens when people don't respond, when the government isn't transparent, that's when you start to get people overriding the standing orders of this place. And that, and that actually is, leads to bigger and darker problems for a government. All Australians deserve transparency from their government and accountability. Beyond unanswered questions on notice, what the Senate seeks here today is an answer to the following question above all. What exactly is this government trying to hide? Most of those who sit opposite were pre-selected on a mantra of small government that should not be running interference for those who seek to obfuscate and evade parliamentary scrutiny by refusing to answer questions on notice put to them by the Australian Parliament. And I would say that everyone opposite, when they were pre-selected, did face questions like that. But what we've actually seen is that they actually don't believe in what they tell their pre-selectors. 
I would like I'm going to go through now some of these questions I notice it seems so difficult to answer. Um, can details be provided of all incoming guests of government visits, including costs in 2018-2019 and 2019-2020? Now, not a very difficult question. Please list the number of Freedom of Information Act requests received by the department for the following years. 2019-2020 financial year and 2020-2021 financial year to date. For each year above, please provide the number of FOI requests the department granted in full, the number of FOI requests the, the department granted in part, the number of FOI requests the department refused in full and the number of FOI requests the department refused for practical reasons under the Freedom of Information Act. For each year above, please also provide the number of times the department failed to make any decision on an FOI request within the 30-day statutory period. Now, they must be very aware when they haven't met the timeline requirements. So I wouldn't have thought that was a hard question. And the number of times a request to the department resulted in a practical refusal, that is, no decision was made on the request. For each year above, please also provide the number of times the department's FOI decisions have been appealed to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner and the number of times has the OAIC overturned in whole or in part the department's decision to refuse access to material. I mean, I could, these are very simple requests that have essentially are uh, in a database but can't seem to be found in, remember, nearly half a year. Here's another one. Please provide a list of all members of the deregulation task force advisory panel since its establishment, including the periods of their appointments. One might not have thought that was too difficult. Are members of the deregulation task force advisory panel entitled to any remuneration? If so, please provide a full breakdown of the remuneration to which each member is entitled. Wouldn't have thought that was hard either. Um, with reference to a news article, Australia Post licensees and customers flood PM Scott Morrison with $5 notes. I've asked how many $5 notes have been received in total? How many $5 notes has the Prime Minister's office in Parliament House received? How many $5 notes has the Prime Minister's depart department received? Have any $5 notes been received at any other locations? Have any other denominations, including coins, been received? Can a breakdown in total value of, those, of these be provided? Have any notes or coins in any currency other than Australian dollars been received? Can a breakdown be provided? In Australian dollars, what is the total value in the exchange rate of the day on Vansa being provided? What has been done with the money received? And if nothing, what will be done with the money received? Um, this was in relation to, I don't know whether people remember the franchisees uh, post office franchisees saying that they would send $5 notes in in order to pay for the purchase of Cartier watches by the former um, managing director of Australia Post. In relation, this is another question. In relation to bonuses, short term incentives, rewards or gifts, monetary or otherwise, awarded to any executive, employee, officer, contractor or any other person, can the quantum of expenditure be provided for each of the following periods for the portfolio? all departments, agencies, government appointed boards, boards and structures, from 1 July 2019 to 30 June 2020 and 1 July 2020 to 10 December 2020. So as you can see, Deputy President, um, these are not particularly difficult questions. They do, that information does reside. A lot of it will reside in databases uh, or other um, you know, Word documents that people keep on their computers. It's just that, really, after 151 days, it seems that the Prime Minister's office cannot be bothered to answer these questions. As I've said before, the Prime Minister should be leading by example. So it is a wonder that we're not having other ministers and other departments and agencies following the Prime Minister's example and actually paying no regard at all to the standing orders of the Senate. Now, I know that there are some ministers in the other place who don't always act respectfully towards the Senate, but one might assume that when one reaches the highest political office in the land, one might be able to follow some of the rules. And it's not like they're short-staffed in there either. So I would like those notes. I would like the minister representing the Prime Minister to take this um, response to his explanation on notice. I still don't really have a response 
in fact, as to why it's taken 151 days. I mean, this is it's extraordinary, really. Um, but I'll leave it there, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Um, if there's no other speakers on that matter, we'll now move to taking note. Senator Kitching. I've got another. Yep. Oh, you've got another one? All right, I'll just put the question on that first one. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Kitching be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Kitching. Thank you. Um, Deputy President, understanding order 745A, I rise to seek an explanation from the minister representing the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and Government Services, Senator Rustin. Clause 74 of the Senate standing orders provides that a minister has 30 days in which to provide an answer to a question. As at midday today, the 15th of March 2021, there were 29 overdue questions on notice lodged via the table office, but I would point out Deputy President, that at 9 a.m. this morning there are 125 outstanding questions on notice, um, but much like a primary school student, Minister Robert seems to be hurriedly doing his homework. Um, I'll, I don't know whether the minister yeah, so wishes we'll to give respond. The minister, an opportunity to respond, Minister. Thank you very. Much. Are you putting the list of the outstanding questions? Yeah. Portfolio question numbers are as follows. 2943, 2944, 2945, 2946, 2947, 2948, 2950, 2951, 2952, 2953, 2954, 2955, 2956, 2957, 2958, 2959, 2960, 2961, 2962, 2963, 2964, 2965, 2966, 2967, 2968, 2969, 2970 and 2971. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Minister. Um, thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy President, and thank you, Senator Kitching, um, for your uh, question. Um, Across the whole of the social services portfolio, more than 500 um, questions on notice have been lodged for response, and many of them have had, had quite um, complex data and, and analysis requirements. Um, we've also had uh, uh, attended numerous COVID committee hearings and responded to uh, approximately an additional 80 um, questions on notice as a result of attendances to that committee. Um, as part of the response to the COVID committee, um, the department uh, across both portfolio areas um, agreed to provide um, comprehensive fortnightly um, data, data sets to the committee to ensure that uh, we were providing um, information in the most timely possible way to ensure transparency and to ensure that the information um, was available for anybody to be able to see. Um, I, I understand um, that, as a general rule, um, my department is, uh, is regularly on time with questions on notice. Um, however, um, with the COVID environment as it has been over the last 12 months, there has been a significant increase in the amount of information that has been sought from the departments that sit within the social services portfolio. Um, and uh, we uh, obviously are very keen to be able to provide the necessary information to this place and to ministers who ask questions on notice. Um, and so, uh, in requesting that information, we thought the provision of, of fortnightly data sets and the like would, would be of assistance. But, um, Senator, uh, I will certainly take um, the request that you've provided in relation to ensuring that the remainder of the questions that still uh, on notice that are still yet to be unanswered, uh, yet, yet to be answered, um, are answered and tabled um, as soon as possible. Thank you, Minister. Senator Kitching. Deputy President, and thank you, Minister Rustin, for your response. I must say that this department. And you taking note? I'm taking note of the um, of the minister's response. Uh, I have to say this department is doing better than the Prime Minister's office and the Prime Minister's own department. I mean, they really lead by very poor example. Um, this department isn't anywhere near the Prime Minister's office of uh, being 151 days overdue. Um, these are slightly less than that. Um, I am going to just refer to the answers that were provided this morning by the minister. Um, some of those this morning, 
the minister returned a single answer for 98 questions that were overdue. And I'll read you the answer. The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and Government Services meets with a range of government and community stakeholders on a regular basis. Providing a response to this series of 98 parliamentary questions on notice would be an unreasonable diversion of resources. How can it be an unreasonable diversion of resources, I asked Deputy President, to tell the, Sen the Senate that Minister Robert has actually been doing nothing? Because let me read you an example of one of these 98 questions that were responded to this morning with that you know, it'd be an unreasonable diversion of resources. My question was, can detail of official duties undertaken by Minister Robert on the 5th of July 2020 be provided? But apparently that's an unreasonable diversion of resources. To answer that, I would hope that the minister or his office keeps a diary somewhere, because the reason I'm asking this is a minister claimed travel allowance. So he should want to answer that question, because it would prove that he was actually doing something to claim the travel allowance. I would think he would want to answer every one of those 98 questions and that someone in his office keeps his diary and can tell what he was doing that day, for which he's claimed travel allowance. I'm not, I'll take that interjection, Senator. I'm not yelling at you, Senator Rust Rustin. You are, the you are the representing minister here. But if you could convey to Minister Robert that he might like to respond for his own benefit to some of these questions. Now, of course, now while we're on the, the subject of Minister Robert, and I'll keep in mind Standing Order 193, Sub Order 3. Um, the, I mean, really, I mean, I can't really go past robo debt. So let's look at Minister Robert and what he did there to see what a, you know, what a wonderful exemplar of a minister he's been. RoboDebt is not just a failure of this government to provide a strict for Australia's most vulnerable. It is an example of this government's agenda to punish people who need support the most. Now, I think we're a pretty lucky country here, and we should share that luck. We should want people. It should not suit more affluent people in a society to want other people to be downtrodden. You don't want great disparity in societies, I think. So robo-debt was an example of really of trying to actually degrade people who actually need support. This was a plan, of course, cooked up by the Prime Minister when he was Social Services Minister and carried on by his former flatmate, Minister Robert. In order to build the illusion of a budget surplus, in 2015, the then Social Services Minister and now Prime Minister, the member for Cook, put together a plan to raise unlawful debts using a Centrelink robot that calculated debts using unreliable averaged ATO data. It wrought terrible destruction through some of the communities most vulnerable. Over 2,000 people died after receiving a robo-debt notice. Thousands more dealt with the stress of debt collectors and shame at wrongly being called a thief. $1.2 billion of taxpayers' money was spent settling this class action. That's $1.2 billion. Oh, okay. The Prime Minister expanded the scheme when he became Treasurer and now refuses to take responsibility with the Robo-Debt Royal Commission. The government ignored at least, if not more, 70 AAT decisions spelling out Robo-Debt's illegality. In November 2019, the government admitted it was unlawful and paused the scheme. Even then, they continued to fight robo-debt appeals at the AAT. Nothing like throwing you know, good money after bad. And they've failed to deliver on their promise to refund victims of the scheme with 3,000 dead people's estates still owed robo-debt refunds. As the minister responsible for the NDIS, the member for Fadden has also overseen widespread neglect and misery. The National Disability Insurance Scheme is a vital national service. But after seven years of this government, it has been slashed and mismanaged to such an extent that people are now dying of neglect in their homes. In early 2020, it was revealed that 1,200 Australians with, dis with a disability had died over three years while waiting to be funded for the scheme. So you imagine you're a person with a disability, you hear of this scheme, you think that this is, this is something the government is going to do to help you. And yet, you, d you are 1,200 Australians with a disability died before they could be funded by this scheme that was brought in to supposedly help them. Minister Robert denied anyone had died waiting, even though this was cold, hard data 
provided by the National Disability Insurance Agency. Since then, reports have emerged of NDIS participants who have died due to a failure of the government to properly oversee the scheme and the providers that deliver its services. One of these people, one of these Australians, was Anne-Marie Smith. Anne-Marie Smith was a 54-year-old Adelaide NDIS participant who died on April 6 of severe septic shock, multi-organ failure, severe pressure sores, malnutrition and issues connected with her cerebral palsy after being confined to a cane chair 24 hours a day for more than a year. Imagine sitting in a cane chair for 24 hours a day for more than a year. Just pause and imagine that. Anne-Marie Smith's NDIS package included six hours of support per day. Reports are that she only received two hours of care per day and had not been outside her house in years. How could she? She was in her cane chair 24 hours a day. Anne-Marie's terrible demise is nothing short of a tragedy. She should be alive and thriving. Instead, she was neglected, abandoned and has died in the most terrible and degrading circumstances. Amory Smith died after years of neglect on April 6, 2020. A year on, a year on, and the government still hasn't taken any tangible steps to stop this from happening again. Another victim of this government and of Minister Roberts' neglect is David Harris. NDIS participant David Harris was dead in his Parramatta unit for two months before his body was discovered by police. Two months. After he was found by authorities, his grieving sister, who's based interstate, learned David's NDIS funding had been cut off because he missed an annual review meeting. This meant cleaners and other NDIS-funded supports stopped visiting the 55-year-old who was schizophrenic, diabetic, incontinent and needing regular injections. How many Australians with a disability must die in their homes before Minister Robert admits that there is a problem? The minister and his office have also been briefing out to a journalist that he will become Australia's next Home Affairs Minister. That is what his office is briefing out to journalists upstairs. Now, what he really should do is concentrate on the portfolio he has now and fix the problems in this system. No one wants another Anne-Marie Smith. No one wants another David Harris. Yet I bet, as, we, as I stand here talking now today, I bet there's another Anne-Marie Smith, I bet there's another David Harris out there who, because of some bureaucratic bungling, is not receiving the support they need, even though they may well be an NDIS participant. You know, there are certain things that people say that aren't great about the Gold Coast, but I'm afraid that Minister Robert probably exemplifies some of those more you know, terrible characteristics of the Gold Coast. You know, I. <laughs> Order. White Shoe Brigade. A white shoe brigade. And like any grifter, Minister Robert wants to move on to his next victim, which seems to be the Department of Home Affairs. He'd really like to, he'd really like to actually move on to defence, is what I hear, where he'd be given the opportunity to grift with defence contractors. But I'm sure the Prime Minister is willing to put him in charge at some point. But for people that rely on some level of support provided by our social welfare system and those living with a disability who just want a life of dignity, like any other Australian, Minister Robert cannot, in good conscience, be left where he is. Now I'm going to read out some of the questions on notice that I put in and the Chamber can judge for itself whether these are really difficult questions on notice that could have been answered some time ago uh, within the 30 days of, as provided by the standing orders or whether there's some excuse for, Senator, to, for Minister Robert to be uh, actually taking more time into making these questions on notice delayed. So, there are in the 2017-2018 financial year, how many new National Disability Insurance Scheme providers were registered? This is not a hard question. With reference to the figure to be provided to question A above, how many new NDIS providers were registered within 30 days of lodgement? So obviously this is to see whether there is efficiency in the department. 
With reference to the figure to be provided to question A above, how many new NDIS providers were registered within 30 days of lodgement without additional information or documents being requested from an applicant? With reference to the figure to be provided to question A above, how many new NDIS providers were registered within 60 days of lodgement? Now, I'm not going to read through, so it goes 60 days, then I wanted to know 90 days, 120 days, 150 days, 200 days, 250 days and 300 days. But if, if a provider, if an NDIS provider was registered over 300 days, it took 300 days to lodge a new NDIS provider as we understand it, I wanted to know how many of those there were. Now I've asked up to how many new NDIS providers were registered within 400 days of lodgement without additional information or documents being requested from an applicant. Because my understanding is that the longer it obviously takes for an NDIS provider to be registered, that means that there are people in the community who should be on the NDIS, cannot actually get to an NDIS provider. That's why we want this information. I asked that for 2018-2019, for 2020 to July 2020 to 31 December 2020, um, as at um, the 5th of February as well. These are not difficult questions, Deputy President. These are questions that are in a database that the department will hold. I want these, an these questions answered. So, for example, can a current organisational chart for the National Disability Insurance Scheme Quality and Safeguards Commission be provided? Apparently that takes longer than 30 days to find an org chart. That's what I'm after, an org chart. And it took. It's I still don't have an answer to that, and I have no idea how long this is going to take to get an org chart. It's a secret org chart. I'll take Senator Wong's interjection. It's a secret org chart. I would also like to know the information on historical statuses of registered providers and dates of registration. Um, but apparently, this is apparently that's also a very difficult question. Um, and apparently, apparently some of this information isn't available. I mean, I'm happy to share with Senator Rustin, Deputy President, I'm happy to share this. There is a reason I'm asking for this, and that's to understand what the NDIS is providing, where are the gaps for people in the community who should be on the NDIS. That's why I'm asking these questions. It's not out of idle curiosity. Um, I would like these questions responded to. Uh, I, it is over the 30 days as provided by the standing orders. But I would really appreciate if Senator Rustin could speak with Minister, Rust, Minister Robert and ask him to respond as quickly as he is able. I take Senator Rustin's point that, of course, there have been, during COVID and um, in providing information regularly through that period, uh, there have obviously the departments have been busy. I'm a reasonable person, but I do expect these questions to be answered. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. If there's no other people, senators wishing to make a contribution on that matter, I shall now ask if there are. Uh, oh, I'll put the questions. Beg your pardon, Senator Kitching. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Kitching be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So we now move to taking note. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Deputy President. Well, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Payne and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Wong, Gallagher and Walsh. Today, more than 100,000 women and men have attended rallies in 36 different locations across the country. Now, my mum was one of them. She attended a march in Lismore. My mum has been waiting for a long time. She sang along to Helen Reddy's anthem, I Am Woman, in the 70s. And I won't say that I didn't tear up a little to arrive at the march down on the lawns here and hear that song being played and realise how long so many Australian women have waited for equality, have waited to be heard. Because women of all generations are tired of not being listened to. They are frustrated that after decades of fighting for equality, we are still facing the same problems. We are still hearing the same stories again and again. We have had enough of sexism. We have had enough of sexual harassment. 
We have had enough of violence against women and their children. We have enough of sexual assault and we have had enough of rape. We have had enough of not being safe or valued in our workplaces. We've had enough of inequality and discrimination. And women today are saying that we will no longer be silent and we will no longer be silenced. One in five women over the age of 15 has experienced sexual assault. Over the last five years, 40 per cent of women have experienced sexual harassment at work. Ms Brittany Higgins appeared today and gave a brave speech to a crowd that wanted to hear her voice. And she said, to see real progress, we must seek it out. And she made the point that time is on the side of perpetrators because the status quo is the friend of the perpetrators. And while there is no action, while there is no progress, while there is no urgency and no ambition, there are no costs and no consequences to the perpetrators all across Australian workplaces. And the frustration and the anger that so many Australian women are feeling right now is because we have been fighting for equality and for respect for a very long time. And it would be good to know that there is a government that is listening, a government capable of approaching the task of reform, of change, of progress, with ambition and urgency. As a government in its eighth year, there have been plenty of time and plenty of opportunities for this government to take that project on. This is a government that inherited the first ever, the first ever national plan to reduce violence against women and their children, established under Prime Minister Gillard, but a Labor project left languishing for the entire period of this government. When I was appointed to this portfolio, I sought, through estimates, to find out what's happening with the initiatives in this plan. It took months, months and months and months to get an update. It was unclear who was in charge of the national plan. Was it Senator Rustin? Was it Senator Payne? They didn't seem to know. Certainly no one in the department even had a spreadsheet that could be easily provided to a senator asking questions about implementation of this national document to tackle violence against women and children. There is no urgency. There is no commitment. There appears to be very little interest in these issues from this government universally. And it's not surprising to me that the level of curiosity about the claims being made on government today is so low. So low that the Prime Minister and the Minister for Women couldn't even do these marches the courtesy of going down to the lawns and listening with respect, listening to the victims and survivors who once again told their story, talked about what it meant to them to have been silenced but now to speak. I don't understand why the Prime Minister didn't attend that march, and I don't understand why Minister Payne sat in this chamber. I simply don't understand it. But I will say this. Australian women are saying enough is enough and we expect more. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Scar. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, first uh, I acknowledge uh, Senator McAllister's contribution and uh, I, uh, the, it was impossible not to feel the, uh, the passion of her address and also the pride in which she, uh, she had for her mother attending the march in Lismore, and I, uh, I do acknowledge that, acknowledge it deeply. Madam Acting Deputy President, I think we need to be fair to Minister Payne. I was actually in this chamber giving a speech in relation to the bill uh, on academic freedom and freedom of speech, and Minister Payne uh, was actually attending the chamber discharging her duties as a minister of this government. And whilst I have in this place heard reflections cast upon senators for not being in this place at certain times, 
which is considered disorderly. I must say uh, that this is the first time I've heard uh, reflections being cast on a senator for actually being in this place uh, doing their job. I've known Senator Payne for over 30 years. She is an extraordinarily decent person who cares deeply about these issues. And I think anyone who, with a fair and reasonable mind, looks at Senator Payne's background, her advocacy on these issues and other issues of great social consequence, could not come to a conclusion other than the fact that Senator Payne is extraordinarily sincere and committed to doing what can be done in relation to address addressing the issues raised by Senator McAllister. Certainly in the context of budget estimates, I've admired how Senator Payne, wearing her Minister for Women hat, has addressed issues and questions which have been put to her by members from all parties in relation to the discharge of her ministerial responsibilities. And in particular, I congratulate the minister with respect to her dedication to promoting the cause of women across the Pacific region. In relation to the accusation levelled at our Prime Minister that he could not make time to meet the people who convened in their march on this place, I think it's important uh, that we quote what the Prime Minister has said in relation to that matter and that it's on the public record. And to quote the Prime Minister, I haven't had a habit of going out to do any marches when they've come to Canberra, but I'm very happy to receive a delegation and I'll respectfully receive that, as I'm sure they will respectfully engage with me." Close quote. So the reality is the Prime Minister has adopted a course of conduct where he does not engage uh, outside the parliament with marches, whatever the cause, whatever the cause. But he made a sincere, a sincere invitation to a delegation to come and meet with him and also with Senator Payne in relation to the matters of concern. And I think that's a fair and reasonable position for our Prime Minister to adopt. There have been some other comments uh, made during this course, the course of this debate, uh, which I think uh, senators need to carefully reflect upon, certainly in relation uh, to the Attorney General and the description with respect to the call for independent inquiries into the matters that were the subject of a criminal investigation which has been closed, I think bear extraordinarily, extraordinary close scrutiny. The fact of the matter is, and this is my view and certainly the view of other members of, of my legal profession who I've discussed, it would be extraordinarily problematic to embark on an independent inquiry, the heart of which is going to matters which were the subject of a criminal complaint. That is simply a reality of the situation. It is problematic. And I think those opposite should at least acknowledge the fact that these are extraordinarily difficult issues and that there is a legitimate view that in an independent inquiry into matters which have been the subject of a criminal investigation which is closed, especially when the allegations are more than three decades old, is a difficult proposition. And that certainly has been argued by such eminent lawyers as Arthur Moses SC, who was president of the New South Wales Bar Council and also the Australian Law Council. Thank you, Senator, oh, Senator O'Neill. My heart is fairly beating out of my chest at this point of time. I've got four minutes and 52 seconds to make some comments about what's going on here today. And I can tell you it is nowhere near enough time to put on the record the disgrace of what has happened in this parliament and what has happened around this country for far too long. There were questions asked today, and I accept that Senator Scar is doing his job of trying to defend his government. But it is hard to accept when you defend the indefensible. Today we heard from Minister Payne, who should be standing up for women, who should be standing up with women today outside this parliament, thousands and thousands of us across the country, with good men, standing up and saying, enough is enough. It's time for change. And instead she chose to be in here 
instead of with the Australian people. That is an indication of how out of touch this government is with the reality of what's happening to women. I've been in this chamber and I've spoken about sexual harassment that's going on in businesses across this country. I spoke for AMP Annie, whose voice was robbed of her. Well, we're sick and tired of our voices being taken by people and silenced in the, in the platitudinous words that we heard today from those who dared to stand and say, we didn't go outside because they didn't want to meet us on our terms. That's what the government said today. That's what Senator Payne said. That's what the Prime Minister said. They would not meet me on my terms inside this place where I have overseen rape. They won't acknowledge that adequately, and today they showed that they are not up for the change that is needed to rid us of this cancer. This cancer in this building and across this nation. Today, when Michelle O'Neill commenced her speech, a fine Australian unionist, a union, a very, very powerful part of democracy, led by two remarkable women. When Michelle O'Neill stood up and spoke about the pad foot, the sound of men's feet approaching as a young girl lies under the covers, I'm reminded of what it was like when I was at a party and I was 10 years old. And I heard that sound. And I thank God I had enough education for my parents to be aware of it and get up and get out of the way of sexual assault as a 10-year-old. And let me tell you what's gone on for me in the last few weeks. Like all these women across the country, I thought I'd packaged up a lot of the rubbish that I've had to take from men. I thought I'd put a lot of it away in the boxes where I leave it littered behind me. I thought it was gone. But so much of it's come up. So much of it has come up. And this is what's happening to women across this country. It is a deep, wild and angry rage. I've had men in this parliament, parliamentarians, yell out at me as I'm walking along the corridor, hey, sexy legs, how's it going? When did that, when did that get sanctioned? When is that OK? It's never OK, Senator Scar, and you're right. And there are decent men, but there are too many who are not decent. And there are too many leading this government, both men and women, who are in the business of shutting this thing down, of silencing women. Well, we will not be silenced. I've got one minute and 24 seconds. Do you want to hear more about what it's like from the age of 12 or 13 when your breasts start to grow, to have men want to grope you? Do you want to hear what it's like to be in a, a workplace? Where because you're a woman, you're fair game for any comment any day? Where you learn to laugh it off with the blokes because that's the only way that you're considered tough enough for an Australian workplace? Well, that is not good enough. It is not good enough. I will not stand for it. Women of Australia will not stand for this any longer. It's got to be done. And I can hear from the very quiet, careful and controlled comments from Senator Birmingham that this government is going to hide behind those words due process, procedures, strategies, planning. Well, we've heard all that before. We've heard it over and over and over, and it's not enough. It was never enough. It's not going to be enough. It's time for wholesale change. I don't want my daughters to continue to put posts up on the Me Too page about things that break my heart. I'm going to be a grandmother in two weeks, in two, in two months, and I want the child who's born in this next two months to live in a different kind of Australia. But this government is not up to the task. Thank you, they Senator are not up to the task. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, uh, thank you. Madam Deputy President, uh, I start by, uh, I guess, you know, reflecting in the same way that uh, Senator Scar did in, in reflecting on those uh, that have made contributions, Senator McAllister and Senator O'Neill, and uh, you know, join, I suppose, with them in, 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 in recognising the deep importance of addressing these issues in recognising the deep importance of recognising the serious issues that, uh, sadly, too many workplaces in Australia are challenged by. Uh, 
everyone deserves to be able to come to work and work in a safe environment. Everyone. Everyone. And our national parliament ought to be and should aim to be the model workplace, the model workplace that all other workplaces could actually model themselves off. All political parties, all political parties and those who work in Parliament House have a role to play in ensuring that we achieve this. Now the government has taken some very significant steps, but sadly we don't seem to get much recognition. Much, I don't seem to see the recognition of those steps that have been taken. In fact, I, I actually welcome the fact that initially there was some real bipartisanship in, in getting on board and making sure that the independent processes that need to be put in place are, are there. Uh, the government has taken significant steps in the last few weeks to address the concerns raised by current and former staff and by parliamentarians. And I'll take you through these. It's why we've established an independent and confidential 24-7 telephone service to support current and former Commonwealth ministerial parliamentary and electorate office staff and those who have experienced serious incidents in any Commonwealth parliamentary workplace. It's why this government has announced an independent review into the Commonwealth parliamentary uh, workplaces, which will be led by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner Ms. Case, Ms. Kate Jenkins. Also, uh, Stephanie Foster, the Deputy Secretary, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Uh, Stephanie, I don't know her personally, but I sit on the, uh, the, 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 the Finance and Public Administration Committee, and I, she often uh, presents in front of estimates. And we know, uh, having sat through that and watching her and how she conducts herself, a thoroughly independent person, a very professional person, someone that is going to, uh, no doubt, uh, I'm confident, will do an outstanding job uh, in the work that she's been tasked to do, which is to assist and advise the Prime Minister on how to improve the processes that are necessary to support people, in particular staff, when serious matters arise. Everyone has the right to protest. Everyone has the right to process and raise their voice. And these are serious issues, and the whole parliament is working through the response to the concerns that have been raised. And I recognise the importance of uh, the, 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 the stated aims of those that marched uh, on the footsteps of Parliament House today out there on the lawn. Uh, and I would encourage those that were part of that and the organisers of that to please take up the offer that was provided by the Prime Minister in good faith to sit down and listen and, and, and so, that, so, they, so he can hear from them and so that there can be a genuine discussion, a genuine discussion that could take place. That's what's needed here. That's what's needed. I welcome and exercise the free speech of those that were outside. Uh, and it's appropriate that we, that we engage with these issues. Uh, just like we had the uh, prior to question time, the, 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 the debating the bill around freedom of speech on campus. You know, the, the freedom to be able to express and deal with issues and be able to deal with them in a, in a free and, and appropriate way is, is, of course, very important. We will continue to work with those opposite and anyone in this place uh, to proceed with this independent review into the issues that both uh, Ms Higgins uh, has, has claimed uh, has happened. Uh, and the culture in the, and also the culture in this workplace. And I hope that this issue doesn't continue to be politicised. It would be disappointing, but the risks are present when those opposites seem to exploit the trauma that's been caused. And we've got to focus on what is necessary to move forward. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Walsh. Well, when the government became aware of the assault of Brittany Higgins in this place two years ago, they had one job, and that was to listen. To listen to her and to help her speak out. When the story of the assault on Brittany Higgins broke just a few weeks ago, the government still had one job, to listen and to help her speak out. When the story of the allegations against the Attorney-General broke, the government again had one job, to listen to the story of the woman we now know was called Kate, 
and to hear her story. In the era of Grace Tame, who had to launch a campaign called Let Her Speak to be heard, in the era when one in five women in this country will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime, in the era when that figure is so much worse for women of colour, in the era when one woman a week is murdered by a man she knows, in this era when sexual violence against women is at epidemic proportions, the government has one job to listen and by listening to send a powerful message to all victim survivors of sexual assault, to tell them that they too will be heard, to tell women around the country that their voice will be respected, that they will be believed, to tell the women of Australia their government gets it, to tell them their government understands, understands the shared experience of every woman whether that experience is the relentless comments, the looks, the words being spoken over when you have something to say, or whether it's the abuse, the violence, the sexual assault, the murder. The government has had just one job in all of this, and that is to listen. To listen to women and let them know that their own government has their backs. And it is because this government has refused to listen that the women of Australia have taken to the streets today, all around the country, because instead of listening, what this government has done on every occasion is instead to roll out its political machine, roll out its machine to silence women from speaking up. This is what Brittany Higgins says she was faced with two years ago, a political machine that made her choose between speaking out and keeping her job. And this year, when she found her voice, the government moved to discredit her. The Prime Minister himself used victim-blaming language, drawing attention to what he called the vulnerable position she found herself in. Instead of taking aim at the alleged perpetrator and sending a message to perpetrators that it is they who will be held to account for raping women, not women who will be held to account for speaking out. The Prime Minister himself showed his complete lack of understanding of the epidemic of violence against women in this country when he had to ask his own wife what to do. And this year, when the friends of Kate found their voice on her behalf and presented a 30-page dossier of allegations against the Attorney-General, the government moved again to silence Kate. The Prime Minister didn't even read the allegations. He didn't even read them. He didn't read them before he declared that he had asked the Attorney General if it was true. He said no, and that was the end of it. Well, the women of Australia have showed today that this is not the end of it. We have seen today that this is not the end of anything. What we've seen today is the women of Australia say loudly and clearly that enough is enough. There is a rawness and a rage in our country today because the women of Australia have had enough. They've had enough of being silenced, enough of being disrespected, enough of seeing machines roll out against them when they try to speak up. There is a conversation going on today about violence against women, and it is getting louder. It's in our schools, it's in our workplaces, it's in the corridors of this very building, it's in the streets. And the only people who are choosing not to be part of that conversation is this government, the Morrison government, the very people who should be leading the way. Thank you, uh, Senator Walsh. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, Senator, yes, you're seeking the call? Yes, yes. Waters. Yes, Senator Waters, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Deputy President. Um, I uh, move to take note of the answers given to me uh, to my question to Senator Birmingham. Um, and I just want to firstly thank everyone that's spoken today and everyone that took the time to go to the March for Justice today right across the country. There were a good 100,000 people 
men, women, people of all genders, young people, people of colour, um, people who hold, held some fabulous signs and people who spoke with such courage and grace and strength. It was an incredibly uplifting and enraging all at once moment. So firstly, my, my deep gratitude goes to those who've spoken out um, on these issues. But the Prime Minister didn't go along to the rally today, and I asked Senator Birmingham, who represents the Prime Minister in this chamber, well, why on earth not? Some people had come from miles away to be at the march today, and the Prime Minister wouldn't even yeah. find 10 minutes in his diary to walk out and to listen to them. Now, I listened to the speakers. There were many people from other political parties that were there listening as well, and they were powerful words. The Prime Minister should have been there. He should have been listening to those speakers, and he should listen to women full stop. He didn't do that, and I'm very disappointed that the Minister for Women was not at the rally today either. It sadly speaks volumes. Um, and once again, I commend the strength of all those who spoke um, at the march today. Now, I tabled a petition that 70,000 people had signed, and one of the asks of that petition was for some action on a now 14-month-old report that the Sex Discrimination Commissioner prepared and tabled last year about sexual harassment in all workplaces. It's called Respect at Work, and there's 55 recommendations. And my question to the government was, well, how many of those recommendations are you acting on? Now, at the very end of the time to answer that question, I got um, a sort of response. Minister, Bur uh, Minister Birmingham said a number of those recommendations. Well, I want all of them acted on. The women of Australia deserve all of those recommendations to be adopted and implemented, and it's not good enough to use a pandemic as an excuse to not progress gender equality. You've progressed an awful lot of other dastardly policies. You've found time to do that, but you haven't found time to keep women safe, and you haven't found time to bring in a federal corruption watchdog. The things that you don't want to do, you've used the pandemic as an excuse to not do, for shame. Now, I then asked about the uh, Prime Minister's ministerial standards, because you wouldn't really know it, but they, there's meant to be some standards. They're written down in a document. They're not actually uh, used, in my view, but they are written down. And they say that ministers are meant to act with integrity, accountability and in the public interest, and they even foresee the Prime Minister conducting an independent inquiry when it looks like maybe those standards have not been met. So there is a process there that could be used by the Prime Minister to look at whether his minister, Minister Porter, is in fact acting with uh, integrity, accountability and in the public interest. But instead we get this absolute nonsense from the Prime Minister and some of his other lackeys that it would be against the rule of law to have such an inquiry. Well, it's, nobody believes that. That is the most ridiculous assertion we've ever heard. An investigation under the Prime Minister's ministerial standards about whether the Attorney-General is a fit person to remain in that role is a separate question to the investigation of the alleged rape by police and other authorities. The two can happen simultaneously, or they could happen, except, of course, the woman took her own life. And we know that, sadly, the justice system is misnamed for so many people who seek justice and are denied it, um, including Kate. So we've had this nonsense about the rule of law, um, saying that an independent investigation isn't possible. Well, that didn't stop the High Court. Um, it, it, it doesn't stop the private sector, uh, it didn't stop the Law Council, it didn't stop sporting clubs. There is so much precedent for having an independent inquiry. There is specific mention of the ability to do so in the Prime Minister's ministerial standards, but he continues to refuse to uphold those standards. Now, I, um, I just thought it was terrible timing and another insult to women that Minister Porter chose today to sue Louise uh, Milligan. Um, and ABC for running the Four Corners episode, um, which alluded to uh, the fact that he had some serious questions to answer. Of all days, when women are hitting the streets asking to be heard and listened to, Minister Porter wants to silence them with a defamation action that the Prime Minister may or may not have asked for. Um, Minister Birmingham didn't think so, but you know, it wasn't entirely clear. Do better. The women of Australia have had enough. We are sick of this government. We are sick of the patriarchy, and we're coming for you. The question is: the Motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day?
There being none, I shall call. Oh, sorry, Senator Dunningham. Um, yes. Um, Mr. President, I give notice that on the next day of sitting, I shall move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to various bills as set out in the list circulated in the chamber and available on the dynamic red, allowing them to be considered during this period of sittings. And I table statements of reasons justifying uh, the need for these bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statements incorporated in the hands up. Leave granted. Leave is granted. There being other, no other notices, I'll call the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of Grand Chief Sir Michael Samare. Leave is granted. Senator Payne. I move that the Senate records its deep sorrow at the death on 26 February 2021 of Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Samare the first and longest-serving Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, places on record its acknowledgement of his central role in Papua New Guinea's development, including of its national constitution, and tenders its profound sympathy to his family and to the people of Papua New Guinea in their bereavement. Papa Lo Country. As well as bearing the title of Grand Chief, Sir Michael Samare was, rightly, known as Father of the nation. Sir Michael was the principal architect of Papua New Guinea's smooth and peaceful independence from Australia in 1975. He served his country throughout his life, including as Papua New Guinea's first Prime Minister and then as Prime Minister on several other occasions, including the longest period between 2002 and 2011. He also served in other ways including several periods as Leader of the Opposition, through to his eventual retirement from politics just four years ago, in 2017. As the nation's first and longest-serving Prime Minister, the Grand Chief has an unparalleled place in Papua New Guinean history and in Pacific history. His contribution to peaceful order and growth in the Pacific was widely appreciated across the region. He worked with Australia and with leaders from across the region from the 1970s through to the 2010s, helping to build the peaceful region of which we are a part today. The early development and successes of the South Pacific Forum, now the Pacific Islands Forum, owed much to the firm friendship that Sir Michael built with Ratu Mara, Fiji's founding Prime Minister. His contribution touched every aspect of Papua New Guinea's transition to full sovereignty, from helping to shape Papua New Guinea's constitution, to launching its economic independence, to fostering the creative arts in celebration of Papua New Guinea's rich and diverse culture. I was honoured to see this firsthand in one of my visits to Papua New Guinea. In 2018, I attended the reopening of the National Museum and Gallery with Sir Michael and Lady Veronica. The gallery, 44 years ago, was his vision. He wanted it to be an intensely Indigenous institution, a centre for cultural activity, identity and knowledge. So our work with Papua New Guinea to refurbish the gallery is a very strong reminder of the, the emphasis that Australia places on Papua New Guinea's culture and diversity and the emphasis that I know he wanted to see. As you walk through that gallery, Mr President, and I have said this to many people, as you walk through that gallery, it is one of the most extraordinary series of exhibits of regional culture that I have ever seen. It is spellbinding. You view it in silence, but in wonder at the complexity and diversity of the culture laid out across the gallery. That was his vision. That was his leadership. And we played a small part in bringing that back to the people of Papua New Guinea in 2018. Sir Michael was dedicated to his family as a loyal husband and father, and I want to extend my personal condolences to his daughter Dulcie Samare, whom I know personally, uh, on this great loss. 
As a loving son, Sir Michael talked publicly about his own father's advice to him about the magic of peace, saying that every clan has its own special magic and ours is the magic of peace. He was also a conciliator. In 1975, on the cusp of Papua New Guinea's independence, Sir Michael wrote in his autobiography that, and I quote, when people come to fight us, we will call them to eat first, unquote. We sit down together. We talk, we eat, he wrote. Then we say to them, all right, if you want to fight, take your spears and stand over there. We also will take our weapons and we'll stand on this side. The effect of this magic on those interlocutors was profound. By the end of the 1960s and into the early 1970s, there was bipartisan support in Australia for Papua New Guinea's self-determination. Prime Minister Gough Whitlam, Prime Minister when Papua New Guinea became a sovereign nation, acknowledged former Foreign Minister Andrew Peacock's key role in the process as Minister for External Territories in 1972. No transition to political independence is easy. In the early 1970s, Papua New Guinea faced major political, economic and separatist challenges. Sir Michael's gifts as a consensus builder, an inspirational leader, and a fierce believer in his people were essential to the peacefulness of PNG's transition. His dedication to public service and national unity helped to create the vibrant and unbroken democracy that Papua New Guinea has been since independence. Australia has a strong relationship with an independent and sovereign Papua New Guinea, thanks to the groundwork Sir Michael laid for an enduring friendship between our countries. Sir Michael was generous, full of energy and time. He was a model for leadership. In doing all of these things and so much more, Sir Michael spread the magic that his father taught him. Papa, blow country. Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, Mr President, I rise on behalf of the Australian Labor Party to express our condolences following the passing of former Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, Grand Chief Sir Michael Thomas Samara, at the age of 84. Mr President, throughout the histories of nations, there are those who are icons, giants, to their people look to, who lead them through struggles, who help them see who they are and what they can be, and the people of Papua New Guinea have lost one of theirs. And I offer my party's condolences, not just to Lady Veronica and his families and friends, but to all the people of Papua New Guinea on the passing of Sir Michael Samare, Papa Bloke Country, Father of the Nation, Grand Chief, and their first Prime Minister, whose leadership spanned decades, and the premierships of Whitlam, Fraser, Hawke, Howard, Rudd and Gillard. He served as Prime Minister on three occasions, from 1975 to 1980, from 1982 to 1985 and from 2002 until 2012. In the latter period, I did have the opportunity to meet the Grand Chief as Minister for Climate Change as the Rudd government engaged deeply with Papua New Guinea on climate change and deforestation. Sir Michael Samara's campaign to lead his people into, into independence coincided with Gough Whitlam and Labor's determination to end Australian colonialism and to deliver self-government to the people of Papua New Guinea. Prime Minister Whitlam made that, uh, well, Mr Whitlam made that clear on visits there as opposition leader in 1970 and 1971. Indeed, Gough Whitlam wanted to see self-government within a year of coming into office and full independence within his first term, and give or take a few months, that's what happened. At the same time, it was Michael Samari with his Pungu party seeking to unite the people of Papua New Guinea in a campaign for independence. He said, a lot of people in this country thought we wouldn't be able to do it. They were talking in terms of two or three decades, whilst I was talking in terms of two years. With some comparability to his own experience, Gough Whitlam once said, Sir Michael's country had found a man whose time had come. Sir Michael was the son of a police officer who bore the tribal name Sana, a name he would later take himself. It is not insignificant that it is a tribal name which means peacemaker. And the values 
to which he was exposed in early life as his father carried out these dual roles in cultural and secular leadership would stay with him throughout his political career. His first vocation was in teaching, a role that then again took him that again took him to different regions across Papua New Guinea. This evolved into a career in journalism and broadcasting, something that would bring with it his first forays into politics. He attended the Administrative College in Port Moresby, which was de designed to build the skills of the local population to serve in the Australian colonial administration. But it also had the effect of bringing together individuals who shared a vision of a new nation, a nation that would govern itself a nation not subservient to a foreign master. Somewhat unwittingly, colonial Australia did build the training ground for the leaders of Papua New Guinea's independence movement, and that is a good thing. Momentum towards independence for PNG, Papua New Guinea, was building throughout the 60s and into the early 70s. After little progress under Australian colonial rule for half a century, international pressure became began to come to bear, and there was an acceleration through this period, as there was in many other parts of the world. Sir Michael Samari was one of many energetic, young, idealistic and nationalistic individuals who were ready to bring the curtain down on Australian administration. They came together, they organised politically, and Sir Michael's union background helped him to connect with other movement participants, of, of which he soon became a preeminent leader. At the same time, of course, Gough Whitlam was modernising Labor and preparing to modernise Australia, including an end to the era of colonisation. Leaving his public service job to successfully contest the second elections for the House of Assembly in 1968, that's the year I was born, Mr President, um, Sir Michael entered Parliament representing East Sepik and succeeded to the leadership of Pungu Party. He became a key figure in the preparations for independence and in the preparation and adoption of the new constitution for the new country. So whilst Sir Michael did not arrive with independence, independence arrived with Sir Michael. Recognising the importance of bringing people with him and with the movement for independence as a whole, as well as tempering the urgency with which some wanted to move, he engaged carefully across the nation and across, the, across peoples. This included travelling to the highlands and villages to talk directly with more conservative tribal leaders. For Sir Michael, independence was the goal, but he recognised it had to be in keeping with Papua New Guinea's traditions and had to be de delivered organically, peacefully and, mo and, most importantly, in a culturally unifying way. Former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd has reflected, Sir Michael was not just a disruptor, but he helped to build a new status quo helped to steer his nation through the heady days of independence and beyond. Having successfully delivered independence peacefully as the country's first Prime Minister, Sir Michael had to make it stick. It was no foregone conclusion that the new nation would be a success, particularly considering its diversity of tribal groups. Papua New Guinea was described by Sir Michael as a melting pot of tribes, clans and families that were never meant to be the same. So, of course, as always, the role of leadership in those early years was pivotal. So Michael helped to build a nation that saw the strengths that lay in its traditional culture and diversity as sources of unity and common ground, rather than as sources of potential fracture and disharmony. Regrettably, Papua New Guinea today is not without serious struggles. Too few children complete school. Too many women are subjected to family violence. A preventable disease still has a devastating impact on the population. And as we speak, the worsening outbreak of COVID-19 poses a grave threat. But it is a country that has made its transition to independence in peace and in optimism, a legacy that is Sir Michael's as much as anybody's, and a legacy in which Labor will always be proud, which Labor will always be proud to have supported. Ronald J. May of the Department of Pacific Affairs at the ANU noted, Papua New Guinea remains one of a fairly small number of post-colonial states that have maintained an unbroken record of democracy. It has managed to maintain the spirit that characterised its transition to independence. Best described by Papua New Guinea's first Governor-General when he said in 1975, we are lowering the flag of our colonisers, not tearing it down. Of course, it was only a few months later that Sir Michael joked, following the dismissal of the Whitlam government, 
We've only let Australia go a few months and look at the mess they're in. <laughs> Sir Michael Samare died on February in February 2021. Papua New Guinea and the wider Pacific has, with his passing, lost one of its most prominent and respected leaders. In his last address to the parliament in 2017, Sir Michael said, we progressed through many waves and changes in the world. We survived our own bad decisions. We have united at times when the world thought it was not possible to do so. We must be thankful and we must always count our blessings. All these things are true and they are in large part true because of Sir Michael's, Michael's stewardship. The opposition again expresses our deep condolences to the people of Papua New Guinea and to Grand Chief Sir Michael Samare's family and his loved ones. Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, it's an honour to say a few words uh, to support this condolence motion today on the passing uh, of Grand Chief Sir Michael Samare, Papua New Guinea's first Prime Minister. And can I say it was an honour to represent uh, the government at the very moving memorial service uh, that was held uh, in the High Commission uh, here in Canberra uh, over the weekend. Uh, as Minister for International Development in the Pacific, uh, I'm acutely aware of how significant Sir Michael's leadership of Papua New Guinea was, including for Australia, uh, Australia's relationship with our region. In the 1960s and 70s, uh, as Sir Michael Samare was emerging politically and growing in his influence, questions of self-determination and democracy were at the heart of national affairs in Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guineans wanted independence and Australia too wanted PNG to emerge as a successful independent nation. At such a time, the emergence of political self-determination could have happened in a number of different ways. Uh, in so many countries, independence was won through violence. Fortunately, as we know, a determined and charismatic Sir Michael Samare uh, guided PNG along an entirely peaceful path and an independent, sovereign nation emerged in 1975. The Australian flag was respectfully lowered in PNG, not torn down. It is to Sir Michael's enduring credit that he managed to forge not just unity of PNG's diverse peoples, but simultaneously presided over the negotiation of an enduring political compact with Australia. Our two countries work together on independence and have continued to partner on securing a sustainable and sovereign path of development for PNG. Sir so Michael's successes in building consensus and building relationships across the region meant that he developed strong ties with successive Australian governments and leaders, from Gough Whitlam and Malcolm Fraser through to Bob Hawke and John Howard and uh, Prime Ministers Rudd and Gillard. Australia's relationship with Papua New Guinea under Sir Michael Samare in his successive terms as Prime Minister set the tenor for Australia's broader engagement with the Pacific. Sir Michael came to symbolise PNG's independence movement, uh, but he also ensured that its independence was more than symbolic. His enduring focus was on PNG's ability to forge a unique national identity, govern independently and sustain itself economically. At the point of independence, Australian financial support for Papua New Guinea was significant. Of course it was, since PNG had been in Australian territory for several decades. But neither side wanted a long-term relationship of financial dependence. And under Sir Michael's stewardship and that of subsequent PNG leaders, PNG has indeed built its economy and developed its self-reliance. Guided by PNG's priorities as a sovereign nation, Australia continues to provide a helping hand. But we do so in ways that Sir Michael Samare helped establish. We do so as peers, sovereign, independent and free, but linked fundamentally by our past, our present and our future. Right through to 2021, in the continuing COVID era, our partnership with PNG seeks to enhance health security, deepen economic sustainability and strengthen regional stability. We continue to champion self-determination and locally driven decision-making throughout the Pacific, just as we did in 1975. 
self-determination, consensus building, respectful partnerships to advance security, prosperity and stability in the Pacific. This is a legacy that Sir Michael has helped bequeath to Australia's relationships with our nearest neighbours. In closing, uh, I'd like to recognise Sir Michael's family, uh, Lady Veronica and their children and grandchildren. Most profoundly, I acknowledge with gratitude the extraordinary contribution Sir Michael Samare made to the tradition of peaceful, peaceful cooperation that binds the Pacific today. May he rest in peace. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to speak on this condolence motion and to pay my respects to the father of Papua New Guinea Grand Chief Sir Michael Samare. In doing so, I want to associate myself with the remarks of Senator Wong and, uh, in contributing to this important motion, recognise the close relationship between Papua New Guinea and Queensland and the very close and customary relationship between the sovereign people of the Torres Strait and PNG. In his time as Chief Minister and then as Prime Minister, Sir Michael, in his important role in the independence of PNG, has always understood and valued the relationship between Papua New Guinea and Queensland. The state of Queensland and Papua New Guinea share more than an international border. Sir Michael remarked in 2008 that the connection is extended to his own education. He was educated by Queensland teachers under the Queensland curriculum. It extended even to the sugar crop in Queensland, which he is reli was reliably told uh, originally came from Papua New Guinea. So Michael lived a life of service to his people and to a nation. As a vice president of the Public Service Association, he spoke up on local wages and working conditions of local workers. He helped launch the School of Broadcasting in Port Moresby. But it was independence and the transformation of Papua New Guinea to the youthful, modern and proud nation that it is today that was Sir Michael's life's work, bringing people together, uniting a nation against the odds. In 2008, Sir Michael delivered a, an historic address at a sitting of the Queensland Parliament in Cairns. It was the first time an invitation of that kind had been offered to the Papua New Guinean Prime Minister and, as he remarked at the time, was an occasion fitting the recognition of the importance we both attach to our relationship and to the long and extensive links that have prevailed between our two peoples. Sir Michael told the parliament, relations between Papua New Guinea and Queensland are indeed the most extensive of all relations with other Australian states. The challenge for us is to ensure that the res reservoir of goodwill that exists between our peoples is exploited to the fullest to deepen our relationship and grow our respective economies. These challenges remain today. Right now, we face the challenge of responding to the coronavirus pandemic together. In the future, we will face many more challenges. The way we face those challenges will always be informed by the deep affection and reverence our nation and the far north Queensland community has for the father of PNG. The Torres Strait Islands and PNG share more than an international border. They share customs and kinship. The Torres Strait Treaty, signed by Sir Michael and Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser in 1978, is recognised as one of the most creative solutions in international law. It uniquely aims to maintain the lives and livelihoods, the traditions and family life between the people living within the Torres Strait protected zone. Families live across these islands and you can almost reach out and touch the villages from the shore of another. Because of this closeness and the treaty which Sir Michael authored, we are not two countries or two people, we are family. And so we grieve with the nation of Papua New Guinea for the loss of your Grand Chief, not simply as a partner in the Pacific, but as family, as a sign of the close connection between not only our two countries, but of the regions of Papua New Guinea and uh, far north Queensland, of the four memorials for Sir Michael being held in Australia. One of those memorials will be held in Cairns later this week. 
That memorial service will be held this Thursday, the 18th of March, at St Monica's Cathedral on Abbott Street in Cairns. And on that occasion, the many people from Papua New Guinea living in Cairns and the people connected to the Torres Strait will have the opportunity to grieve and commemorate a great life. I extend my condolences to Lady Victoria and the entire Samare family. Thank you. Sarah Mullen. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we are proud as a nation to say that uh, as a, a Commonwealth and as a Federation, we are a young nation. And compared to our Indigenous peoples in the old wor world, yes, we are young. But still, as one of the oldest democracies in the world, Australia has assisted a number of nations, not just in our region, but across the world, to either attain a form of democratic government or to sustain that form against internal problems and external aggression. Australia has a proud record of doing so. And one of the main agencies for doing so has been the Australian Defence Force under the direction of government. One of our nearest neighbours, Mr President, is Papua New Guinea. Its road to independence has been long and hard, and the person we are here to commemorate today Sir Michael Samari played a major role in that process and has deep links to Australia. The eastern half of the island of, of, of New Guinea has been ruled by three external powers since 1884. Germany ruled the north of the island beginning that year, calling it German New Guinea, and the United Kingdom colonised the southern half in the same year, calling it British New Guinea, then transferred that portion to Australian administration in 1905. At the outbreak, of World War I, Australia took the northern half of the island from Germany in the only truly independent military action ever conducted by Australia, that is, without being in a coalition with other nations. After World War I, Australia administered the northern and southern half of the eastern side of the island separately until 1949. World War II broke on PNG with violence and suffering. The size of the catastrophe for the local Melanesian people has never been uh, measured, but the interruption to their lifestyle, their local subsistence economy and the introduction of disease and conscript labour could be measured perhaps by the fact that well over 200,000 Japanese, Australian and US soldiers fighting, uh, died in the fighting in PNG. So the impact on the local people must have been immeasurable. As we know, the two territories were combined after World War II into the territory of PNG. This was the nation into which Sir Michael Samari was born. So we rise today to offer our condolences on the death of Sir Michael Samari, the first Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea, when the nation gained independence from Australia in 1975. Sir Michael Samari grew up in East Sepik Province, first attending school there during the Japanese occupation. Sir Michael became a teacher, teaching at several schools, returning to Sagari for further training from 1962 to 63. He was interested in politics early in the development of his nation and was co-founder of the pro-independence Pangu Party in 1967. In 1968, he became the first official opposition leader in the fledgling PNG parliament. In 1972, when PNG achieved self-government, Sir Michael became the first Chief Minister and then PNG's first Prime Minister in 1975 when the nation achieved its independence. It was at this stage, Mr President, that my life and that of PNG and very briefly Sir Michael Samari became mildly interconnected. My first posting on graduating from the Royal Military College in December 1971 was to Papua New Guinea. I was sent there as a Lieutenant Infantry Platoon Commander in the 1st Battalion of the Pacific Island Regiment for three years, half in Port Moresby and half in Ley. My job was to command 30 PNG soldiers as one of the last Australian lieutenants to be sent to PNG, as all young lieutenants who arrived after I did were all Papua New Guineans. Our function was not only to lead and train the PNG soldiers to provide security to the process of self-government and independence backing up the police in internal security, but also to assist in building the nation of PNG. This last duty involved what was called patrolling, which was walking, carrying very heavy packs, 
often with local white kiaps or civilian administrators, through the hills and mountains, swamps and rivers of PNG as my father and uncles did during World War II for eight months of each of the three years I was posted to PNG, and to tell the villagers along the route that there was a country called PNG and they were it. I might have made some small contribution to the stability of PNG during self-government independence, but that country and the PNG people taught me much more about myself as a person, a leader and a soldier than I could ever remember, and for that I will always be grateful. I met Sir Michael during that period on several occasions, none of which he would ever have remembered. Probably the strangest was when I played representative Australian rules football for PNG against a visiting representative Australian Aboriginal team, all Victorian Football League VFL players as ruck. We lined up in the centre of the main Port Moresby Stadium to be personally greeted by Sir Michael. Apart from the umpire, I was the only white man on the field and stood considerably taller than most PNG players. And Sir Michael, moving along the line of players, shaking all our hands, had to significantly lift his gaze and his handshake when he came to me. He may also have noticed that I played appallingly on that day and PNG lost. I was lucky enough to see up close the remarkable change in this, that this society of PNG went through from when I was a lieutenant and on many visits back to PNG until I, I went back as a general many years later. PNG has had many stumbles as a nation, as we all do as our nations develop, but in all those visits I was able to see how Sir Michael inspired and led his people. Apart from being a key figure in the independence negotiations, and in the preparation and adoption of a constitution, the single most difficult task that one could ever imagine. Sir Michael was the first and longest serving Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea. He served either in government or as a senior statesman through political crises, natural disasters, economic trials, rebellion, conflict and constitutional challenges. He was honoured by being made a Knight Grand Cross of the Order of St Michael and St George by the Queen in the birthday honours list in 1990. He is often referred to by his people as Grand Chief or the Father of the Nation, titles earned through those three separate terms as Prime Minister, totalling 17 years leading the nation. Mr President, the nation of PNG, our closest neighbour and of the greatest importance to this country in the rapidly changing strategic environment facing our region, will miss the advice and leadership of Sir Michael Samari, as will many Australian leaders and many of my generation who served in PNG. I offer my condolences to the people of PNG. May Sir Michael Samari rest in peace and may the nation he led, of which he was the father, prosper in his absence. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I am deeply honoured to speak on this condolence motion in relation to the path, passing of the Grand Chief Sir Michael Samare. And if I could say to my friend, the Senator from New South Wales, that it should be recognised that Sir Michael was a devout Blues supporter. <laughs> and there were occasions when political leaders from Queensland visited Papua New Guinea and sought to present uh, Sir Michael with a Maroons jumper and were quickly disabused of the notion that Sir Michael could possibly support other team but the Blues or other codes, indeed, uh, indeed, Senator. It was in the period between 1999 and 2001 when I lived and worked in Papua New Guinea, and as part of that process, I sat the Papua New Guinea law exams. And there were three law exams I had to sit, constitutional law, customary law and land law. And it was reading the history of the development of PNG's constitution that I developed a deep abiding respect for Sir Michael Samare. I can remember in the year 2000 when PNG was celebrating the 25th anniversary of its independence that there was a lot of discussion with respect to uh, the journey to independence and where PNG had gotten up to at that stage after 25 years. And I always reminded my friends in Australia that PNG had gone on a fantastic, momentous journey to independence. It was still a functioning democracy. 
It still had rule of law. It still had free press, and it still does to this day. And in that year 2000, there was actually an Olympic torch relay. And senators here might not realise that the Olympic torch, as it made its way to Sydney, actually went through Papua New Guinea. And the penultimate holder of the torch during that relay was the great Melbourne storm winger, Marcus Bai, in keeping with uh, PNG's esteem for the great game of rugby league, the greatest game of all. But the last, the last holder of the torch, and I can picture Sir Michael with the torch uh, as I deliver this uh, speech, was Sir Michael Zamaro. And, and the joy with which he took that torch as he handed it on to those who were going to take it to the Sydney Olympics. I think in reflecting on Sir Michael's contribution to the independent state of Papua New Guinea, we should carefully have regard to the events of 1980. In my view, this was a key moment in the history of Papua New Guinea. Sir Michael, who was the sitting Prime Minister in the time leading up to, in, to the year 1980 had been the subject of three no-confidence motions in the floor of parliament in Papua New Guinea. Now, no-confidence motions in the floor of parliament in Papua New Guinea are not a rare thing. They are not a rare thing, and politics in PNG is extraordinarily robust. And Sir Michael had successfully defeated the first three no-confidence resolutions. But in 1980, he succumbed to one. He lost one. So the father of the nation, the first Prime Minister, had lost a motion of no confidence on the floor of Parliament. And what did Sir Michael do? He respected the decision of the Parliament. He respected the democratic process, and he stood aside for the next Prime Minister. And that was a key, a key point where Papua New Guinea demonstrated that instead of going the way of some post-colonial nations where they embrace dictatorship, despotism and turn their back on democracy, PNG would not take that path. And indeed, Sir Michael successfully contested the next election where his Pangu party made a storming uh, election win. Now, a storming election win in Papua New Guinea context was 51 seats out of 109, about 34 per cent of the vote. And that's a huge win in Papua New Guinea's first-past-the-post system. So Sir Michael respected legal and democratic processes deeply. He carried no rancor or hubris in relation to the discharge of his deeply held responsibilities, and he was well respected by all of the people of Papua New Guinea, including the people of Bougainville, including the people of Bougainville even during the times of great difficulty in that regard. Now, Sir Michael, notwithstanding the fact that he was a blue supporter, did have a close connection to Queensland. And I'd like to uh, tell at least two stories in that regard. I'm informed by uh, a friend of mine who was uh, head of uh, a PNG Students Association at the University of Queensland that on one occasion Sir Michael presented himself to a bank in Queen Street in Brisbane to convert some Kina into Australian currency. And the bank teller uh, advised him that Sir Michael would have to show identification before she could convert the currency, in, in response to which Sir Michael duly presented the 50 Kina, dollar, 50 Kina note and said, that's me, Sir Michael Samare. I think he got his Australian dollars. Sir Michael was also known to go to horse races in, uh, in Brisbane and really enjoyed that spirit of freedom he could have in a Brisbane context where he didn't need a security detail, he was just another race goer enjoying the day. Finally, Mr. President, I'll just note, and I was reflecting on this over the weekend, that perhaps the events of Sir Michael's final journey from Port Moresby to his final resting place in Weewak say all you need to know about the regard in which Sir Michael was held by the Papua New Guinean people and also about its relationship with Australia. So when Sir Michael's casket was taken to PNG Airport, the uh, attendants attempted to load it into the Air New Guinea flight to go to Weewak, and the casket wouldn't fit. And so the attendants proposed to put the casket in the hold of the Air New Guinea flight. In response to that, the 
many hundreds and hundreds of Papua New Guineans present watching this journey revolted. This could not occur. Their founding father, Sir Michael Samare, could not suffer the indignity of being held in the hold of a cargo of an Air New Guinea flight on his final journey to WeWAC. And so what was the solution? Well, the Australian RAAF provided a transport plane after some negotiations with the Samare family and also with the protesters. It was agreed that that plane would collect Sir Michael and deliver it with dignity and honour back to WeWAC. And that, Mr President, in my view, says everything you need to know about the special relationship between Australia and Papua New Guinea. Long may it be so. Senator Firavanti Wells. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as a former Minister for International Development in the Pacific, I too would like to add my condolences to the family of Sir Michael Samare and to the people of Papua New Guinea on his passing. Um, I would like to associate myself with the comments that have been made uh, by my colleagues, and most especially, I think, Senator Scar, your anecdotes about uh, Sir Michael just really demonstrate. Uh, the close relationship that Australia has uh, with Papua New Guinea and on so many uh, different fronts. And I have to say that I always enjoyed my visits uh, to Papua New Guinea, uh, but uh, most especially um, my interaction uh, with the people of Papua and New Guinea. Um, let's not forget that the stability, security and prosperity of the region is second uh, for Australia, second only to the defence of Australia. And I think that when you do look uh, at uh, the history of Papua New Guinea and what has been relayed to us uh, in relation to the history of Sir Michael as Samari as Grand Chief and father of the nation, I know that Sir, Ma uh, Sir Michael uh, contributed very much to the stability, the security and the prosperity, not just of his own country, but in turn to the region. And I know that many in Papua New Guinea will mourn him, close friends like Dame Meg Taylor, um, who have worked so hard um, to carry on uh, his legacy. As Dame Meg um, leaves her role as Secretary General uh, of the Pacific Island Forum, I know that she leaves a legacy of which her dear friend Sir Michael would justly be proud. So his memory, I think, will live on. And whilst Papua New Guinea will continue to face challenges, I am sure that the legacy of Sir Michael Samari will be a guiding light for the years to come. Vale, Sir Michael. I ask honourable senators to join in a moment of silence to signify assent to the motion. The motion is carried. I thank senators. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Uh, is it desired to postpone or rearrange business today? Senator McCarthy. Um, Madam Deputy President, I just uh, seek your advice. I have a motion by leave at placing of business. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Yes, uh, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Billick for Monday the 15th till Thursday the 18th of March 2021 for personal reasons. Thank you. So the motion is uh, so the question is the motion is moved by Senator McCarthy be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against I believe the ayes have it. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Reynolds. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted for Senator Reynolds from the 15th to the 18th of March. 2021 for medical reasons. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, yes, Senator. Um, if I may, uh, on behalf of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works, I seek leave to move a motion to enable the committee to meet during the sitting of the Senate today. 
is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works be authorised to hold a private meeting otherwise than in accordance with Standing Order 33-1 during the sitting of the Senate today from 6 p.m. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. General business notice of motion 361 for the 16th of March to the 3rd of August. General business 868 for today to the 13th of May. General business 943 for today to the 16th of March. General business 1047 for today to the 12th of May and general business 1048 for today to the 12th of May. Committees have lodged extension notifications as shown in 11, item 11 of today's order of business. Thank you. Um, I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senators. Um, it's now my intention to move to uh, formal business. Um, I believe that there's no business of the Senate. Okay, so I'm going to move uh, to general business. Notice of motion number 1049, standing in the name of Senator Pratt. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1049 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection as the motion being taken as formal? There being none. Uh, there is. Thank you. Um, uh, I now intend to move to general business. Notice of motion number 1046, standing in the name of Senator McCarthy. Senator McCarthy. Uh, Madam Deputy President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1046 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator McCarthy. I move the motion. So the, uh, Senator Dunningham. Make a short statement, please. This leave granted. <coughs> leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunning. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The government is currently finalising its response to the Select Committee on the Aboriginal Flag, and the government intends on tabling the response to the Senate when that is finalised. Thank you. So the question is that uh, general business notice of motion number one zero four six, standing in the name of Senator McCarthy, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. And now move to general business. Notice of motion number 1051, standing in the name of Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Thanks, Deputy President. Um, before moving that this motion be taken as formal, I seek leave to sadly update the numbers of women killed uh, from five to eight. So you're just moving an amendment? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So the question is that the amended motion uh, is leave granted to. Yes, leave is granted. Senator Waters. And I ask that motion uh, number 1051 as amended be taken as a formal motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1051 as amended in the name of Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion. It was on numbers, Senator Dunningham. Yes, sorry. Uh, you, you've taken as formal, am I? Yes, we we've moved? done that. Yeah, okay, Did you right. want to make it one minute? You seeking me? I would love me? to, if I can. Uh, yes. <laughs> leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Thank you. can hear me. Excellent. Well, look, if I can uh, make a short <laughs> statement. Every single death is one too many. We know that domestic violence against women takes many forms, including coercive control. The decision to legislate in this area sits with state and territory governments. We welcome the work being undertaken by all states to investigate the options for legislative reform and the sig significant work that that requires. This week, the Morrison government launched the $18 million Stop it at the start national campaign uh, to uh, educate influences of young people early and ask them to call out disrespect when they see it. Because we know that while all disrespect doesn't end in violence, all violence starts with disrespect. Thank you, uh, Senator Dunningham. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1051 as amended, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to general business. Notice of motion number 1050, standing in the name of Senators Rice and Thorpe. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1050 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call. Are you seeking the call, Senator Brown? 
Uh, I call Senator Thorpe. I move the motion. Thank you. Senator Dunningham. Seek leave to make a short statement. I believe leave is granted for one minute, Senator uh, Dunningham. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, gas is critical to the Australian economy and is a key element of the COVID-19 recovery. We want to see Australian gas working for all Australians. <coughs> Securing community acceptance for new, new gas projects is key to ensuring the industry can thrive and communities can reap the benefits. The local members' concerns and opposition to the project have been noted. Additional gas supply is needed to support our manufacturing sector and to keep the lights on due to our record levels of intermittent renewables in the grid. All import terminals are subject to the State and Commonwealth regulatory and environmental processes. The Crib Point proposal is currently being assessed through a Victorian government regulatory process. Uh, Senator Brown. I seek leave to make a short statement. I believe leave is granted for one minute, Senator Brown. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. As the Greens Party knows, this proposal is currently under review via the usual processes in Victoria. That process has included an opportunity for public input with thousands of submissions received and no doubt listened to. Decisions on this proposal or any other should be made by the proper processes, not stump motions by the Greens Party in this place. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1050 be taken uh, as formal. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Uh, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We will now move to general business notice of motion number 1052, standing in the name of Senator McKim. Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, before seeking formality, I inform the Senate that Senator Wish Wilson will also sponsor the motion, and I ask that general business notice of motion number 1052, standing in my name and Senator Wish Wilson's name, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator McKim. Thank you, Deputy President. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1052, standing in the name of Senators McKim and Wish Wilson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I be uh, believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
order. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1052 standing in the name of Senators McKim and Wish Wilson be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt as seller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as seller for the noes. Order, there being nine ayes and 39 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We'll now, I'll just give senators a few minutes to get back to their spots, um, and we'll move to general business notice of motion number 1043, standing in the name of Senator Patrick. If someone could let Senator Patrick have his seat. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam uh, uh, Deputy President. I seek to amend General Business no Notice of Motion Number 1043 before asking it be ta taken as a formal motion. And has the amendment been circulated? Yes, it has. Um, so the question is that the motion as amendment is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Senator Patrick. I amend the motions in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. So the question is that the motion as amended be taken as formal. Uh, oh, formality has been denied, Senator Patrick. Oh, Senator Patrick. Uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, pursuant to contingent notice of motion, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent the motion being moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Thank you. So the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Uh, ring the bells for one minute. <clears throat>
lock the doors. So the question is that the motion to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Patrick as teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt as teller for the noes. Oh, beg your pardon, Urquhart. Beg your pardon. So our order. So the uh, the result of the division is 12 ayes and 33 noes. The matter is resolved in the negative. Uh, Senator Gallic. Oh, beg your pardon. Yes, to make just just a moment, Senator Rice. Uh, Senator Rice. Thank you. I seek leave to make a short statement about this, the motion that we were just denied the ability to to vote on. I have. Uh, okay, I'm seeking well, leave to make Senator a short Rice statement. Senator Rice is seeking leave. Is leave granted? To, to speak. speak. Uh, I believe. I think I've heard no, but I'll ask again. So, Senator Rice is seeking leave to speak. Is leave granted? Order. I'm trying to be expeditious. Uh, order. Through the chair, please. I'm, uh, Senator Rice is seeking leave to speak. If I don't hear any voices, I'm going to give her the leave to speak. Okay, so Senator Rice has leave for unlimited one minute. Thank you. Fine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have had leave denied on Senator Patrick's motion. We had just failed a suspension of standing orders. In which is denying the Senate the ability to consider an issue of critical foreign policy. Barely a month ago, we had the government and the Labor Party giving notice of a motion in support of the US alliance. And as we said then, we took that as a move that finally, a welcome change that, they would, that the government and Labor would now allow foreign policy motions to be considered by the Senate at this time. But sadly, that appears not to be the case. I want to put on the record that the Greens would have supported Senator Patrick's motion if we had been given the opportunity to vote on it. Um, because the Chinese government abuses against the Uyghur people are appalling. We have millions of Uyghurs who are detained in re-education camps, and the, the Chinese government is conducting a campaign to reduce Uyghur birth rates and to systematically destroy cultural heritage. This is, at the very least, uh, cultural you, genocide, and the Australian Please government must— your seat. Uh, Senator Dunningham. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Uh, as is often the case with matters as complex as this relating to foreign policy, we don't deal with them as formal motions and something Order. so difficult. Look, but uh, Australia remains deeply concerned by reports of enforced disappearances, mass detention, forced labour and pervasive surveillance of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities in Xinjiang. 
and by restrictions on freedom of religion and belief in China. Recent reports of systemic torture and abuse of women are deeply disturbing. The Australian government urged China to allow international observers, including the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, to be given immediate, meaningful and unfettered access to Xinjiang at the earliest opportunity. We consider transparency to be of utmost importance and will continue to work closely with our key partners to advocate on this issue in a meaningful way. Correct. Senator Gallagher, are you seeking leave? leave to make a short statement. Is leave no. granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Gallagher. Yeah, I'd like to um, just briefly um, acknowledge and associate myself with the comments of uh, Senator Dunian. This uh, feigned outrage at being denied formality by Senator Patrick, who is a marvellous actor at times, and that's exactly what he's trying to do. We are having every motion denied at this point in time. Every motion that you choose is being denied. Order. On a substantial matter like this, on human rights violations, it deserves more from this Senate than moving a motion in formal business where it's a yes or no. There is no ability for anyone to speak. Order. That is Order. the problem we have with this and the abuse of this um, part of the Senator program. Gallagher. It is an abuse of this Senator part Gallagher. of the program. And if Resume, people your can't seat. Resume your seat, please. Senator Lambie. No. Sen Senator Lambie. Senators have the right to be heard in silence. I would ask that to be observed. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Um, we, Labor strongly condemns the human rights violations against the Uyghurs and other ethnic and religious minorities in Xinjiang, but we do not believe that the, you, moving it in formal business at this point in time allows that to be appropriately debated. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Uh, leave is not uh, given, Senator Patrick. Senator Patrick, leave has been denied. Please resume your seat. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Order. Lock the doors. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Patrick to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Patrick as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order. So the, so the result of the division is there are 12 ayes and 33 noes. The matter is resolved in the negative. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move motion 1049 and that it be determined without amendment or debate. Is leave granted? No. Uh, Senator Gallagher. If that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving motion 1049 and that it be determined without amendment or debate. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Uh, Senator Patrick, wait for the call. Senator Patrick. Thank you. Just on a point of order, I just point out that the Senate has twice denied spent suspending standing orders today. That generally prohibits that. Uh, um, Senator Patrick, please resume your seat. That's a debating point. I'm going to put the order. Please resume your seat. Senator Patrick, Senator Patrick, unless you are seeking a further point of order, I'm ruling that not to be. You are seeking a second point of order. I'm just trying to seek some understanding. Uh, normally, the, normally the the president or the vice, or the uh, deputy president would would not permit multiple attempts to suspend standing orders. The Senate has expressed its will that it's not willing to suspend standing orders today. Senator Patrick, the the understanding is that the rulings have been to frustrate the Senate. I'm going to now move to put Senator Gallagher's. Uh, suspension. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher to suspend standing orders be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I move motion 1049. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 1049 standing in the name of Senator Pratt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. That concludes uh, general business. I am now moving to matters of public importance. No, you're not. You're not on. No. Are you seeking the call, Senator Farrell? Okay. Right. Yeah. Thanks. No, no. I was just looking. Yes. I w the chair's due to change. But it's Senator Griffith. Inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, two proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Gallagher proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown as item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Okay. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. And I, I know uh, you'll be one person who uh, will have been amazed by and dumbfounded, I think, by the uh, proposal, by the, or the government's proposal, or proposed package for the tourism industry last, last week. Um, <clears throat> Anybody who's been up to far north Queensland will understand how much devastation has been caused to the tourism industry as a result of the closure of our <coughs> federal borders. Now, I'm not talking about our state borders here. I'm talking about our federal borders. Um, <coughs> the decision of the, government, the federal government to close those borders has, of course, meant that all of those international tourists who used to come into this country uh, to <coughs> see some of the greatest natural wonders uh, in the world, like the Dane Tree, like the uh, Great uh, Barrier Reef and all of those other magnificent places in, uh, in our north, they were looking to the federal government to come up with a package post-JobKeeper. Uh, now, <clears throat> the first observation I'd make about that is JobKeeper <clears throat> ends in two weeks' time, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. It ends in two weeks' time. Whatever the government was going to propose to replace it—now, the logical thing 
of course, would have been to do what the Labor Party uh, suggested we should do, which is keep JobKeeper going in those industries that have been adversely affected uh, by, amongst other things, uh, the downturn in uh, tourism. The government decided not to do that, but they were coming up with their own package. And as we know, we saw Minister Tian go up to, uh, to Cairns. We saw, um, saw the Treasurer go up to, uh, to Cairns. And the best that the government could come up with uh, is this uh, package, so the so-called road to recovery, or ticket to recovery, I think the Prime Minister called it. Well, anybody who talks to anybody in the tourism industry, whether you're a hotel operator, whether you're a, a, uh, <clears throat> a uh, restaurant or a hotel, or even an ordinary retail shop, knows that this package is not going to do the trick. It doesn't fit the bill uh, for what the uh, um, industry desperately needs at the moment. The industry was looking for some leadership from Mr Morrison and from the Treasurer. They didn't get it from this package. Now, can I give you an idea, um, <coughs> Deputy, uh, uh, Deputy President, uh, Acting Deputy President, of how silly uh, some of these proposals were? One of the proposals was to try and help Kangaroo Island. Now, that's in our home state, and of course, Kangaroo Island does need some help. They had the bushfires, uh, terrible bushfires and terrible loss of life uh, last, uh, last year. <clears throat> you might even recall the Prime Minister was unaware that there'd been loss of life in, uh, in uh, Kangaroo Island. Uh, <clears throat> then, of course, they got hit by the pandemic. So they certainly need uh, some assistance. Um, <clears throat> So the government decided that they would give cheap tickets from, to Kangaroo Island. Now, of course, there are no international flights into Kangaroo Island. I don't know why. Um, as the former tourism minister, we approved an extension to the length of the, uh, uh, <coughs> the airport in uh, Kingscote, which would have allowed for uh, that. But <coughs> for one reason or another, there are no international flights. So the only way, the only way you can get by, by, by plane uh, to um, uh, Kangaroo Island is to fly to Adelaide. Now, under the original proposal, which we've now seen, yeah, um, I can see, I can see uh, Senator Hanson Young is also shocked. But the only way you can get from into Kangaroo Island, you can't get through from an international flight. Uh, you've got to go via Adelaide. So the original proposal, which we have now seen, is on the uh, on the original website included the concept of flying into Adelaide and then flying on to Kangaroo Island. But the incompetence of this government, the incompetence of this government, when they finally announced their package, they left Adelaide off the list. So, yeah, no, no, you're right. You're right. We don't, we don't agree on much, uh, Senator Hanson Young, but we do agree on this because it was outrageous. Because you couldn't fly into Kangaroo Island unless you flew into Adelaide. Now, <clears throat> I understand the Premier found out that originally Adelaide had been included. When he saw the list, of course, it hadn't been included, it had been excluded. Uh, and of course, he jumped up and down, and Adelaide got added to the list. Now, that, that's just one small portion of the outrageous way in which this government has treated the tourism Thank industry. You, Senator Farrell. Senator MacDonald. Thank you. So, uh, to question the coalition's commitment to our tourism sector displays a cynicism that is unworthy of even the most partisan political hack. And I'm sorry to interrupt the love-in between the, uh, the opposition and the Greens that uh, I've just been watching, but I'm reminded of a quote attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. There are th three classes of people, those who see, those who see when they are shown, and those who, who do not see. And because the Labor Party falls into the category of those who do not see, I'll indulge them with some truths. The Coalition's tourism assistance package alone is worth $1.2 billion spread across subsidised flights for tourists, expanding our offer of guaranteed loans for businesses on top of the already $3 billion in loans that have been processed. We've allocated cash payments to travel agents, cash for zoos to keep feeding animals and subsidies for regional airport security costs. 
but what I've outlined only just scratches the surface of the coalition's commitment to one of our biggest industries. We've also brought in tax breaks for businesses that have been most welcomed and spent millions on domestic tourism advertising uh, campaigns urging Aussies to holiday at home. The extraordinary thing, though, is that having sat on the COVID-impacted aviation inquiry, I watched the TWU in unison with airlines call for exactly this sort of package—$1.2 billion spent on 800,000 uh, seats to allow Australians to fly into communities that have been the most heavily impacted by international tourism cuts. And it is extraordinary to me that, having sat in those hearings, having heard uh, union after union explain that what they wanted is their employees connected to their real jobs, they wanted training uh, and currency so that they remained uh, able to operate a safe airline industry. And when we have delivered on that, when the government has delivered on 800,000 flights to actually have people with their bottoms in seats flying around the country, allowing baggage handlers to work, allowing caterers to work, allowing pilots uh, and air crew to work, not just be tied to businesses through JobKeeper, but actually have their jobs operating to restore confidence in the tourism industry, because thanks to the Labor governments in Queensland and Victoria and others shutting the borders at a moment's notice, there is now no confidence, no confidence in Australians to book flights because they're worried they'll be trapped. They'll be trapped somewhere a long way from home and have to do two weeks of quarantine. And so, having delivered on exactly what it is that industry and the unions, in partnership, spent days talking about in this inquiry, now when it's actually delivered, no, no, uh, they've got to take another opportunity to be critical of the government as we recover from the worst pandemic in human memory. Uh, the other th point that I'd add is that having real people flying on real planes to real destinations, every dollar spent in flights equates to approximately $10 on the ground. That is um, accommodation. That's uh, experiences. Going out to the reef, going out to see things at Kangaroo Island where I've never been but I look forward to going one day, uh, to buying an ice cream or a meal in a restaurant. These are all important multipliers that mean that people are back engaged in the sort of world that we want to be. Uh, so I am uh, comparing uh, our approach to the Queensland Labor government, which has been engaged in some of the most shameful political grandstanding I've seen. It has used people's genuine health concerns to drive a stake into the heart of Queensland's tourism, once again strong, with one strongly beating heart by unilaterally closing borders without notice and, as I said, smashing consumer confidence. And then not only that, it has tried to blame the federal coalition when we have given more than $28 billion in support to Queensland alone, while state labour has barely been able to manage to afford to rustle up $8 billion, primarily because it is broke. Finan federal labour would do well to advise its Queensland arm to get its finances in order and start delivering for tourism in Queensland. Senator Hanson Young. to this uh, debate uh, this afternoon and just what an absolute shambles this government's tourism announcement has been an absolute shambles first of all within six hours of the announcement new destinations had to be added of course uh, Adelaide was added and Darwin we've heard from those who work within the broader tourism industry just how disappointed they are that despite all the calls for action and support for months and months now what they've been left with is very little so it might help the big corporate airlines but of course the small tourism operators right across the country are left with virtually nothing and of course at the end of this month come march those who have been relying on jobkeeper are not going to be able to rely on that either. So not only is tourism slumped in these places, but what has been keeping many people's head above water is about to end as well. 
The government's taken its sweet time getting to a point of announcing any type of tourism package. And then when it was put on the table, it's missed the mark, it's delivered for the big end of town and is doing nothing for those in those small businesses in rural and regional and metro areas that rely week to week, month to month, season to season uh, on the tourism uh, dollars and business. And of course, the other key element of the tourism industry that still uh, is being left out in the cold is the arts and the entertainment industry. Still nothing of any value has been put on the table by this government to support artists across the country and entertainers, despite the fact that it was the arts and the entertainment industry that was the first hit by COVID when those restrictions first came in, when the lockdowns came in 12 months ago, venues closed, events cancelled, people out of work. And they are still, Mr Acting Deputy President, out of work. And despite, despite the constant calls for more support from the government, for inclusion uh, in JobKeeper, for an arts and entertainment specific package, we still see nothing uh, of much value from this government. Now, uh, Senator Farrell has already spoken about what a shambles even uh, the announcement in relation to being able to fly to Kangaroo Island was. And I must say, for everybody in South Australia, we saw straight away what an absolute joke uh, this announcement was. No wonder it had to be fixed within uh, or less than uh, six hours of the announcement being made. But overall, Mr Acting Deputy President, I ask this. At the end of March, when JobKeeper finishes, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are going to be having a, uh, their wages cut or their jobs lost. What good is a holiday if you don't have a job? What good is a holiday if you don't have a job, Mr Acting Deputy President? And this government continues to miss the mark over and over again. And why did we see this announcement rushed out so quickly late last week? Well, it was because, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Prime Minister knew that Newspol was out in the field this weekend. That's what this was about. This was about trying to buy some votes, buy some positive publicity, and they still stuffed that up, Mr Acting Deputy President. You splash around $1.2 billion and you can't even get it right. $1.2 billion in order to buy a bit of a bump in the polls when everything's going pretty shabby on your side of government, and, the, and this Prime Minister still can't get it right. Well, Australians aren't silly and they're not going to be bought uh, and treated like mugs so easily. We know that people are, there are many people who are still doing it really tough. They've had their wages cut, they've lost their jobs, they're desperately waiting for the season to come back around so that they can invest in their tourism business or they can keep working in their casual job. And rather than doing what the industry called for, which was an extension of JobKeeper, an extension of support across the board for the tourism industry, for the arts and the entertainment industry, the government decided to look after the big corporates in the airlines and have a she'll be right attitude for those small business operators and casual workers who actually do all the hard yakka. And it is just unthinkable that the Prime Minister thought that this was going to be enough to satisfy workers, to satisfy the Australian people, and to make people think that they were serious about supporting the tourism industry. So the Prime Minister has got to go back to the drawing board. We need a decent tourism package, support for small, medium, businesses, sole traders, those who rely and have been smashed because of COVID-19 economically, and for those workers in the industries that rely on tourism, like arts and entertainment, hospitality, those workers need to know that this government's willing to look after them too. And all they're being told so far 
is no, they're not. So the Prime Minister has got to go back to the drawing board and come up with something better because this ain't it. This ain't it. And I ask again, what good is a half price holiday if you don't even have a job? And that's the problem the Prime Minister is not willing to fix. Uh, sorry, Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, quite frankly, when the government is in trouble, what does the Prime Minister do? He throws around money. And as the previous speaker said, $1.2 billion has been splashed around, but he can't even get that right. If you really were interested in, in saving jobs, and if we look at the, the destinations in Tasmania that have been picked for this investment, it was uh, Burnie, Devonport and Launceston just happens to be the two held marginal seats of Liberal members. And then the afterthought to include Hobart. But Tasmania's mighty tourism sector is at risk, and it's at risk because this government has no plan and it has refused to actually listen to the sector. By abolishing JobKeeper at the end of the month, it will have an impact on over a million workers, not only affecting my home state but right across this country, and thousands of working families in Tasmania are going to be without jobs or either not enough hours. And this investment in the airline industry by giving people a half fares is okay if you've got a job, but if you haven't got a job, that's of no benefit to you at all. But the Morrison government made an announcement back in September last year, on the 27th of September last year, a $50 million recovery regional tourism fund to support nine tourism regions who have been hit hard by the travel restrictions imposed by COVID-19, and Tasmania was allocated $13.5 million of this fund. Almost six months later, how much money has gone to Tasmanian tourism industry? Not a cent. Not a cent. In fact, the applications for this grant don't even close until the 30th of September 2021. So once again, Prime Minister Morrison is there for the photo opportunities and the big announcement, but there's no follow-up. So struggling tourism sector in Tasmania are going to have to wait until at least 2022 before they see any of that $13.5 million to come to Tasmania. In the meantime, we know that travel agents are finding it extremely difficult, and this injection of funds won't help one travel agent because they don't actually make money out of internal travel in the country. Their money is made through bookings for uh, international travel and um, cruises, so this is not going to help them whatsoever. Now, the government is employing what they do best, and that is policy on the run. And with these cheap flights, it is so clear to see their transparency of pork barrelling marginal seats with their latest scheme is a new low. It was only after lobbying and outrage from the sector that Hobart, the capital, the regional uh, state in Australia of Tasmania, was added to the destination. Hobart was sort of there, and then it was taken away, and then it was put back. We've had sports rorts, we've had community grants rorts, and now we have the flight rorts. With this government, who just keep digging themselves into a deeper and deeper hole, because the Australian people aren't silly. They see through this Prime Minister, a Prime Minister who has been left wanting over and over again. and. He thinks that by throwing $1.2 billion that that is going to get him a bump in the polls. People will not forget that he has been left wanting in some of the most serious questions that this government has Thank had you, to Senator answer. And quite Senator Rennick. Uh, thank you, Acting uh, uh, Deputy President. Uh, it's quite, quite astounding the audacity of the Labor Party when it comes to criticising the federal government on support for the tourism industry and support for the Australian economy as a whole. 
Now, this uh, package announced last week by the Morrison government of $1.2 billion is just a drop in the ocean compared to what we have spent overall. Now, it's interesting. This time last week, I was up in Cairns. I spent a week up in North Queensland last week, and the Palaszczuk government came out and announced $200 vouchers just for the city of Cairns. Right? Now, Cairns happens to be all Labor-held state seats. Did we come out and accuse the Labor government, the state Labor government, of pork barrelling or anything like that? No, absolutely not. All we happened to point out was that while while the state Labor government was sticking a whopping $3 million into the economy of Cairns, we had previously, in the last 12 months, invested or injected over $800 million, $800 million into the city of Cairns. Quiet. I mean, that's over 25 times more than what uh, the state Labor government is going to be doing over the next few months. So for the Labor Party to be sitting here and saying that the federal government is actually putting the tourist sector at risk is not true at all. And it's worth noting, it's worth noting that if any industry has been impacted uh, by the inconsistencies uh, displayed by the state governments, especially the state Labor governments, because in the main it's been the state Labor governments, the three big ones, Victoria, Queensland and WA, who have kept their borders closed who kept their borders closed and who kept flip-flopping as to when borders were open and as to when borders were closed. And it was interesting, just at the start of this year, uh, I got an enormous amount of feedback. I got trolled big time by, of course, the Labor trolls and the digital lynch mob on uh, social media. But you know, late last year, we had the chief medical officer of Queensland come out and say, we don't need to lock down again. We've got this under control. We go for 130 days with no cases. And then we have one case, just one case in quarantine. That you know, so the source of it was known. And what did uh, the state premier do? The Queensland state premier do at nine o'clock on Friday morning. She came out and said she's going to lock down the city of Brisbane to over two million people at five o'clock that afternoon. Now, thousands of people, uh, workers in the hospitality industry were directly impacted by that. Now, what's we, what we've got to remember here is this was the first week back this year. A lot of businesses were restarting. They were going to make a fresh start, a new year. Uh, they get to Friday, the first weekend of the year, and what happens? The state Labor government shuts down Brisbane, uh, resulting in the loss of thousands and thousands, if not, I, I suspect, millions of dollars uh, in losses for the hospitality industry. Now, we heard uh, when we were talking about the uh, uh, aviation sector, we had the CEO of Virgin come out and call for the state governments to have a consistent framework in regards to number one, border closures, and number two, the restrictions on hospitality venues across the country. Now, I've also got a very good friend of mine uh, who's a leading Australian musician who has personally called me and asked for some consistency uh, in the restrictions um, across the states. He had a gig to play in Adelaide. I got a call from on the weekend. This is going back a few weeks ago. He was had a gig to play in Adelaide. He got a, um, you know, Victoria shut the border with uh, South Australia shut the a border with Victoria again, and suddenly he was short a bass player. And you know, it's it was all booked. The event was all booked, and then uh, you know he had to ring around and try and find someone uh, to come and play at that event. And this is the sort of uh, inconsistency that is leading to a lack of confidence, a lack of confidence in the hospitality sector. Uh, and the tourism sector in opening up. Now, it's worth noting that as we head into winter this year, this is a fantastic opportunity for southern, um, southerners, uh, from, especially from New South Wales and Victoria, to fly north to Queensland. Now, they would have loved to have done that last year, and at one point uh, the Premier opened up and then closed down again. Um, but this is a perfect opportunity to keep the borders open this year. Now, what we've got to remember with the tourism sector is for about the last 15 years, more people have left Australia than entered into Australia. We've actually had a deficit in the tourist numbers. So what we have is a net tourist deficit, so more departures than arrivals. So there is an opportunity now with the international borders closed to promote internal uh, tourism across the country. And there is an opportunity uh, for the higher spenders who normally would go overseas, for them to come up to Queensland or vice versa. It is very important that the state premiers 
apply consistency. Now I've now got we've now got uh, you know the vaccine rolling out, which should hopefully you know as the year rolls on, we'll get that out. Um, so we, we should have uh, contact tracing and testing in place. We've got our numbers across the country down to single digits outside of quarantine. So there is absolutely no reason why the state premiers can't give some uh, confidence to our hospitality industry and to our tourism sector. Um, and it was interesting. I note uh, Senator Polly before said uh, that you know you've got to have a job to be able to spend money to go on a holiday. And it's interesting because I thought to myself, you've actually got to have a job to get superannuation as well. So you know one thing I'm not going to take from the Labor Party is the is the lack of universal uh, universality uh, in. Uh, this particular package, given that they promote superannuation, despite the fact that you know unemployed people, uh, stay-at-home mums, people on disability pension uh, don't get superannuation either. And the other thing, of course, is, is the idea that tourist uh, 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 operators won't necessarily will miss out on this is not true. People aren't going to travel, uh, go travelling, uh, and do nothing when they get there. They're going to, you know, for example, arrive in Cairns. They'll go in. They'll book a scuba diving trip. They might uh, book a uh, trip up to Port Douglas. They might go out in a boat. They might take some tours inland uh, to see Daintree Forest. All of those things, they can walk in off the street uh, if they want to book, book something. So there is still op opportunity uh, for um, agents, uh, travel agents, to get some, uh, uh, some spin-off eff spin effects of this. And likewise, they're not going to sit in their hotel room and eat. Uh, room service every night. They're going to go out and they're going to eat at these venues. So the idea that this money has been misallocated or miswasted uh, is just more fear-mongering and negativity from the, the, those opposite, opposite us. Uh, and quite frankly, I think the, the whole uh, uh, premise in which this MPI is based is completely, completely false. And you know, I touched on the numbers before in Cairns, and I'll just touch on them again. The state Labor government is putting $3 million into Cairns for tourism. Uh, in the last year alone, the federal government has put over $800 million in. But if we just look at the Queensland overall, the federal government has put $28.5 billion, $28.5 billion into Queensland. Now, what has the state Labor government done? They're putting in a measly $8.8 billion over the forward estimates. Over the forward estimates. And can I say, if the, state, if the Labor Party and their state uh, Labor colleagues are so worried about creating jobs, well, let me tell you the one key message I got out of North Queensland last week, and that is we need more water. We need more water. And the state Labor government has only built two dams in the last 30 years. One of those dams, Paradise Dam, they're now uh, pulling down or uh, not quite pulling down, they're halving the wall, the size of the wall, so they're going to reduce the size of that dam. And one other dam in Bow Desert, where the, they've actually got the water wrong, the water's brackish. So, we are the, the people of North Queensland are calling out for more water security. You know, I saw the mayor of Port Douglas last weekend. He needs a lake. Port Douglas could actually run out of water very soon uh, if the state Labor government doesn't get busy and build a lake, a bigger lake for Port Douglas to have some water supply. So there is a great opportunity here to take that capacity in the labour market and go and build some dams. Now, I'm happy to go to the Treasurer and, and, and get an infrastructure bank up and running to fund the states to build these dams. Okay? But we've got to remember it's wealth for toil. It's wealth for toil. So here is a perfect opportunity to create more jobs, long-lasting jobs. You know, there's so many benefits off water security. We get uh, irrigation. There's benefits for agriculture. We get clean, green hydro energy. How good is that? Clean, green hydro energy. We get flood mitigation. We get flood mitigation. I mean, that will help reduce the risk and reduce insurance costs in North Queensland. We get recreational activities like water skiing. Uh, I know my hometown. You know, on the weekends in Chinchilla, we used to all go out to the weir and do water skiing and whatnot and kayak uh, back up the, uh, the mighty Condamine. So there is a great opportunity here to get busy, build dams. It's wealth for toil. It's not wealth for whinging and wailing, which is what we all, all we ever seem to get from the Labor Party. And it's about time they got with the program and started to look forward and have a vision for this country rather than looking backwards. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, over a million Australians are employed in our tourism industry, a sector which is critical for our economy as a whole. 
uh, and is especially important for those regional communities which rely almost entirely on tourism. We know that the sector has been doing it extremely hard because of COVID, and this has real impacts for regional communities and also for the individuals, for the families, for the households who rely on the JobKeeper lifeline right now. While many sectors hit by COVID have begun to recover, tourism is different. It will continue to need help until domestic and international travel fully resumes. And JobKeeper has been absolutely vital for the sector, uh, and that is exactly why the Labor Party argued so strongly for the JobKeeper program. But we still haven't seen a plan from the government for the good, secure jobs uh, that are needed to replace JobKeeper. In Victoria alone, it is estimated that over 300,000 jobs in tourism, transport and hospitality are at risk today without JobKeeper. So it absolutely beggars belief that the government has announced a tourism package that will not protect jobs, that doesn't respond to the needs the industry itself has identified, that has been met with disappointment and confusion by tourism operators and regional communities, and that actually encourages Victorians to abandon their plans to travel to our own tourist towns and instead take a flight in interstate instead. Now, the Victorian Tourism Minister, Martin Pakula, has written to his federal counterpart asking that four extra destinations be included in the government's poorly targeted tourism package. And uh, Minister Pakula has been frank in saying that, and I quote, somewhere in the Canberra bubble there seems to be a misunderstanding about how Victorian tourism works. Uh, and he's gone on. Regional and metropolitan tourism, he says, um, is too important for it to be coloured by the electoral map. Now, Victoria has asked the Federal Tourism Minister to include Melbourne Airport, as well as the regional airports in Mildura, Bendigo and Albury in New South Wales in the scheme. Now, given the on-again, off-again naming of locations by the government in this scheme, Victorians will have to watch closely to see whether their airports and towns make it onto the list and, indeed, if they do, whether they stay on the list. Let's face it, this scheme is an absolute shambles and it has been a shambles from day one. And the Deputy Prime Minister's shambolic interview over the weekend failed to reassure tourism operators or anyone else for that matter that the government has a plan to get local economies back on track. This scheme is a politicised vote buying exercise. That is what it is. It is not a jobs plan. It is a politicised vote buying scheme put forward by this government. And what Victorians want is a federal government that will actually support a plan for a real recovery uh, that will look after the people of Victoria and that will back the tourism operators and make sure local jobs are protected. Victorian regional communities are definitely doing it tough and they need a federal government that backs them up. The people and regions that rely on tourism need a real plan from this government uh, and they absolutely deserve better from the government. There are just too many Victorians employed in this industry to let it fail under this shambolic government scheme. Thank you, Senator. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this MPI and I want to condemn the Labor Party for its economically reckless position it has adopted in opposing the Morrison government's $1.2 billion aviation and tourism package. I'm a proud Victorian senator and I'm very disappointed by the contribution of Senator Walsh, who clearly does not understand what is going on in Victoria. Last Friday, I visited the Great Ocean Road Chocolate Tree and Ice Creamery. It's a business which is based in three different locations, the Mornington Peninsula, the Yarra Valley, and on the Great Ocean Road near Anglesey. And when Daniel Andrews imposed the snap five-day lockdown across Victoria, when there was not one regional COVID case anywhere in our state, 
This business lost $300,000 in five days. And there are countless businesses in Victoria on the Valentine's Day weekend, restaurants, accommodation providers, tourist parks and tourist destinations like the Chocolate Tree, which suffered. And I have not heard Labor members, Labor senators in this place speak out about the enormous economic damage that Victorian businesses have suffered as a result of unnecessary restrictions in Victoria, including the last day, five-day lockdown. That lockdown cost our state $1 billion. So perhaps if Senator Walsh had done her homework, she would understand that businesses like the Chocolate Tree depend on a clientele from interstate, which amounts to some 22 per cent of their overall clientele. After the most exceptionally difficult year, Ian and Leanne Neeland backed this package. They believe that half-price tickets to Avalon Airport commencing on 1 April will make a difference. And why will it make a difference? Because tourism businesses cannot function, they cannot operate without tourists. And since the confidence of so many tourists has been destroyed because so many people are reluctant to cross the border into Victoria because of the way the border lockdowns have been managed in Victoria, this is not just a huge incentive to come to Victoria from places like Queensland and also Sydney into Avalon. This is a great confidence booster. As Ian Nealon said, anything that can be done to attract more people to the region is really welcome. Almost 22 per cent of our customers pre-COVID were from interstate, and now there are virtually none. Just imagine having more than 20 per cent of your customer base wiped out. They need confidence to travel, and perhaps this package can be helpful. The bottom line is that passenger arrivals to Avalon Airport fell over 72 per cent in 2020 due to COVID. Our region's tourism sector employs some 17,000 people just in the, in the Geelong and Great Ocean Road region and contributes almost a billion dollars to the local economy. Already we've seen the support package prompting a 75 per cent increase in the number of Australians searching for domestic holidays online. And I absolutely condemn the partisan attack by the member for Corio, Mr Miles, and the member for Corangamite, the current member for Corangamite, Ms Coker, who have once again failed to stand up for our region. In asserting that this package is too focused on marginal seats, Labor continues to put politics ahead of constituents in the Corio and Corangamite electorates. Avalon Airport is deep in the heart of the Corio electorate. It services the Wyndham region, Western Melbourne. It services southwest Victoria, and it services much of Victoria because it's so easy to fly in and out of. And we are so proud, the Morrison government, of the work that we have done to stand up for regional tourism through our Geelong City deal, through our investment in the international terminal at Avalon Airport, creating Victoria's second international airport. And I absolutely say to Mr Miles, with the majority of workers at Avalon Airport from the Corio and Lawler electorates and with so many businesses in our region dependent on tourists coming to our region, Labor's failure to back half-price tickets to Avalon and all the other airports we have designated shows a reckless disregard for the tourism and hospitality sectors. So I call on as many Australians as possible to visit our region, to eat in our restaurants, 
to sample our wineries, to spend up big and, of course, to visit wonderful tourist attractions like the Great Ocean Road, Chocolate Tree and Ice Creamery. It is rather interesting that uh, Mr Albanese he visited Karangamite last Friday and it was all negativity and no solutions. He was accompanied by the current member for Karangamite, someone who failed to back fast rail between Melbourne and Geelong, someone who stood shoulder to shoulder with Mr Shorten and his $387 million of taxes and is now embroiled in a grubby war with the CFMEU, which is demanding the member for Karangamite repay hundreds of thousands of dollars. She backed a state Labor Geelong City deal, which did not include one project in Karangamite. She failed to speak up about the restrictions which caused so much grief in regional communities right across Victoria, including in Karangamite. She failed to say a thing to stand up to the Victorian Labor government when they shut down the Rip Curl Classic, which has now moved to New South Wales, costing local businesses in Torquay and Janjuk and Belbray and across the surf coast countless hundreds of thousands of dollars. She even failed to stand up and speak out against the human rights abuses in Victoria when people were shut in their homes with no notice, most notably those shut in the public housing towers. And now Ms Coker is failing to stand up for tourism businesses, hotels, pubs, cafes, restaurants, which need tourists. They need a market. This is a very important package for our country. It includes a whole range of different elements. Of course, there is the 800,000 half-price tickets, and uh, the government and the Prime Minister has made it very clear that if there is a case for further airports to be added, then we will do so. But how ridiculous of Minister Bakula to be advocating for at Tullamarine Airport to be included in this package so that business travellers can have their tickets to Melbourne subsidised. I mean, already we are seeing hotels in Melbourne subsidised to the tune of $1 million because of the hotel quarantine program, which is actually not currently being used. We have seen an absolute disaster with the hotel quarantine program in Victoria, which has led to more than 800 deaths. And frankly, when you compare the fact that our government has stood shoulder to shoulder with all Victorians, delivering in excess of $40 billion of support, I condemn Labor for rejecting this package. This is not just important for hotels and pubs and cafes in our important regional tourist areas. It's important for our the viability of our airlines. It's important for airline workers. It's important for travel agents. And it's important for businesses which now can access a new government-backed loan scheme where the government is backing these loans to the tune of up to 80 per cent. So this is an incredibly important spend for our country, $1.2 billion, including for regional Victoria and I condemn the Labor Party for opposing this critically important rescue package. Thank you. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to um, speak on the impact of the removal of JobKeeper um, will have on the tourism sector and the wider economy, and particularly in my home state of Tasmania. But I wouldn't like to let an opportunity go by to comment uh, just quickly on Senator Henderson's uh, contribution, uh, and you know, I really ha have to wonder whether Senator Henderson has got over the fact that uh, the people of Kering might just prefer Ms. Coker. They chose Ms. Coker to represent them, and I, I really think, um, you know, th there was an opportunity. There was a, re a reason for that, and, and it's because Ms. Coker is an extraordinary local member, hardworking, passionate, and committed to her electorate. Now, 
One of the things that um, has been said in this uh, contribution is um, uh, around the fact about the, the um, areas that have been selected. Now, anyone, anyone, if they were really fair dinkum, would say that this government, the announcement of this initiative, was a failure. You, it's, it's amazing to me that you have government members come up, government members and senators come up and try to spin that extra, extra um, areas, extra cities, extra towns have been added because they made a case. Now, we know that's not correct. We know that there was a list that was put out there accidentally, presumably, and then suddenly the official list was reduced by three, which included Hobart my, in my home state of Tasmania. Now, come on, you've got to wonder. I mean, this government has mucked up so much. They, they have failed in so many ways in terms of initiatives and uh, funding and grants that don't reach where they're supposed to be reaching. They don't reach the communities they're supposed to be reaching. They don't reach the people they're supposed to be reaching. And this, this announcement is no different. They are wanting, saying to the Australian people, Oh, 24 hours later. Oh, we've um, had, they've had, we've had representations, and we're going to add uh, Adelaide and Darwin. Then three days later, after the original announcement, we're going to add Hobart. Nothing to do with people jumping up and down. The tourism industry jumping up and down. Um, the uh, Labor politicians in Tasmania jumping up and down, uh, saying, "Why isn't Hobart on there?" You know. So here we are. Sorry, Senator, Senator Brown. Just ignore I think the um, that is exactly what I'm saying. That it, we had people jumping up and down, and the government realising once again that they've made an error, they've uh, mucked up the whole announcement, and the fact, and the fact that the original list, the original list was tweeted out. So you got to ask. Really, was this all about marginal seats? And unfortunately, unfortunately, this is what this government's all about. It's all about politics. Politics first. And it's not about the people, it's not about the community. And it, that is why they have continued to get rid of JobKeeper when they should have been doing something. Okay. Senator McCarthy. Hear, hear, Senator Brown. Hear, hear. I would like to just uh, speak about the Northern Territory, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, tourism is the lifeblood of the Northern Territory and in 2018-19 uh, tourism directly employed 8,400 people in the Territory and that's 6.3 per cent of overall Northern Territory employment. It supported 15,600 jobs or 11.8 per cent of the region's total employment. And in the same period, total tourism gross state produce (GSP) was 2.6 billion, or 9.5% of GSP. So you can see by these figures, Mr. Acting Deputy President, that tourism is a critical part of our economy in the north. And while the territory has done a remarkable job in keeping us safe from COVID, our tourism industry has been hit hard. You only have to see the stories in recent months, in particular around our icons, our jewels of the Northern Territory in terms of the national parks of Uluru and of Kakadu. Let's not forget all of the others in the tourism industry of the Northern Territory, hospitality, the hotels, accommodations, uh, the cafes, the stores, all of these, the campgrounds, the caravan parks are so vital, especially now, uh, in particular in the top end, Mr Acting Deputy President, as we prepare for the dry season, which is, uh, in, in terms of the north, uh, a very critical point 
of having people come and spend their money and get away from the cold climates like Canberra and Melbourne and Sydney. But this government's refusal to listen to the needs of the tourism industry in the wake of cutting off JobKeeper kicks them when they're down. Alice Springs, Uluru and apparently Darwin, which was added at the last minute, or was there a bit of a confusion? Was it there initially and then taken off, put back on because of the cries um, that said, here in the Northern Territory, we're missing out? And it's great that Darwin is back on, don't get me wrong, but just the confusion, confusion that uh, was carried around that uh, just upset people even more, thinking, well, we, we obviously don't matter. So when these prices or these places were added at the last minute and are included in the half price airfare scheme, I mean how is it going to actually impact the tour operators, the cafes, restaurants, accommodation providers, retailers, taxi drivers, hire car companies? All of this is still unknown. And it is astounding, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the government is expecting cash-strapped Australians to spend their own money trying to save our tourism industry when it won't do the same. And it might shock members of the government to learn many Australian families actually can't afford the airfares to Darwin and Alice Springs, even at half price. It would cost a family of four over $2,000 to fly from Sydney or Melbourne uh, to Alice Springs at current prices, and that doesn't count the cost of accommodation, tours and the rest. So whilst I highly recommend that people visit us in the Northern Territory, uh, the fact is many Australian families just can't afford this at the moment, and territory businesses are worried. They're staring into an uncertain future, especially in the regional centres of the Northern Territory. The Northern Territory government's uh, tourism voucher scheme has assisted many to stay afloat, and I certainly commend the territory government for that. But companies which rely heavily on international visitation like the bus and tour operators, are looking at grim times. The owners of businesses like Emu Run, Uluru Camel Tours and Way Outback Safaris are going to be forced to make some very tough decisions Senator with cutbacks with JobKeeper McCarthy. ending on March Your 28. Time has expired. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. Well, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, last week we saw the public treated to a live set of the Prime Minister's greatest hits. Selective pork barrelling, corporate welfare and policy by photo op. After a year of unimaginable anxiety and uncertainty for aviation and tourism industry workers, they tuned into the morning news to see the Prime Minister grinning at them from an A330 Airbus, brandishing a novelty-sized boarding pass. Our ticket to recovery, he said. He called it the aviation package except that it wasn't. The Morrison government's ticket to recovery was in fact a cynical attempt to buy votes in marginal seats and give more, millions more of public money to Qantas and Virgin, all with no requirement that Qantas keep their staff connected to their jobs. We've seen this attempt by the government where we've seen really socialism for the rich and powerful while the working people of this country get next to nothing, no guarantees, no obligations on that money that's being uh, handed out. There is no sector of the economy in which workers have suffered more during the COVID-19 pandemic than the aviation sector. And yet the Australian government has consistently sold those workers short and sold them out again with this announcement. At every possible opportunity, the Prime Minister has had to give these workers a helping hand. He has pulled that hand away. A recent report by the OECD found that the Morrison government has, has been ranked 18 out of 28 OECD countries in COVID-19 support for the aviation industry. That's 18 out of 28 in the OECD. They're behind the Netherlands, the US, UK, Switzerland, even Portugal. And as a direct result of the Morrison government abandoning the aviation sector, Australia has recorded among the highest rate of job losses in the sector at over 30 per cent, compared to just 19.5 per cent in the United States and 15 per cent in Singapore. 
How do you get an airline industry back up and running at short notice to make sure that we're ready after COVID? Of course, the stories have been you know, wide and largely spoken about the abandonment by this government, the heartbreaking stories of workers like catering and cleaning workers at Donata. Of course, the Morrison government excluded the JobKeeper program for those workers. And to the ground handlers with decades of dedicated service to Qantas who saw their roles outsourced in the middle of the pandemic. Now, we heard from Peter Seymour during a recent Senate inquiry. Now, Peter was a Qantas employee for 31 years, towing aircraft between hangars and terminals. In 2019, Peter was diagnosed with stage five prostate cancer. He continued to work for Qantas though until the side effects of his radiation therapy made this impossible and he went on to sick leave. In the middle of the pandemic, Qantas took Peter off sick leave, off sick leave and said that he was forced to return to work to pay the bills until he was forced to take redundancy. He said, I was put in a position by Qantas, not COVID, Qantas. And of course, Desiree, another worker who has been outsourced by Qantas, I cannot explain to you what the stress has meant to me, and I don't think my happiness will ever be restored. Well, Peter and Desiree, like thousands of other workers, have been abandoned by this government. Pork barrelling, novelty boarding passes <coughs> and gimmicky photo ops. We need Aviation Keeper, and I urge the Morrison government to finally step up. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. The time for discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. And Senators, the documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Are there any speakers? All right. Oh, Senator, Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to go to page seven, so I'm just wondering if you're going to do page by page. I'll tell you or... what, I was going to do page by okay. page, but yep. I think you probably could go straight to page seven if there's no speakers. Senator Urquhart. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I want to speak to the government response to the committee report on the community of Senator Urquhart, Senator Urquhart, the government responses are listed for tomorrow. Oh Just well I will come back tomorrow then. Thank you I very look, much. I look forward to hearing you tomorrow. If there are no further speakers on documents, how easy is this, Richard? Eh? All right, are there any ministerial statements? Oh, Minister. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I table a response to a question taken on notice during question time on the 24th of February 2021, asked by Senator Patrick relating to the regional airline network, network support program, and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Ah, okay. Are there no committee messages? No. Okay. Straight to messages. Thank you, Richard. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives returning the Treasury Laws Amendment reuniting more superannuation bill 2020 and informing the Senate that the House has made the amendments to the bill that the Senate requested. Minister. I move the bill be read a third time. The question is the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and for related purposes. Thank you. A message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding a resolution agreed to by that House proposing the appointment of a new Joint Select Committee on Road Safety. Minister. I seek leave to have the message considered immediately. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the Senate concurs with the resolution of the House of Representatives proposing the appointment of a Joint Select Committee on Road Safety. Thank you. The president has. Re oh, I'm sorry. I'll put the question that that, that 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 motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Thank you. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of changes in the membership of the following joint committees: the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit and Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works. Lucky last. Thank you very much. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to 13 laws, details of which will be incorporated in Hansard. 
Thank you. Clark. Business of the Senate, notice of motion number one, standing in the name of the Chair of the Education and Employment References Committee, Senator Pratt, proposing a reference to that committee. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise and move the motion, which is for the Senate References Committee of the Employment and Education Committee to look into models for government investment in early childhood education and care, with particular consideration of a range of very critical issues. We've moved this Senate inquiry because we believe very strongly that there's a need to optimise economic and social participation uh, for people with children and that there's needs the issues around equity of access uh, and the developmental benefits uh, for children also need to be recognised and that therefore early education and care and development very much has uh, an intrinsic purpose in terms of contributing to children and family well-being, social and economic, as well as to the productivity of our nation. So when you consider these issues, it's high time when you look at public debate and when you talk to Australian families about the need for the parliament and the Senate to listen to those families and to the needs of children's development experts and to people seeking to participate in the economy about these issues. We've seen very directly the fact that Australian families have struggled with skyrocketing childcare costs in what is a broken system. The 2018 uh, investments, so-called investments by the Morrison government, have sadly failed to keep a lid on the out-of-pocket costs experienced by families, even though uh, this government very much promised that that was the intent of changing the subsidy system. Those changes have failed to support working parents and, in particular, women to work full-time or to increase their hours. And if you look at those issues in the context of disincentives to work, it's very clear that the take-home pay that you would add to the family pay packet in moving from three days a week work for the second income earner to four or five days is very much not worth the while of a great many families uh, to participate uh, in the work workforce further. This means we see parents, educators and the sector at large very much screaming out for reform. Uh, Labor has put forward a plan for cheaper childcare, but this is a contest of ideas that really needs to take place in this parliament so that we can put Labor's policy under scrutiny but also question the coalition on its plans but also engage with the states because the states, of course, also have a role in subsidising kindy and preschool, which is a very critical part of those early years. Uh, but that those subsidies aren't applied equally uh, in terms of who gets to use them, who has access to them, at what age, how many days a week you access it. And the Commonwealth, in terms of the money that it hands over to the states uh, to support those state programs, is also not equal uh, in terms of which states gets which money. The result of all this is, of course, there are children in our nation who don't have access to early education, even though it would be very much in their developmental interests to have that access, and that families can't afford to use childcare. And when they do, they're also subject to a really fragmented system. It's a juggle that I remember very well as a working parent, where uh, two days a week from uh, nine till three, my son would be able to go to uh, kindergarten and then I would have him in uh, long daycare on the other day. But it was complicated greatly by the fact that kindergarten was available for three days a week, not two in the alternate weeks, which meant you couldn't book, for example, uh, an extra day every alternate weeks for your childcare placement because if you can't drop in one week and drop back out in the other. So the system is incredibly fragmented and it does not work for working parents. We know very much that we need to make childcare more affordable 
97 per cent of families in the system uh, are being adversely affected at the moment. Uh, it needs to be made uh, more affordable for an overwhelming number of families. We want to be able to give voice to parents, parents that sometimes have to stay home simply because they can't afford to go to work. Now, the Labor Party very much respects the choices of Australian families to stay home and look after and be with their children and develop their interests and their well-being at home if they want to and if they're able to. But that is not the case for uh, all families. There are many families, including uh, women like myself, who realised that my family well-being was going to be much better off if um, uh, you know, I was able to pursue my interest as a working parent to make me a better mother and a parent at home. But it is too telling that there are too many uh, parents that have to stay home uh, simply because they can't afford to go to work, because those out-of-pocket childcare costs, uh, if you're working that third or fourth day or if you've got more than one child in using childcare, is simply too expensive to make it worthwhile. In addition, the best outcomes for our children and our future is indeed a well-funded and well-organised system. We need to expose the faults in our system. We need to uncover them and highlight where we think we can make improvements. Our children and our families deserve a world-class early childhood education system, a system that's able to boost the economy but also to strengthen the resilience and education of Australia's children. I would note that Labor's got a policy uh, which would see the $10,560 a year childcare subsidy cap uh, scrapped. Uh, that is an issue to see in terms of how well it will work that can be interrogated by this committee, but equally to put the metal on the coalition to see where it wants to see these issues headed itself. The maximum childcare subsidy rate should, in Labor's view, be lifted, and the childcare subsidy rates needs to be increased, and but then also tapered down for every family earning less than $530,000. Now that might seem to you like an extraordinary amount of money. In my view, indeed, it does. Uh, but the issue is that there are families that simply choose not to participate. Uh, in using early childhood education, skilled uh, professionals, uh, people who have a worthwhile contribution to make to the economy, who simply don't participate not only because of the subsidy rate but also because of the fragmentation of the system and how difficult it is to access quality care. This means, under Labor's plan, a million families would be better off. Uh, and it would remove financial barriers to more than 100,000 families currently locked out of the system. Now, this is quite telling. Uh, we want to scrutinise and talk to the community about our own policies, but we also want to see the coalition challenged in this debate. Labor believes that a plan for cheaper childcare is a win-win, good for parents, good for children and good for the economy. Uh, and we want to be able to work with the Australian community uh, to talk about what the nation's plans should be. And this includes testing the coalition on its current policy settings. We know that the current system disproportionately affects women who make up the majority of Australia's second income earners. The way the current system is designed, it simply means that second income earners earn little or even nothing for working a fourth or a fifth day in a week. Childcare becomes more affordable. Uh, making childcare more affordable will give women back the power to make choices. If they want to work more hours or days, they shouldn't be penalised. But Australian families currently don't have that choice because going to work is simply unaffordable. Now, that's doing a disservice not only to those household incomes, but also to the businesses that would like to be able to say to um, 
Australian women who have no choice at the moment, that they will be able to take up more hours uh, in their workplace uh, if they're available. At the moment, we do have some critical national skills shortages that would be served by allowing uh, women to be able to work those hours by making going to work and having children a much more affordable and desirable thing to be able to do. We know that women's participation in the labour force is lower in Australia than in similar countries. It is especially lower for women working full time. So to lift economic growth, we must make childcare more affordable for Australian families. And this is something that's very much been highlighted by the Grattan report. And I must say, in the context of uh, discussions about um, workplace assault uh, and power in the workplace, etc., I have to say that intrinsically linked to sexual harassment and workplace policies should also be the capacity for women to be able to take up leadership roles and to be respected in their workplace so that they are able uh, to drive workplace culture effectively. Currently, families don't have that choice. Currently, we also know that indeed it's hard for men to, to be able to step back and play more of an active role at home because of the kind of cultural expectations that we have in Australian workplaces. So we very much need to look at these issues holistically, in my view. The Productivity Commission released data in February of this year that shows a 21.7 per cent rise in one year in the number of parents who aren't working because of childcare costs. That means, Mr Acting Deputy President, this nation now has more than 90,000 parents not working because of out-of-control fees under this government. The data shows childcare costs have risen by some 5.6 per cent between 2019 and 2020. It's supported by the latest inflation data uh, just from last week. Out-of-pocket costs in Brisbane, Sydney, Darwin are now higher under this government than they were under the old system. There are a great many issues that we need to and want to be able to dive into uh, in this inquiry. I've highlighted some of those economic issues, but also equally important uh, is the early development role of early education for our nation's children. The first years of a child's life are so critical to their development. 90 per cent of brain growth occurs by the age of five. This is why Labor is intrinsically committed to improving our system, national system for childcare and early education, and it is why we should be having a robust national discussion about these issues, engaging with early childhood specialists and educators and with Australian families on these issues. Harvard University Centre on, developing, on the Developing Child they say if early adversity is not mitigated, then vulnerability can impact on lifelong learning, behaviour and health. Greater access to childcare helps children get the best access to early education and can play a critical role in improving their lifelong outcomes. So Australian families deserve better, but most importantly, Australia's children deserve better. The current system is a fragmented mess and families are under incredible financial pressure. Caps on the childcare rebate, the loss of family benefits and the tax system mean that some second earners could be working for as little or nothing on the fourth and fifth days of a full-time week. The CCI of WA highlighted this where they said uh, a household where both parents have the potential to earn $60,000 per year full-time, the second income earner would be working for about $2 an hour on the fourth day and for nothing on the fifth day. And that is an outrage. It is a ridiculous situation that Australia's families are put in. 
And of course, you're not going to enrol your child in early education for the purpose of early education, even if you're not working, if you can't afford to do so, because the daily fees are simply too high to make a robust decision for your family that says my child and their interests would be best served by being able to access uh, a greater amount of time in their early education system. At the moment, we know uh, that that's been at around 15 uh, hours a week, which simply is not adequate to Senator meet Pratt, those needs. Your time has expired. Senator, I'm Thank sorry you. to two jump at the same time. Uh, are you Comfy, Senator Roberts, or it's all Senator Lyons. Senator Lyons. Thank you, and thank, thank you, you very much, Senator Roberts. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I too want to contribute to this debate, and uh, I want to start by looking at the way in which um, the government, whether it was Mr Abbott, Mr Turnbull, or Mr Morrison, have really botched early childhood education and care in this country. Now, far be it for me on this day, the March for Justice Day, to suggest that early childhood and care is women's business, but I'd hazard a guess that this is the view of the Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison governments and their succession of male early childhood education ministers. They just don't get the importance to the economic well-being of families, to the eco economic well-being of women, to the economic well-being of the nation, that quality early childhood education and care, which is affordable for families, is good for everyone. Indeed, as we know, until recently there were no women at all on their powerful economic review committee, and we know that they were shamed into cobbling together after the budget uh, was announced their women's economic statement, which was pretty laughable because it was uh, quite difficult to pinpoint to um, economic reforms that would benefit women. But anyway, they managed to cobble something together uh, because they were criticised by uh, women's groups, by economists, by indeed most people in Australia for that very poor budget that they definitely had their male credentials on the line. Uh, we know, though, since then they have appointed uh, Senator Rustin um, to that powerful economic committee. Um, but, of course, we know that um, under Mr Abbott, who laughably and disgracefully appointed himself as uh, the women's minister, um, that there was only one woman in cabinet and, quite frankly, things haven't got much better for them. Uh, since those days. And the test to ascertain whether governments are truly interested in women's economic advancement is how important they rate early education and care. Where is it on their agenda? Well, let's have a look at what they've done in the area. They promised us a new Butte system uh, of childcare where they guaranteed they guaranteed that they'd cap the skyrocketing uh, fees to families but of course we know that hasn't worked and the only group that's in denial about the failure of that system to make childcare uh, more affordable is indeed the Morrison government and I think that the prime minister made it a bit of a signature policy of his that, that we were going to somehow magically reduce fees um, across Australia for working families using early childhood education and care. Well, it, hasn't, it has not worked, and we know that the cost of early childhood education and care for families is now a significant burden, a significant burden. And indeed, it is holding women back as it becomes too expensive for parents to use care full time, um, and that burden uh, then is carried by women who continue to work part time. And we know what that does to women's economic advancement. They fail to get promotions. We've got a 13 per cent uh, wage gap between men and women's wages in this country, and uh, nothing makes that figure stick uh, more than 
condemning women to part-time work because uh, full-time childcare is completely unaffordable. And you heard Senator Pratt earlier talk about um, how she managed her son when he was in early childhood education and care. It's a burden for families, and we're putting that responsibility onto grandparents. There are now many, many grandparents in this country who look after children one or two days a week because early childhood education and care is simply not affordable. Now, of course, if that's a choice for families, good on them. That's what should happen. But lots of families are forced into that situation, and we don't know how many families are actually uh, accessing backyard care. We know it's been a problem in the past, but we have no idea about that. We can measure the number of grandparents who care for children, but, but we don't know what is happening with backyard care, which is unregulated and where children are potentially placed in vulnerable situations. We know that um, the, the gold rolled or the Butte uh, Prime Minister's system shows recently that out-of-pocket costs in Brisbane and in Sydney and Darwin are now higher, higher under Mr Morrison's system than they were under the old system. And what we've seen right back from when uh, Mr Howard introduced the current system, which has been tinkered at at the edges, that um, no one's really tackled the childcare costs adequately, and uh, this government has made an absolute botch of it. An absolute botch of it, and it is not front and centre uh, of their agenda. They've now put it uh, with Mr. Tian, who has the very big responsibility of education. So we've got childcare on the one hand and education system, schools, university on the other, we all know which direction he's going to get pulled in, and childcare, early childhood education and care will continue uh, not to get the support and indeed the spotlight and the focus that, um, it, that it needs to have. Now, the, the increased costs that I've just talked about in those major cities, of course, comes at a time, Mr Acting Deputy President, when wages in this country have been stagnating. We know that for most Australian workers, wages have not risen. We know that during the pandemic, many Australians lost their jobs. And we know, actually, that the, the group that has been hardest hit during the pandemic are, again, women. We've seen a, a recent shameful study, and I've heard nothing from the government about this, where um, women with university degrees of childbearing age are now not being reemployed, not being reemployed. And what, are, what is the male-dominated Morrison government doing about that? Nothing, nothing. Not a word have we heard. So that is a, a growing problem, and we'll, we'll see women continually being held back because males are being, with university degrees are being re-employed at a much, much faster rate than uh, women of the same age with the same qualifications. That tells you employers are making a very clear choice about really not supporting um, adequate family leave for men and particularly women. So, of course, that wage burden where women have lost employment, where wages have stagnated, um, is families are now having to make choices about well how now you know my childcare fees the mean of my childcare fees has gone up four percent six percent how am I going to afford that what else is coming off the family budget to enable families to continue to work where that is their choice we don't know that and it's one of the issues that a Senate committee can really uh, grill down into um, but we do know that childcare costs are a significant burden on family budgets. Of course, the other um, issue that you rarely hear the government talk about is that, um, and in fact I'd argue it's the most important point, is that early childhood education and care is good for our children. It's good for our children. We all know that um, putting uh, the services and the support and the education in when children are young <clears throat> is the biggest boost we can give to children. Um, 
Study after study shows us that the first years of a child's life are vital to their development. In fact, 90 per cent of brain growth occurs by the age of five years. 90 per cent. And so children in quality early learning are absolutely benefiting from that. So what we want to see is stimulating quality early childhood education and care. We know it's good for children, but it needs to be not only good for children, but it's got to be affordable. And of course, for children in vulnerable families, Harvard University Center on the Developing Child says that if early adversary is not mitigated, vulnerabilities can impact on lifelong learning, behaviour and health. And we know that. We know that um, it has a big impact if it's not reversed. So ensuring that children in those vulnerable families have access to early education is a social good. But I, I have never heard those on the other side, the Morrison government, talk about a social good. It just goes completely over their head. Um, Thrive by Five. Uh, recently took out a full-page ad signed by a range of um, academics and other well-known people across Australia, um, and they've been very vocal, and rightly so, about the need for children to have access to quality early childhood education and care, and for this care to be affordable for families, because they too back in the need for all children to have, have access to quality learning. And of course, what we saw during the pandemic, early childhood educators have been amongst the strongest advocates for quality education and care. And we know they were champions during the COVID pandemic, uh, particularly during the lockdowns. Without them, doctors and nurses and other frontline workers wouldn't have been able to go to work, would not have been able to go to work. Yet they are not adequately paid for the contribution they make to the well-being of our children or indeed their selfless services during the pandemic. Parents know this. Academics know this. Thrive by Five know this. It seems the only group which doesn't know this or recognise this is the government who are in a position to do something about the shocking wages in the sector. Make no mistake, it is the federal government who fund this sector. Now, I know the Prime Minister likes to say he doesn't hold a hose, he's not the police, and I'm sure he's saying you know, he's not responsible for childcare centres, but of course he is. The low wages, the poor wages of early childhood educators rest fairly and squarely at the Morrison government's feet, nowhere else except their feet. And of course, to add insult to injury, this was the very first sector the government removed JobKeeper from, took it away. And if that's not a sign that they don't understand or won't acknowledge the importance of this sector to families, and in particular women's economic advancement or the development of children, I don't know what is. It frustrates me, and I'm sure it bewilders families, when the government stands up and defends its capped system. In WA, the growth in mean fees over the last year has seen um, a massive increase in, in the mean fees per hour in suburbs such as Belmont and Victoria Park where I live. We've seen fees go up by 3.4 per cent. No wages growth, 3.4 per cent. In Joondalup, in the northern suburbs, we've seen fees go up by 6.7 per cent. In Swan, out in the eastern suburbs, we've seen fees go up by 5.2 per cent. And in the more affluent suburbs of Cottesloe and Claremont, we've seen fees go up by 4.4 per cent. Now, this is unacceptable. It is unacceptable. And it's just amazing that the Morrison government continues to ignore uh, what's happening in Western Australia. We saw recently with their tourism package, the only place in WA to get money from the government was Broome. And you know, Mr Acting Deputy President, 
You and I, we, we fly from Perth to Broome, we'll be paying $2,000 return. But if someone flies from Sydney, they'll be getting it cheaper from us. Now, if that's not punishing Western Australians, I don't know what is. Labor has a solid plan. We want to cap fees for 97 per cent of uh, families who use early childhood education and care. And we want to have a Senate inquiry so that these issues can be properly addressed and placed fairly and squarely at the feet of the Morrison government, and be it on their own heads if they say, oh, we don't run childcare centres, which I suspect is exactly what we'll hear from the Prime Minister. Well, it's time they face the truth. They fund this sector and they need to get it right for families in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Sorry, Senator Walsh. Senator Roberts did have the call. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. We serve Australia and we see childcare as crucial, early childhood education and care funding. I'm in a party whose leader is a female, and she's in fact a grandmother, and she has a very talented and hard-working daughter who also has young kids. I'm a parent, and I know what it's, what's involved in raising a child. Not as much as a mother does know, but nonetheless, I have been a, am a parent. And I remind people that Maria Montessori has probably done more work, well, she's dead now, but she did more work on early childhood education, human development, human behaviour than anyone who has ever lived and anyone who's alive today. And her, her research, her, her findings were profound. And she said the critical years for the formation of both character and intellect are birth to six. So early childhood education is fundamental. Character, intellect are developed then. I'm going to be brief because I, the main point I want to make is that I want to thank Senator Pratt for approaching us and, and our officers then spoke. It's an important topic, as I said. But what we didn't see, what we didn't hear, was an articulation of the problem from that office. And that's not a criticism of that office. It's just that we, we asked, basically, my staff asked, with this inquiry, what is it you're going to achieve? And we were given the Labor Party policy in return. Now, the Secretariat in the Senate is already busy and very stretched. So what we need to see is evidence of what will come from this, from all the work that will be involved. And I want to point out an example of someone who works with us very well, and that is Senator Deb O'Neill. She came to us with her bill uh, in the previous weeks uh, with regard to more power for more protection for franchisees and for dealers in particular, car dealers. And we work with her, and we've worked with Senator O'Neill in the past. That's the sort of people we like to work with. That's what we need. Facts. Yourself, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, we've worked well with you. You've come to us with facts. Same with uh, Senator Sheldon. Same with Alex, uh, Senator Gallagher. Same with Senator Katie Gallagher. And we appreciate people coming to us. We will work with anyone. We'll work with any party, providing we are given the facts, the data, the substance. That, we, that people want support on. We've worked with Senator Patrick and take great delight in working with him, Senator Griff, Senator Lambie, and the Greens. We've worked with the Greens. Perhaps I should point out that the Liberals learned first, and they learned very quickly, the Lib Liberal National Party coalition learned very quickly that we do work honestly and sincerely and we stick to our position until we're given evidence otherwise. And then we will come on board so we can be critical and questioning, but that's our job because we serve the people of Australia. So while I thank Senator Pratt for coming to approach us on this, we need the substance, we need the facts, we need the data. So that's all I needed to say apart from the fact that One Nation uh, sees early childhood education as critical and childcare as critical, but it needs to be based on fact. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Now, Senator Walsh, you did jump earlier, and I'll come to you next, Senator Perky. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on this reference proposed uh, by the Chair of the Education and Employment References Committee, uh, Senator Pratt. Uh, and the reference proposes an examination of how best the Australian government should invest in early childhood education and care 
to achieve the very best care and development outcomes for young Australians. And this reference is really a critical and important opportunity for the committee to uh, examine and recognise the central value of early childhood education to children, to families, uh, to communities and indeed to the whole Australian economy. Um, because really it is long past time that we examined uh, and committed to solutions about um, the problems that are plaguing this sector. Um, there are so many questions about how we, uh, as a society, support, um, fund, roll out uh, quality early childhood education services uh, in Australia today. Um, funding is one of the big questions. How should we best fund this critical sector? How should we best manage and deliver quality early childhood education uh, and care? Uh, and of course, one of the most important questions in how we deliver quality early childhood education and care um, is the workforce. How do we support a quality early childhood education workforce? Uh, because today we know that the dedicated, qualified professional workers in this sector are severely undervalued. Uh, and critically, we need to examine, uh, as this reference proposes, the wages that we pay to our hardworking early childhood educators. Um, this is a hugely important sector to our community, to our society, to our economy, because we know that early engagement with children uh, and their families through early childhood education and care we know it delivers strong outcomes for the community. Uh, there is a very well established body of evidence, uh, a body of evidence indeed that is growing, uh, that early engagement with children and their families delivers um, the best, the strongest outcomes. Early childhood education and care is critical um, for the social development of children, their emotional development, their language development uh, and indeed their cognitive development. Uh, in fact, we know uh, that 90 per cent of a child's uh, brain development occurs in those critical early years of zero to five years of life. Uh, and so the best outcomes are going to be delivered by a system uh, that delivers high quality early childhood education, that delivers um, affordable and accessible early childhood education, um, because we want to be able to fulfil the potential that our children have and we want to be able to uh, lift their opportunities. Uh, and there is also, of course, a growing body of evidence about the importance of early childhood education uh, in dealing with disadvantage. Early childhood education and care is absolutely critical for children who come from backgrounds where they need extra support, where they need extra education and care um, if we're going to be able to lift their opportunities as they enter school uh, and indeed as they become young adults. Uh, in our country. So quality programs mean much greater educational attainment for children flowing through the school years and indeed into adulthood. And accessibility to services is critical to deliver the full developmental um, benefit uh, that can be unlocked through quality early childhood education. Um, improving affordability and access to early childhood education uh, is going to benefit hundreds of thousands of Australian children and their families. Uh, and it's not going to just benefit children and families, it's going to benefit the whole economy and benefit social participation as well. Early childhood education and care services, of course, increase the opportunities for parents to go out and work uh, and for them to earn. Uh, and that just uh, doesn't just affect them in their own households, it affects all of us. It affects our economic potential. Uh, and we know as a country that we have a problem with the workforce participation of women uh, and that quality, affordable, accessible early childhood education is critical to boosting 
the participation of women uh, in our workforce, in our economy, indeed in our society. But it is absolutely critical that parents know when they put their children into early childhood education and care that they receive the highest quality um, programs. And that in turn relies on the workforce. It relies on the right workforce planning. How do we secure a strong professional workforce into the future? Uh, it relies on training for staff the best, highest quality training. Uh, and critically, it relies on us committing to decent, uh, respectful pay and conditions for our skilled uh, and qualified early childhood educators. Uh, because for many years, I've been hearing from early childhood educators that the wages are just so low that they can't actually afford to stay in the jobs that they love. And if we want a high quality early childhood education uh, sector, we need to invest in the educators themselves and we need to figure out how to do that in a sustainable way. Um, we can't continue to offer quality early childhood education in this country when about a third of educators are leaving the jobs that they love every year, leaving the sector, leaving the industry that they love every year because they just can't afford to stay in the sector on those low wages. Really nothing in early childhood education is possible without the workforce and without an absolutely exceptional workforce of dedicated, committed early childhood educators. Um, but to deliver that workforce, we absolutely need to figure out how to deliver better wages and better conditions to those educators um, and better training so that they can be their very best. Uh, and the low wages in the early childhood sector are absolutely at odds with that goal. They are um, at odds with maintaining this exceptional workforce. Um, and early childhood educators have done uh, absolutely everything that they can uh, to make their case to this federal government. Um, they have campaigned for better wages um, for years. Uh, they have tried to raise their wages through the bargaining system. Um, they have run um, work value cases. They've won equal pay uh, cases. They've run equal pay cases and they've walked off the job um, multiple times to try to get the respect and the recognition that they deserve for their important work uh, from this government. Because these are people who are over 90 per cent women uh, and they are qualified. Um, they are professional. They're dedicated. Uh, they are committed to the children uh, that they are providing education and care for. But they are severely undervalued. Uh, they are flat out underpaid um, with wages as low as $21, $22 an hour. This absolutely critical workforce is earning around half the average wage. Um, so if we value this sector, if we value the contribution of the early childhood, education, early childhood educators and value the contribution that they make to the sector, we have to figure out um, how to provide professional wages um, to the majority women uh, who work in this sector um, and who day in and day out provide excellent and high quality education services to children. Um, the fact that this sector is over 90 per cent women um, and the fact that the sector has been seen as women's work is really the key factor uh, in why their wages are in fact so low today. So fixing affordability for families, um, that is absolutely critical, but it's only half the problem that we face in the sector today. We absolutely need to improve the pay and the working conditions for educators themselves. So the future of early childhood education uh, and indeed for our whole education system has to include a plan about how we finally ensure that those educators are paid um, what they are worth. Um, educators like uh, Kerry, um, who's been in the sector for over 30 years, 
um, but she is an educator who finds it difficult to even afford to stay in the job that she loves. She's been in the sector for over 30 years, um, but she, as a senior educator, only earns around half the average wage. Um, she can't afford to buy a house. She rents, um, and she can't uh, imagine uh, when she'll be able to retire. She's in her 50s uh, and she can't see a day because of the low wages that she's been on for over 30 years when she'll actually be able to retire. Um, and really, it is extraordinary that we organise such a critical sector as early childhood education um, like this on the basis of low wages. It's extraordinary that the federal government has continued to look at early childhood education as basically babysitting. Uh, as a country on the league tables of OECD expenditure on this sector, we are uh, nowhere near the top. Um, we do not invest in this sector at the same rates as other countries who have much better outcomes. Uh, and as the early childhood educators say, um, while they absolutely love their jobs, Love doesn't pay the mortgage. Um, love doesn't pay the rent. Uh, and while they love working with children, while they're dedicated and they're committed to doing that, love doesn't put food on the table. We need a sustainable early childhood education sector, um, one that recognises the professionalism of educators uh, in their pay packets, um, one that supports parents to return to work um, with affordable and accessible education. Uh, and we need a sustainable early childhood sector that provides the highest quality uh, early childhood education and care to invest in our future generations. Um, we shouldn't be a country that spends um, well below the OECD average on this critical sector. We should absolutely invest in it. Um, so what we need um, is a federal government that values early childhood educators, that values them in their pay packets, um, that values their professionalism, uh, that respects and rewards them. Uh, and we need a federal government that will invest in and develop a sustainable quality early childhood education system. Uh, and so for all of those reasons, Acting Deputy President, um, I think this reference to examine how best we can invest in early childhood education and care to achieve the very best care and development outcomes for young Australians, um, to examine the funding, to examine the management and delivery of services, uh, and critically to assess the wages we pay our hardworking early educators, uh, is absolutely um, critical. This reference is critical. This investigation is critical. Uh, and, uh, Acting Deputy President, I commend this reference to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak briefly on Senator Pratt's reference um, to the Education and Employment References Committee on Early Childhood Education. And I want to say from the start that um, early childhood education and care is an essential service. It should be universal and it should be free. And I say this not just from a rights-based perspective, uh, but there is a compelling case for free and universally available early childhood education and care, because it has enormous benefits for children. It has enormous benefits for families. Of course, it has enormous benefits, and it's um, good for women. Um, but it also has enormous um, social and economic benefits for our whole community, um, and it leads to a more equitable society. Um, and I've been the beneficiary you know, of affordable early childhood education and care. I mean, I would not have, and as have my children, I would not have been able to study or have a career um, you, you know, if, if I didn't have that benefit. But I can tell you that it didn't come easily um, because the early childhood education opportunities and childcare that were around where I lived when I was studying were completely unaffordable. I was just lucky that a few of our students got together at the University of New South Wales and lobbied the 
University to open up the first cooperative childcare centre at the University of New South Wales. Um, and you know, I cannot thank the workers, the early childhood education and care workers um, at that centre and, and across the board who educate our young children, our little ones, and who care for them as well. Um, and I agree with Senator Walsh when Senator Walsh says that they are some of the lowest paid uh, workers in, in our country. And that is completely unacceptable. Uh, if we do value education, if we do value care for our children, then we must, um, you know, as a priority, value those people who provide that education and who provide that care. Um, but I guess we also have to acknowledge that in our patriarchal society, that caring work has long been um, seen as a woman's work. It's undervalued. Um, and, you know, it has created a heavily casualized and underpaid workforce um, in, in this particular um, sector, which is early childhood, um, early childhood learning and care. Um, and this is not an accident, to be really frank. The entire system and practically our entire economy uh, really relies on the unpaid and underpaid work of women in caring roles, um, you know, and the skilled, difficult work done uh, in early childhood centers and childcare centers, uh, which is simply an extension of this underpaid work. So I think this inquiry is important because it will examine how to fund early childhood education and care well. I mean, every day I meet people in the community who are telling me, especially women who are telling me that, you know, they are, most of the, their salary that they're earning goes to pay um, you know, early childhood education for their children. And that's not a place, that, that's not a country that we should be aspiring for. Uh, you know, like um, our schools, where public schools, where education is free, we should be using exactly the same logic for early childhood education and care, because that's where our children are going to be set up for the rest of their life. Um, so um, I'll just conclude by saying that it's important to inquire um, into how we can fund early childhood education and care to be fee-free. I mean, we did it in the pandemic with a stroke of a pen, but then a few months later, the government took us back to the old broken system. And it is a broken system uh, where people, it is hard for people to afford that system, which is just a, should be an essential and a universal service. Um, so I commend this uh, motion to the House, um, to the Senate, and I hope that we can agree and start off with an inquiry so we can move towards a system which is universal and fee-free for every family and every child in this country. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. If there are no further contributions, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. Those of their opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Um, but it will be deferred to uh, a later hour. Um, so we'll adjourn that division. If the clerk could record that. And clerk. Business of the Senate, order of the day number three. COVID-19 Select Committee, Public Interest Immunity Claims, Second Interim Report, consideration of the recommendations. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I move that the Senate endorses the findings of the COVID-19 Select Committee, that it does not accept the public interest immunity claims made by various ministers as detailed in the committee's second interim report and adopts the recommendations of this report. Um, thank you. As foreshadowed in my contribution when the Senate Select um, the Select Committee's se second interim report was tabled at the end of last sitting period. Today I'm calling upon the Senate and my fellow senators to stand up and perform one of the most vital and constitutionally important functions we are called on to do. That is that the Senate, Senate meaningfully assert its unique powers and preeminent role in holding the executive to account and in doing so reject the Morrison government's inappropriate misuse of public interest immunity claims. The government has repeatedly invoked PII claims without satisfactorily addressing the public harm that would be caused 
and it has been a consistent and dismaying occurrence through the course of the Select Committee on COVID-19's inquiry. And let's be clear on what this means. As outlined in the committee's second interim report, the, in the invocation of the PII claims by numerous departments, agencies and their responsible ministers constitutes a willful obstruction of access to information that is unquestionably critical to the committee's scrutiny work. The obstruction not only undermines the committee's special role in scrutinising government at a time when many of the parliament's most powerful scrutiny mechanisms were not able to operate as designed, but it's also a direct assault by the executive on the Senate's explicit powers and purpose. The Senate was deliberately endowed with expansive powers of inquiry, including those that allow the Senate to order information from ministers. Equally, the Senate recognises that executive government holds information which ought not to be disclosed and that there are clear and established practices which enable government, for instance, to make a substantiated claim of public interest immunity. It must be noted that the committee, through its work over the past year, has recognised this important caveat on the Senate's powers and has considered and granted two claims of public interest immunity because it was reasonable to do so and the claims met uh, the test that has been um, created by this chamber. However, the government's repeated misuse of public interest immunity claims to withhold information dis diminishes the select committee, and in doing so, it ultimately also diminishes and erodes the Senate's unique function of oversight and scrutiny. As I said last month, uh, we as senators and as custodians of the institution of the Senate which will endure long after we have all departed, must respond to this challenge presented by executive government. And as I have said, we cannot allow the Senate to receive only the information that is politically convenient uh, for the government to provide when they want to provide it. Otherwise, we will continue to see cynical and deliberate attempts by this government to delay or deny access to information that is fully within the purview of the Senate's power to access. But this does require all of us in this chamber um, who, are not, who don't sit on the government's benches to work together to demonstrate that the power of the Senate as a whole, its collective resolve, is to protect its role and ensure that one of its most important responsibilities um, in terms of scrutiny and accountability and transparency and the power to require documents um, from the executive, from ministers, is protected. Now, we have had a series of questions that we have been seeking from the government and information and documents. And I should say that we start usually by asking for that information to be provided through the committee. If it's not provided through the committee, then the committee, of course, allows for that to, um, questions to be taken on notice. Um, what happens then is that unless the committee secretariat chases up those questions, they're often not answered. So either uh, they just hope that it goes away, and it's taken the committee having to write to ministers to remind them of the question, or to the department initially, reminding them of the questions that were asked and seeking the documents, and then the department refers it to the minister, as is appropriate and then um, waiting for the minister to reply. And often those letters come back, the letters you know, protecting information like what was, the first, what was the date that the chief medical officer first briefed the cabinet about the COVID-19 pandemic. It doesn't seem to be highly controversial nor secret information or information that must be kept secret. And the letter will come back often months later, saying that, you know, that cabinet in confidence basically means we cannot provide this information. So it's, and it's an abuse of the Corman motion, which sets out very clearly the process for claiming public interest immunity and the process for demonstrating the harm that providing that information would cause to the public. Um, so there are different aspects to the public interest immunity uh, process that need to be answered. And quite often the response we get back from uh, the government through the, through the ministers 
is lazy, using um, a reason that doesn't meet the test set out and passed by this chamber in the Cormann motion, and doesn't provide any explanation of the harm that might be caused by the provision of that information to this chamber. Um, so we do have a number. I think there's seven public interest immunity claims uh, that have been um, have, we have brought back to the Senate um, chamber. So we have sought to resolve this uh, through the stand normal process through committee and asking for questions, asking for questions on notice, and then going through the process. But where we find um, us, ourselves now is uh, with the responsibility to report back to this chamber the way the government, when it chooses to do, and on unusual issues like when, when the chief medical officer first briefed the cabinet, for the life of me, I cannot understand why that has become one of the biggest secrets in the land during the COVID-19 pandemic, but evidently it is. I didn't even think we'd have to go down this path because I thought the question would be answered, to be honest. Uh, and it was only when it was consistently refused to be answered that we've had to go uh, down this process. We've also asked, asked for uh, legal advice around the Attorney General Department receiving um, information around the interaction of the Privacy Amendment Bill with um, the with the COVID Safe app and the United States Clarifying Law Lawful Overseas Use of Data Act. And again, the Attorney General, in answering that, failed uh, to provide the document. But then also just said, "Well, we're not going to provide it because we don't often, we never do." Um, but again, not following the Cormann motion, not providing the evidence or any explanation about the public harm that might be caused uh, by the provision of that information. And we were talking about, at that time, when that information was sought, um, about you know, basically implementing an app that um, helped provide location data on individuals in the middle of a pandemic. It was urgent and we supported the rollout of the app, but there was also some significant questions around um, how it interacted with legislation and how people's privacy were protected. So there were genuine reasons that the Senate committee should have been provided that information um, or provided with some answer rather than no answer. Um, there was also um, other examples of where I think with the Minister for Health, um, it was around the economic modelling of the COVID response. And, and again, I remind people that this committee was set up with the agreement of the government. The government agreed to the establishment of this committee as a way of um, providing accountability, scrutiny and transparency to the most urgent government response that this country has probably seen post the war. Um, we had billions of dollars flowing out the door. We've got, we're going to have a trillion dollars of debt racked up by the time we finish this. And whilst Labor accepted the need to spend money um, and support the emergency response, we also believe that in fully understanding the decisions that the government took, including why some people were left out of the economic packages and others weren't, uh, to understand the um, information that underpinned those decisions once those decisions were taken. We, we weren't wanting to go back and see why the government uh, made those decisions, but to understand the impact of those economic packages once the government had made those decisions. But again, cabinet in confidence um, not going to be provide that, provided th that information. The terms of reference for this committee is to, to um, monitor or to scrutinise the Australian government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and any other related matter. So this falls squarely within the terms of reference. And the economic and health response have been the predominant focus of this committee. Uh, and, and seeking information about the modelling that underpinned those decisions in terms of the economic response um, we thought were important. Another one which the government rejected was um, the Productivity Commission Chair, Mr Brennan, 
came and brief. We called him to the committee, and he came to provide evidence, and it was very useful. And in the course of his evidence, he mentioned that he'd given a presentation to national cabinet, um, and um, we asked for a copy of that presentation of that presentation he provided. Presumably, it's good enough to provide to state and territory governments, but it's not allowed to be provided to the Senate um, to understand again uh, what the Productivity Commission's view of um, the COVID-19 pandemic and the response to it uh, was. So again, uh, I, I didn't think that was too controversial. We put in a request for that to be provided and again the Treasurer, it was referred uh, to the Treasurer and they denied access to that uh, document. Um, we asked, importantly, the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care about when he first briefed um, the Cabinet about the unfolding crisis in Commonwealth regulated aged care services in Victoria. And as we know, uh, sadly, 75 per cent of all of the deaths from COVID-19 in this country were from people in residential aged care services that are funded and regulated by the Commonwealth Government. Now, as, that, um, as the minister appeared, um, we were asking questions about that period um, in May, June and July of 2020 and what was happening. When was uh, the aged care minister briefing cabinet? Um, and um, again, we've been told, well, we're not allowed to have that information either. I mean, these are simple questions. They don't go to the heart of deliberations of cabinet. They don't disclose anything uh, in terms of cabinet deliberations or discussions. They're not related to a decision of cabinet. Yet um, the government has decided that they won't um, provide that information uh, to the Senate. So this is important, you know, and we will continue to do this as more public interest immunity claims roll in, because fundamental to the work of this Thank chamber you, and holding this government to account is the ability for the Senate to call for documents, to require those documents, um, to call for evidence, to provide the scrutiny, to ask the hard questions, uh, and for the government to respond in accordance with the motion that Minister Cormann, as a member of the opposition, um, moved and passed in 2009. The Cormann motion. It's very clear, and this government doesn't follow it. It doesn't follow it whenever it doesn't want to, uh, and that's what we're seeing with these public interest immunity claims. Um, we believe these are matters of significant principle uh, that require the Senate to work together, particularly non-government senators, to work together, because otherwise we will simply get spoon-fed the information the government wants to spoon-feed us on their terms and on their time. And that's not been the role of Senate committees or this chamber. So I would urge um, senators, um, particularly the crossbench, to think about this from a matter of principle, um, from a matter of making sure that the Senate COVID committee, which is going to go for this entire parliament, but it's not just the COVID committee, it's all committees, when they ask for documents and call for documents, that that call is treated properly under the terms of the Cormann motion by the government, so that when they claim public interest immunity it meets the tests as outlined in the Cormann motion. But when the Senate, when the committees disagree with that claim of public interest in immunity, <laughs> there is actually a contest on this floor uh, to contest that and to, to push back on the government. Because if we don't support these recommendations of this um, committee, then the government gets its way. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. I call Senator Polly. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak about the COVID-19 Select Committee public interest immunity claims. And I'd like to make a contribution uh, on this debate, not only as a senator in this place, but also as the chair of the Scrutiny of Bills Committee where we have concerns about the way this government operates and the lack of uh, legislation 
that is reliant upon regulations. Now, as senators, we not only have the power but we have the duty to scrutinise the government and to hold the executive to account. But the government's repeated misuse of public interest immunity claims to withhold information diminishes the select committee and in so doing ultimately dismisses and diminishes and erodes the Senate's unique function of oversight and scrutiny. As senators, we cannot allow the Senate to receive only information that is politically convenient for the government to provide. We cannot allow the government to drip feed information based on their political agenda. This government has a reputation under this Prime Minister to be a government of spin, photo opportunities and lack of transparency. That's how the public is perceiving the Morrison government. If we don't stand up uh, to this government and to ensure that there is scrutiny, then we will see the public uh, becoming more and more cynical about our democracy. We will continue to see cynical and deliberate attempts by this secretive government to delay or deny access to information that is fully within the scope of the Senate's power to access. We must protect the Senate's role and allow it to continue to perform one of its most important responsibilities by endorsing the seven recommendations of this committee's report. This would give effect to a series of OPDs that would ensure information denied to the committee inappropriately claimed by the government to be protected by public interest immunity provisions to be provided to the Senate no later than 12 p.m. on the 17th of March 2021. By not providing these documents, the government is denying the committee's ability to scrutinise government decisions and will have a significant impact on the lives of Australians. And as uh, Senator Gallagher has already highlighted in her contribution. This committee was set up um, with the government fully aware of the need to have scrutiny at a time when there was COVID-19 and the pandemic and the necessity for the government to act and to expend money, that there would have to be oversight on that expenditure. And in so doing, that means that it was going to be scrutinised by that committee, but more importantly, it was going to be scrutinised by this chamber. Unfortunately, the behaviour of the government reflects a pattern of conduct by this government, of smoke and mirrors and cover-ups and running a protection racket. The public are losing faith in this government to act in their best interests. Their most recent announcement of half-price airline tickets to conveniently located destinations in marginal seats is just another example of how the Morrison government and Mr Morrison himself is the spin master and will only act in his own political gain. As we're faced with unprecedented circumstances last year, the Morrison government was afforded sweeping powers and billions of dollars of taxpayer funds to properly enact policy. We have to remember this is taxpayers' money, and we know this government will have racked up trillions of dollars of debt. It's only reasonable that this policy, the actions of this government, are scrutinised by the committee with transparency accountability being crucial to upholding our democracy. The Select Committee on COVID-19 is one of the primary mechanisms to perform this duty and elevate and, sorry, and evaluate the Morrison government's response to the COVID-19 crisis. However, as highlighted by the work of this committee, this government has on numerous occasions obstructed its work and blocked attempts to gain vital information. Their inquiry was deliberately given expansive powers of inquiry, including the authority to order information from ministers. 
Each of the government's claims discussed in the second interim report do not provide adequate reasoning to justify withholding the information. But this is normal practice of behaviour that we have come to expect from those sitting opposite. If we fail to stand up for the Senate's power of inquiry, I fear that it will become compromised and our democracy will falter. The Australian people deserve to have transparency and accountability. I commend the hard work of Senator Gallagher and our Labor team in her pursuit of the information from ministers. There has been claim after claim of public interest immunity. More often than not, without any substantive explanation of how the public will be harmed by the release of such information, and as Senator Gallagher has referred, some of this information has been uh, given to state and territory leaders, but not to us, Australian senators responsible to scrutinise this government. The information includes a request to confirm the date on which the chief medical officer had briefed cabinet a key part of the government's initial response to the pandemic, which remains confidential, over nine months after Dr Murphy's tentative answer. Whether or not a US law enforcement agency could access data collected by the COVID app, Safe Apt, the economic modelling underpinning the government's response, a presentation by the Productivity Commission to National Cabinet. When the former Minister for Aged Care now Minister for Aged Care Services, uh, was asked when did he first brief the, ca the Cabinet about the pandemic and if he briefed them at all on the Royal Commission's report during the outbreak in residential aged care in Victoria? I mean, these are, have been important questions, again, being stole, stole, stonewalled by this government. Now, I acknowledge that the government had to enact swift responses to this once-in-a-century event. But information such as this is essential to evaluate and to examine so that we can better prepare ourselves for the future. Job seeker and job keeper were successful in maintaining domestic consumption, but billions of dollars of taxpayers' money were spent on these schemes, and it is only appropriate that we view that data the government had which determined the level of these supplements. We tragically lost 685 Australians in residential aged care last year. Australia was one of the worst performing countries in the world when it came to protecting older Australians from COVID-19. We must know when Minister Colbeck brief cabinet about the management of COVID-19 in the aged care sector. I have to say, older Australians and most Australians, and certainly those members of our community who have family and loved ones in the aged care sector in this country, have every reason, every reason to lack confidence, not only in this minister, but in this government for their lack of care for their elderly people, not just during the pandemic, but since they've been in government, with the Royal Commission bringing down its interim report titled Neglect. So there is no reason why there should be hostility from the government when we are asking these questions, like when did Minister Colbeck brief Cabinet? in relation to COVID-19 and those residents in aged care. But by not disclosing such information, it calls us to question whether any briefings occurred until the 5th of August 2020, by which time 130 residents had already died. This report made seven recommendations to obtain vital information from ministers in their response to COVID-19 crisis. And by denying access, they are denying us of justice. The public are losing faith, as I said earlier, in this government, for good reason, I might add. The Australian people, via the powers of the Senate, have the right to this information. The Senate must protect that right, and therefore I call 
on the senators on the crossbenchers to endorse the recommendations being made by this report. We cannot allow the Senate to only receive information that is politically convenient for the government of the day. Their, their claim of public interest immunity are a callous attempt to deceive the Australian people, and it is not exclusive to this committee. As I said from the outset, I chair the scrutiny of, of Bill's committee. And our committee, which works in a bipartisan manner, because our role is to scrutinise legislation, not to debate the legislation, but to scrutinise that legislation. And we have raised our concerns at the attempt after attempt by the Morrison government to delegate legislation so as to avoid parliamentary scrutiny. They are doing this by stealth and trying to erode the functions of the Senate. The government also routinely denies access to information, rejecting freedom of information, requests and giving late and ambiguous answers to questions on notice. Now, the only reason that I can foresee that the government continues to do that is because they are trying to hide something. They're trying to hide something. Now, we know the Prime Minister is the master of spin. We know his agenda is only ever run by his political necessity to ensure his political survival. That's what we saw at the weekend with this $1.2 billion bonanza for the airline sector, promising half fares to some destinations based on liberal marginal seats and seats that they were targeting to win. And then they had to, of course, go back to the drawing board when it was exposed the frauds that they are and added some further destinations. Well, the Australian people are not blinded by the government's confetti of money that suits them at their own political timing to throw around the community. The community expects this chamber to be able to scrutinise the actions of the government. And with the billions upon billions of dollars that this government has been spending during this pandemic, which has not been necessarily well targeted, we have highlighted those sectors that were left behind. We know what's going to happen at the end of the month when JobKeeper is cut. I know the dramatic impact that's going to have on my Tasmanian community, who rely so much on small business and tourism and hospitality. We know the impact that that's going to have. We know that wages have stagnated in this country. We know underemployment and casualisation is hurting Australian workers. Well, we will always demand to have scrutiny of expenditure by this government. And so, therefore, these recommendations from this committee should be supported, and I seek the support, along with my Labor colleagues, to have the crossbench stand with us and demand scrutiny of this government, because it is so important to our democracy. We need, at this point in time, to ensure our community that there is scrutiny, that there is transparency and, most importantly, that there is accountability. So we will hold this government to account each and every day in this chamber and in the other place because that's our job and that's what the Australian people expect from us each and every day. Thank you, Senator Polly. And I call Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. We didn't speak on the item 18, public interest immunity claims and, of course, the tabling of documents. The uh, transparency and accountability are bedrock principles in government, which I think you would find near universal support for among the Australian public. 
In fact, if you can run a poll asking whether transparency and accountability are desirable traits for a government, I think you would be close to 100 per cent of respondents saying yes. I say close to 100 per cent because there are at least 112 members of the coalition government who would, based on all the available evidence, tick no. This is a government so adverse to scrutiny they have two senior cabinet ministers on indefinite paid leave, avoiding questions in this place, hoping that serious allegations against them will just blow over. Earlier today, tens of thousands of people marched across the country, including just outside these doors in the Women's March for Justice. And of course, I was one of them. The Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, rather than accept an invitation to meet this rally, opted to hide behind closed doors. This is emblematic of the Morrison government's approach to transparency and accountability. The Prime Minister bunkers down, hides from scrutiny and hopes we all will move on to the next scandal. Well, it's never his responsibility and, of course, it's nothing to see here. That's all you get from this Prime Minister. Occasionally he'll throw someone under the bus so that he can make a clean getaway, as he did with a now former Minister for Sport, Senator Mackenzie, over sports rorts. But more often than not, the scandals engulfing this government are not only not the Prime Minister's fault, they are not anyone's fault. Take RoboDebt, the baby of the Prime Minister in his previous life as a Minister for Social Services. 373,000 people were hounded for debts they did not owe and $1.7 billion was repaid. And all the time, this government knew their actions were illegal. Parents have come forward telling of the suicide of their children, but neither the Prime Minister nor anyone else in the government was ever held properly accountable. Now let's take the Playden affair, another matter. A $500 million government contract handed to a security firm being run out of a shack on Kangaroo Island without public tender awarded. No accountability from the Minister for Home Affairs, no accountability from the Prime Minister. Or how about the Watergate affair, when the then Minister for Water Resources, Barnaby Joyce, was accused of funneling $79 million to the Minister for Energy, Angus Taylor's company in the Cayman Islands. <laughs> Again, no real accountability from the Prime Minister or the Minister for Energy. What does it take to lose your job in the Morrison government? It raises a serious question, doesn't it? Meanwhile, the same government shirks its accountability by a vigorous stacking of the body which reviews many government decisions, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. A parade of ill-qualified Liberal mates now sit on the AAT. As Crikey reported on, in September 2019, the federal government had appointed 64 members and senior members to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal over the preceding six years who either worked for the coalition or had another form of close connection to that party. The stacking has continued in the 18 months since that article was finished, including former Liberal Senator Sinan being appointed head of the Social Service Division of the Tribunal late last year. Now, by no coincidence, this is the division which has had the audacity to expose the illegality of the robo-debt scheme. What do you do? You stick one of your mates in there. Make sure that doesn't happen again. At the same time, the federal government has repeatedly cut funding to the ABC, and of course we learned today that the Attorney General is now in fact suing the ABC. What we have is a full throttled attack on the media and the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, the few entities which have the power to hold this government to account. Acting Deputy President. This brings me to this rather incredible second interim report of the Select Committee on COVID-19. During this unprecedented pandemic, the federal government was afforded sweeping powers by this parliament. Large sums of financial stimulus 
pass through the Senate in an expedited fashion to deal with the crisis. And it was necessary. Labor worked constructively to make sure that the expenditure of the unprecedented amount of public money was subject to scrutiny by the parliament. Thus, the Senate Select Committee on COVID was born. The Select Committee on COVID-19 Committee was tasked with inquiring in detail and in public into how these powers were used, how these sums were spent and why certain decisions had been made. It was established with bipartisan support. Yet as a result of repeated, substantial and willful obstructionism, the committee has been forced to produce a report reminding the government of its obligations to transparency and accountability. This is a government who shows contempt for accountability in all its forms, especially when it comes to what they do when they spend money. It's not their money. It belongs to the public, to taxpayers. It's not the Liberal National Re-election Slush Fund. The Select Committee on COVID has been forced to demand that the government no longer hide behind vague claims of public interest, public interest immunity, which allowed to selectively drip feed information to the Senate. We also see that not one but six cabinet ministers have been cited in this report as attacking the Senate's inquisitorial powers by misusing public interest immunity claims. The Attorney-General, Christian Porter, who has sought to hide whether US law enforcement agencies can access data collected by the Morrison government's COVID safe app, the minister representing the Minister for Health in the Senate, Minister Cash, who has sought to hide COVID-19 data modelling from the Department of Health, the former minister representing the Treasurer, Matthias Cormann, who sought to hide a broad range of information including regarding support to the aviation sector, job seeker modelling and the design of the job keeper program. Now I for one would be very interested to see the advice provided to the government around why Rex needed an untied grant of fifty four million dollars while it recorded an underlying profit, while Virgin, on the other hand, was left to almost collapse in administration. Another job for the mates. The Minister for Finance, Minister Birmingham, has sought to hide a pres presentation provided to the Cabinet by the Productivity Commission. The list goes on. The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Minister Colbeck, who has sought to hide the contents of briefings provided relating to aged care during COVID-19 and on the interim report of the Royal Commission and the Minister for Families and Social Services, Minister Rustin, who has sought to hide advice providing, provided regarding changes to asset testing for Centrelink payments. These are important matters which the Senate and the Australian public have a right to know about. As set out in this report, there are clear reasons why the public immunity interest test has been mis misused by the respective ministers. I welcome and wholeheartedly support the thoughtful recommendations within the second interim report. It is time for the Morrison government to front up and finally restore some accountability and transparency into the framework. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight in support of uh, the, the, the uh, uh, motion uh, relating to the ability for a Senate committee to get access to relevant information to its line of inquiry. The general principles upon which uh, I support this particular motion go back to the functions of the Senate. Uh, the Senate generally well, has two major functions. The first of those is to review, amend, reject past legislation. And that is something that this chamber does quite well. Uh, we seem to have worked out how to do that, how to have a good contest of ideas uh, and so forth. The 
Second function, of course, is to, uh, is to conduct oversight of government, the scrutiny of government, to watch over what government does, to shine a light on what, uh, on what government does. Now, the purpose of that is not to obstruct the government in uh, its stewardship of the nation, but simply to examine that stewardship, to make sure that uh, in the conduct of government things are done properly. That's, that's the purpose. Now, in this instance, as, uh, as we understand, the, the, the circumstances are that uh, uh, we, we've had a Senate in inquiry, a select committee established to look at the government's response to COVID. Uh, quite a reasonable thing to do, noting, as Senator Sheldon said, uh, a lot of money was being spent, a lot of public money was being spent for public purpose throughout the pandemic. Now, it's not to criticise anything the government has done in, uh, specifically in relation to that, but the, the Senate decided to examine the conduct, the stewardship throughout that pandemic. And in doing so, of course, it needs access to information. It needs to inform itself as to what government is doing and to critique, to criticise, to congratulate. They're the sorts of things we expect uh, to happen in these committees. But it's not possible if uh, the information has not been handed over. And so, uh, as a result of that, orders of production are, ha have been made to get access to information. Now, I just want to take people to uh, a well known uh, case in the High Court of Australia. It's the case of um, uh, Egan and Willis. Now, the background to this, of course, is that uh, in the New South Wales Parliament, the Parliament was trying to carry out its uh, functions in respect of uh, reviewing legislation, sought access to documents, and uh, when the Treasurer refused to provide those documents, the Treasurer was ejected from the Legislative Council. And uh, he, he raised an issue of trespass upon himself, being, of course, ex escorted from the Chamber. And the High Court deal, dealt with that. And I just want to go back to some of the principles. Uh, that were uh, uh, determined in, in Egan and Willis. I just want to go to uh, some, some of the things that were said by uh, Justice uh, Gordon uh, Gummo and Hain. Each House performs the parliamentary function of review of executive conduct in accordance with the principles of responsible government. The Legislative Council has such powers as are reasonably necessary for the proper exercise of its functions. Production of documents by ministers is reasonably necessary for the performance of both functions. Now, that's not Senator Patrick giving an opinion. That's the High Court of Australia saying, this is what the law is in this land. Often we have ministers stand up and say, no, uh, we're not going to provide these documents, but they do so inconsistent with the law of the land, inconsistent with the rulings of our High Court. You know, people are talking about rule of law uh, recently. That's thumbing, the government's thumbing its nose up at the High Court in respect of the principles it has laid out. Now, recommendation one in respect of this particular uh, 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 motion tonight. Recommendation one of the COVID committee was, of course, to um, deal with the fact that uh, during the discussion on the uh, Privacy Amendment Public Health Contact Information Bill 2020 to do with, uh, to do with the COVID Safe app, uh, the committee wanted to look at legal advice that, uh, that had been produced about the risks that uh, the use of a US company um, uh, had in respect of uh, data perhaps being sent back to the United States. So it was not unreasonable to ask for the production of uh, that legal advice. Now, of course, 
Ministers stand up here all the time and say, consistent with the principles or the, the previous um, statements of other attorney generals in this place, we're not going to provide those legal documents because legal professional privilege is involved. Well, there's another case. There's another case that followed from Egan and Willis, and it's called uh, Egan and Chadwick and, and others, and it was uh, dealt with by the New South Wales Supreme Court. And I just actually want to read to the chamber the exact words of the three uh, judges agreeing in respect of rights for a legislative council, uh, or it could be a Senate, it's, it's irrelevant, to have access to documents which are otherwise legally, uh, legally privileged. What they said is this, and I quote, in performing its accountability functions, the Legislative Council may require access to legal advice on the basis of which the executive acted or purported to act. Access to such advice may be relevant in order to make an informed assessment of the justification for the, for the executive decision. Accordingly, access to legal advice is reasonably necessary for the exercise by the Legislative Council of its functions. What, or if any, access should occur as a matter of the occasion and the manner of the exercise of a power, not its existence. So they make it very clear that the Senate has the ability, the Legislative Council, in the case of New South Wales, has the ability to call for legal advice. Justice Priestley said, the justification for legal professional privilege does not apply when a House of Parliament seeks the production of executive documents. It must have the power to call for information relevant to the fundamentally important task of reviewing, changing and, added, and adding to the statute laws of the state. There will be, from time to time, uh, be information in executive documents either necessary or useful for carrying out that task. There is no question that it is, that is, it is proper and lawful to request access to legal documents, and it is improper to withhold it. And I don't care about the opinions of attorney generals. I care about the law of this land. And the government scoffs at it. On one occasion, they might say it's convenient. We're going to rely on rule of law. And on the other, uh, on another occasion, they simply turn their back on what is the law of this land. It's really clear. Make no mistake, that is the situation, that is the law as it exists in Australia. Unfortunately, we've got a government that is acting inconsistent with the law, particularly in, re in reference to Recommendation 1. To the rest of them, of course, what's happened is the government's decided to sprinkle cabinet and confidence dust over all of the other information that's being sought. Now, the claim of cabinet in confidence is a serious one, and it does uh, you know, warrant some level of protection in respect of deliberations and the decisions of cabinet. But unfortunately, the, the uh, Morrison government has uh, watered down completely uh, and arrogantly stated that cabinet is now anything they want it to be. It can be a meeting of doctors, a meeting of the AHPPC. It can be a meeting of gas executives, the NCCC. Let me make it very clear. A cabinet is a collection of ministers responsible to one parliament. There is no such thing as a national cabinet. I don't mind if you form a national council to deal with uh, issues related to COVID. That's quite appropriate. But you don't sprinkle cabinet secrecy dust over everything. You don't say, I am the Prime Minister, I'm dissol dissolving COAG, and now I'm going to make that all part of cabinet and nothing that the government uh, does will be seen because it's all national cabinet in confidence. Well, sorry. That's not the way it works. Another principle of cabinet is one of collective responsibility. Minister Rustin will know this. 
You have collective responsibility. You can say whatever you like inside the cabinet. It's protected, as deliberations of cabinet ought to be. But once you step out of the cabinet, you are one, or you resign from cabinet. That's the rules. And yet, in the national cabinet, we see the, the prime minister come out and say one thing. Then we'll see the Western Australian pr uh, premier come out and say another thing. Then we'll see. Uh, the New South Wales Premier come out and say another thing, clearly not collective responsibility. Now, the real um, uh, situation in relation to that will be tested very shortly. I, I have actually asked for cabinet um, meetings of the uh, minutes of the National Cabinet, and I asked for them under FOI. And of course, the government denied them to me, making a claim that the cabinet in confidence. I took it to the information commissioner. The information commissioner uh, properly forwarded it to the AAT, where it can be dealt with seriously. The government at the time said nothing to see here. All the precedents are sorted out. It's not complex. That's what they said. But it gets to the AAT, and I'm happy to inform the chamber now that the matter is so serious it's been referred to a federal court justice, Justice White in Adelaide, and suddenly the government's made its mind up that it is important and have appointed a QC to, to represent them. So they went from something that was not an issue to something that requires a, a taxpayer-funded QC to keep secrets from the Australian public that should never have been kept secret. It's disgraceful. It's disgraceful and it's arrogant. It's arrogant to stand and say, I am simply, as a Prime Minister, going to unilaterally say that everything the government does is now secret. And that's what you've done. And I'm going to fight this. I'm sure that Justice White will make a good decision on this, but it may need to go further. So you're on notice, government. If I, if I win that case, then everything that uh, has been asked for in relation to the COVID committee will suddenly become available under FOI, because the defence that uh, is being run, the racket that's being run here to keep things from the parliament will evaporate by way of judicial order. It's sad. There are a number of recommendations in this, uh, in this committee report that basically say the Senate needs access to information in order to do its job properly. These are not, we're not after information about the top speed of our future submarines. We're not trying to see what the exact range of an F-35 uh, is. We're simply trying to see Perhaps what are the decisions that uh, were made in respect of border closures? Well, some of the early decisions related to vaccines. Lots and lots of different questions being asked by the committee, and the shutters get put up unlawfully and arrogantly by the, the coalition government. It's not proper. And sadly, we find ourselves debating this, and I su absolutely support. Uh, Senator Gallagher, in, in relation to this particular um, uh, motion that she's put, because she's trying to do her job as the chair. She's trying to make sure that the committee can properly examine the reference made by the Senate to her committee, but she can't because information is being denied inappropriately, unlawfully. No question about that. So, I will be supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Are there any other speakers on this motion? There being none, um, the, I'm, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those again say no. no. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bell for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McCarthy tell off the ayes. Senator Brockman tell off the noes and ask senators to remain in the chamber after this because we will be putting a deferred division immediately following this. The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, earlier this evening a division was deferred relating to a motion moved by Senator Pratt proposing a reference to the Education and Employment References Committee. It now being after 7.30 p.m., I put the question that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have, have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Pratt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McCarthy tell off the ayes, Senator Brockman tell off the noes. I've been asked for some time from the whips with the leave of the chamber. I appoint Senator McCarthy tell off the ayes and Senator Brockman tell off the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 31. The votes being equal, the question is therefore resolved in the negative. I thank senators and call the clerk. Government business order of the day number two, higher education support amendment, freedom of speech bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, the central recommendation of Mr French's review was the adoption of a model code on freedom of speech and academic freedom. As outlined in the Walker Review of Progress Towards This Goal, which was released on 9 December 2020, 23 out of the 42 had either fully implemented the code or mostly aligned, but there is more to be done by the remaining institutions. The government encourages all universities to consider Professor Walker's evaluations and take steps to respond to her recommendations. I acknowledge that the, bill, uh, that the bill's definition of freedom of speech and academic freedom does not seek to impinge on the beliefs and religious ethos of an institution. I thank those who have made contributions to this bill and I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Minister. The motion is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say... Well, Senator Carr. Thank you. I'd also like to move the amendment standing in my name. Yep. Uh, the Thank purpose you. of the amendment uh, that you have before you that is um, standing on uh, sheet number 1231 is to add a very simple word or a simple term in relation to the Commonwealth Government. Now, on uh, clause schedule 1 uh, for subclause 11 schedule 1 there's a list uh, there's a definition of academic freedom and the bill seeks to put in context what academic staff can look to in terms of academic freedom, and it lists the uh, freedom of academic staff to teach, discuss, research, disseminate, publish, freedom of academic staff to, and students to engage in intellectual inquiry, freedom of academic staff and students to express their opinions in relation to the higher education provider in which they work and enrol. And so I wish to add the words and, or in relation to the Commonwealth Government so that uh, staff and students can make their views known in relation to not just the education provider but also to the Commonwealth Government. And of course it goes on freedom of academic staff to participate in professional representative academic bodies, freedom of students to participate in student societies and associations and the autonomy of higher education provider in relation to the choice of academic courses and offerings and ways in which they are taught and choices of research activities and way in which they are conducted. So this actually seeks to broaden the definition of academic freedom. And of course, given that this is a bill that purports to be about freedom of speech, right, it would be of course uh, no difficulty for the government no difficulty whatsoever for the government to support this amendment. The great liberal defenders of free speech surely will support the notion that students and staff can comment not just on, their, on the academic provider, that is the university, but can comment on the government of Australia. I would have thought that's a pretty fundamental concept when we're talking about freedom of speech. Because the problem with the bill is it confuses academic freedom and freedom of speech, despite it's called a freedom of speech bill. So nonetheless, I don't think the government will have any difficulty, if it's serious about freedom of speech, in supporting uh, the rigorous protection of free speech in universities. After all, 
Universities are the place which is supposed to harbour the opportunities for people to express their views, not just about the university but about the policies being pursued by the government of Australia. Now, Chief Justice Robert French, when he's inquiry, I think it's important to draw attention to these claims. He said the claims of freedom of speech crisis in Australian universities are not substantiated. That there was no evidence of a free speech crisis on campus. Nonetheless, the government's persisted with this particular bill, so I think it's appropriate to put in place protections, protections for academics protections for students to give them the opportunity to be able to comment on government policy. And by accepting this amendment, the government will be able to remove the taint that they're being paranoid in their pursuit of their agenda as cultural warriors, as I've heard so often in the second reading debate, about their fears of the left in this country. A truly remarkable proposition that the left is so powerful and has such an enormous influence that it's necessary to bring forward bills such as this. Well, if it is such a serious question, then the right, the protections of academics and students to be able to express their opinions in our great public institutions should be enshrined in the legislation itself. Now, the academic uh, uh, bodies have um, not been particularly concerned that these matters, and uh, because, frankly, uh, it's a National Press Club address that Professor Deborah uh, Ter Terry made the point last year that our institutions are places of knowledge and critique and dialogue, she said. They are communities of diverse and inclusion of courtesy and respect. And that she went on to say, she called for the, we honour our calling as we impart our founding ethos those skills to each new generation, she said. Australian universities are places where people debate issues rigorously and vigorously. They are places where uncomfortable debates, challenging debates are held. That does not mean we suspend courtesy, compassion and kindness, amongst other ways. She said that there was a place where the great university education is acquiring skills in how to dismantle and refute the ideas of those with whom we disagree. She said expertly, methodically, cogently, and perhaps even charmingly, and always doing so with integrity and respect for others. Academic freedom, as she said, was at the heart of what universities do. She made the point that American professors Matthew Finken and Robert Post observed that in the freedom to pursue the scholarly profession according to the standards of that profession. And all freedoms, of course, are not without limits under the broader law. In Australia, freedom of speech is not exempt from laws that ban hate speech, incitement to violence, discrimination or defamation. And it's within that broader framework freedom is flourishing. So it's appropriate, given that context, the way in which the Universities Australia has argued the case, that we should ensure that the legislation covers a guarantee that staff and students can comment on government policy, a fundamental freedom of speech issue which I note is excluded from the government's list. How remarkable! And I look forward to the government's support for this amendment. It's a very straightforward matter. They should have no trouble whatsoever in endorsing such a fundamental principle of academic freedom and such a fundamental principle of freedom of speech. Senator Faruqi. Deputy President, the Greens support this amendment. Uh, the freedom to express opinions with respect to the Commonwealth Government is really important. Staff and students should be free to criticise the government without fear of repercussions or adverse action. But this government really doesn't want anyone to speak up. This government, where it comes to them, wants everyone to shut up. They don't want anyone to hold them accountable. 
And if we had any doubts about that, we need to look no further than the last three weeks, where all this government has been doing is cover-ups, silencing people, and obfuscating since the allegations of rape and sexual assault were made. And as I said in my second reading speech specifically to this bill, some of the most powerful civil rights movements of our time included university staff and students who were critical of government policies and government positions. And as the level of government responsibility for funding and regulating higher education uh, from time to time, university staff and students may have strong opinions about the Commonwealth as it relates to their particular issues or really any issue that's happening in the country. They have the right to express and voice their opinions about the Commonwealth. Senator Roberts. Thank you, uh, Chair. Minister, this bill is about academic freedom. Are you aware of any instances of uh, censorship with regard to people speaking up against any government, state or federal? Minister. Um, Senator Patrick, I am not aware Senator of that. Senator Robert. Patrick, I'm sorry about that. I really That's sincerely apologise. I really <laughs> sincerely apologise. Uh, Senator Robert, um, I am not aware of any instances, um, but given that I only have carriage of this bill on behalf of another minister, I will make sure I check that and come back to you. But to the best of my knowledge, the answer is no. Uh, thank you. Uh, minister? Thank you very much, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, well, the, the government believes that this amendment is unnecessary. The amendment seeks to include— Senator Carr. Uh, Senator Carr. Order. Senator Carr. Senator Carr. Minister. The amendment seeks to include the freedom to criticise the Commonwealth Government in the definition of academic freedom. This is a free speech matter rather than an issue of academic freedom. The government doesn't support this amendment because the freedom of expression opinions on any matter in a personal capacity is already implicit in the adoption of the French model code, which all universities have already agreed to. So, as I said, the government will not be supporting this amendment. S Senator Carr. I think, uh, Mr Deputy President, the government's hypocrisy is exposed in that very statement. Uh, absolutely and completely exposed. The government can't manage to separate the issue of so-called academic freedom from freedom of speech. It can't define these issues. It has no capacity to define these issues because, you see, what this is really about is the campaign by right-wing extremist elements within the government to try to find a diversion away from its problems because there is no evidence, no evidence anywhere that the university is at a crisis on the question of academic freedom any more than there is a crisis in terms of the capacity to have freedom of speech. But the government can't accept any proposition that says we'll enshrine that in legislation and exposing as such the hypocrisy, the total hypocrisy of this government when it comes to this measure. The minister's response does not surprise me. Because this is a flawed proposition from beginning to end. It was designed to actually allow for those on those extremist elements within the, the government to be able to claim, to claim it's doing something to try to bring the universities to heal. Universities which they regard as essentially hostile institutions to them. A nonsense proposition to begin with, given the number of coalition members that had academic careers within our universities, a nonsense given the range of extraordinarily conservative views that come out of our universities, a nonsense in good view of the fact that their own appointed reviewer, Chief Justice Robert French, found that there was no crisis. There was no crisis. You had to manufacture one for your own narrow political purposes. Because you see, you can't re reconcile the problem of university autonomy. You can't reconcile the fundamental principles of proper debate within universities from the propositions that you want to bring them to heal. That's the real nub of the question here. This amendment puts you fair and squarely on the spot. You have to make a decision. If people are able to have freedom of debate, freedom of opinion, freedom 
of speech, then the capacity to criticise the government should, of course, be willingly accepted. But it's not. Therefore, exposing the hypocrisy of this whole proposition that the government has before the chamber. So the question before the chair is that the amendment on sheet one two three one moved by Senator Carr be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Division required. I'll ring the bells, please. Lock the doors. So the question is: the amendment on sheet one two three one, as moved by Senator Carr, be agreed to. 
The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. And I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 32 ayes and 36 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Just let senators get back to their seats. Uh, Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you. Um, I seek leave to move Green's amendments 1, 2, 3, 4 on sheet 1127. Together? Is uh, leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. Thanks, Chair. I foreshadowed these, um, this, these amendments in my second reading speech. Uh, and these amendments will ensure that the academic freedom provisions apply not only to those university workers who are considered academic staff, but to those across the institution who may undertake academic activities, including teaching, scholarship, and research. And as I said in my second reading speech, at a modern university, much academic work is also undertaken by others in the university system who may not be classified or considered academic staff. And this can include research assistants and other professional staff who may from time to time deliver lectures or engage in research and otherwise contribute to the academic activities of the institution. Excuse me, Senator, sorry, Senator Faruqi. Uh, Senators, if uh, you're not going to be quiet, uh, could you uh, please uh, leave the chamber or sit here and listen to Senator Faruqi in silence? Sorry, Senator Faruqi. Thanks, Chair. Um, these amendments will extend the academic freedom provisions to more people doing academic work on our campuses and not necessarily confine their operation to a limited cohort of university work workers. So I move the amendment and commend it to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Carr. This is an amendment which expands the scope uh, of academic freedom protection to all staff who engage in academic work beyond what they substantially employment classification uh, would normally be. This amendment is a practical one. It has uh, been moved on the basis that it ensures that academic freedoms apply to the nature of the work being undertaken, 
not on the way in which the staff are actually classified. We know that many workers in our universities are employed as professional staff, whether they be in university laboratories or in libraries. They engage themselves in research projects and the like, and therefore uh, Labor will support this amendment and support the proposition that lies behind it. Thank you, Senator Carr. Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. The government does not consider the Greens amendment would broaden the scope of academic staff in relation to academic freedom principles and policies beyond what is already provided for in the bill. The government expects that all universities will adopt and implement the model code and that its principles and definitions will flow down into all other university policies. And this includes the broad definition of academic staff proposed by Mr French, that academic staff are all those who are employed by the university to teach and or carry out research and extends to those who provide, whether on an honorary basis or otherwise, teaching services and or conduct research or, or, and or conduct research at the university. So universities themselves have committed to adopt the model code. The government is confident that universities understand academic freedom applies to all academic activity, not just staff that may be narrowly designated as academic staff within an enterprise agreement. The government will not be supporting this amendment. Thank you, uh, Minister. So the question before the chair is that amendments 1 to 4 on sheet 1127 moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the, the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells.
Order. I lock the doors. So the question is that um, the amendments on sheet 1127 1 to 4 as moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Giacconi as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. <coughs> Order. There being 32 ayes and 32 no 36 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Get back. Thank you. Uh, Senator Roberts. Standing in my name on sheet 1216, and I acknowledge that universities are required to enshrine in their policy statement clear messages around freedom of speech and academic freedom. While we can't intrude upon the enterprise agreements between universities and their employees, the amendment I put forward today requests that higher education providers must take reasonable steps to ensure that enterprise agreements include provisions to uphold the freedom of speech and academic freedom. This commitment to academic freedom needs, wherever possible, to move beyond the policy statement that sits on the shelf gathering dust into the enterprise agreements where it drives behaviour, since that is where the cultural change will be brought about. It is not just policies, it is actions and behaviours that need to be changed. Thank you. Senator Carr. Thank you, President. Uh, this is uh, a proposition I'm afraid uh, hasn't been thought through with any great uh, depth. Uh, this is a matter that's actually at the core of the High Court uh, proceedings at the moment uh, in the regard to the RID matter. These are questions that go beyond just the issues of the free speech protections when they can't be overridden by other important workplace protections, such as anti-discrimination legislation such as policies on workplace, uh, uh, occupational health and safety, or, for that matter, on measures such as hate speech, on uh, questions in regard to the incitement of violence. Uh, these are not matters that can be overridden in regard to discrimination or defamation. And it's an extraordinary proposition for a senator to suggest that we should. Now, these are measures that are quite important to the way in which the universities actually function. And as the head of 
Universities Australia, the chair of Universities Australia, made clear, there goes to the question about the way in which academics communicate with one another as much as anything else. The communities where you are able to impart fundamental knowledge and skills and pass that on to new generations, but, and where you are able to vigorously debate matters, uncomfortable matters, but to do so with respect and courtesy and compassion and an understanding that you are expected to act in an expert and coherent manner. And I'm afraid the situation that has led to the circumstances in regard to James Cook University, those matters were absent. It wasn't a freedom of speech issue at all. It was a question about the way in which people sought to actually operate outside of their areas of knowledge, their critiques, their dialogue, their capacity to treat each other. And it goes to all of those other matters I've mentioned, to important workplace protections that exist for all employees within the university system. So Labor's not going to support this amendment. It's been ill-considered. It's part of an ideological obsession rather than a proper consideration on how we should ensure that our universities are run properly and able to do their job properly for the advancement of the nation. Uh, yes. Um, Senator Freaky. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, the Greens are supportive of strong enterprise bargaining agreements developed with higher education workers and their unions. We are supportive of enterprise agreements that clearly protect academic freedom, but we are not supporting this amendment. Any legislative steps to ensure that academic freedom is incorporated into enterprise agreements should be treated with sensitivity, and it must be carefully considered before being brought into Parliament. This amendment was circulated just a few hours ago, earlier today, and I don't think, um, as far as I know, Senator Roberts has not even consulted the National Tertiary Education Union about the implications of this amendment. Moreover, there is a clear need so far, uh, Senator Roberts, as it relates to enterprise agreements, to distinguish academic freedom provisions from broader protections with respect to freedom of speech. And this amendment does not do that. The Minister. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the government will not be supporting these amendments, although it uh, thanks One Nation for proposing them and respects the sentiment behind them. Employers and employees are free to make enterprise agreements which include terms that pertain to the employment relationship. The proposed amendment seeks to constrain university employers and employees' ability to freely agree to the terms and conditions of employment in their enterprise agreement. It also seeks to constrain the standards and policies that universities may set in relation to freedom of speech and academic freedom. Item B of the proposed amendments is also unnecessary as in practice it simply reflects the operation provisions in Mr French's proposed model code on freedom of speech and academic freedom. Effectively, the amendment proposes that other institutional policies should reflect and be consistent with the institution's policies on freedom of speech and academic freedom, which the government expects will be consistent with the model code. Thank you. The question before the chair is that the amendment moved by Senator Roberts, uh, Amendment 1 on Sheet 1216, revised, uh, be agreed to. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Division is required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is that the amendment uh, be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint tellers. I appoint Senator Ciccone, uh for the noes, and I appoint Senator Roberts. Teller for the ayes. The result of the division is ayes 3, noes 45. The question is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. I think so. Uh, those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Higher Education Support Amendment Freedom of Speech Bill 2020 and agreed to it without amendments. The Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Uh, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. 
that those of that opinion say aye, those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 and for related purposes. Government business orders of the day number one, Transport Security Amendment Serious Crime Bill 2020 in Committee of the Whole. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? Uh, there being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Uh, those of that opinion say no. We're Thank you, Senator Keneally. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Madam. Acting Deputy President, uh, I rise to contribute to the committee stage of this uh, debate and flag that Labor has a number of amendments that have been circulated to the chamber, and uh, I understand they have been circulated to the chamber, uh, and uh, I will be speaking to those and asking some questions, and I would encourage mem senators to consider the issues that have been raised. As I flagged in my second reading speech, Labor has a number of concerns in relation to the transport security serious crimes legislation. The amendments that we are moving seek to address those concerns. Uh, Madam De uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, the first set of amendments uh, that uh, I wish to speak to tonight and questions that I wish to ask uh, go to the issue of foreign flagged crew. Uh, and I'm specifically referring to our amendments on sheet 1117. Now, this amendment delays the commencement of the legislation until the, uh, until the migration amendment New Maritime Crew Visas Bill 2020 commences. Now, I start with this amendment because it is, I understand and, and accept, an unusual amendment for uh, us to consider. That is, uh, ma the effect of this amendment would be that should the transport uh, security serious crimes legislation pass this uh, Parliament that its delay it would be com its commencement would be delayed until a private senator's bill that I have submitted the migration amendment new maritime crew visas bill 2020 commences and I I just belabor this point because this is the only <laughs> way that we have to deal with the gaping hole that sits in this legislation. And the gaping hole that sits in this legislation is that while the government is making changes to the provision of, of um, uh, security clearance cards for the workers, Australian workers, domestic workers at um, Australian airports and seaports, it is not doing one thing one thing at all to address flag of convenience vessels and their foreign crew and the security challenges that they pose. Let's understand this. Under this legislation, while Australian workers can be subject to a three-month wait for their security clearance, 
foreign crew can currently access a maritime crew visa, subclass 988, and enter Australia with as little as 24 hours' notice, with no security clearance, no MSIC required. And we know that at one stage last year, Rio Tinto used eight ships in Queensland waters. Four of these ships all had Australian seafarers and all required with an MSIC card, and four of them had crew on foreign vessels through flag of convenience arrangements, none of these crews needing an MSIC or a maritime security uh, clearance. Now, this came out in the Senate inquiry, this issue. Foreign cute crew are currently escorted by an MSIC pass holder when in secure areas of ports, but Australian government authorities have been concerned that foreign crew can be open to exploitation from organized crime syndicates or terrorist groups, as indicated by the then Department of Immigration and Border Protection. This isn't some stakeholder group that the government likes to dismiss. This is actually their own department. Raising concerns in 2017 that, that flag of convenience vessels, their regulation, their registration and their practice practices are ones that organized crime syndicates or terrorists may seek to exploit. Reduced transparency or secrecy surrounding complex financial ownership arrangements are factors that can make freedom of, er, flag of convenience ships more attractive for use in illegal activity, including by organized crime or terrorist groups. This means that flag of convenience ships may be used for a range of illegal activities, including illegal exploitation of natural resources, illegal activity in protected areas, people smuggling, and facilitated prohibited imports or exports. These are not my words. These are the words of the Department of Immigration and Border Security. This, in 2017, we also heard evidence that the New South Wales coroner was investigating three highly suspicious deaths on, on board Sage Sagittarius. The foreign master of that ship was a person of interest in those investigations. The same man, Captain Salas, had been admitted to being a gun runner when subpoenaed to appear in the coroner's court. Captain Salas was allowed to work in an Australian domestic shipping industry under a maritime crew visa for eight months. Now, it is all well and good for the government to stand up and parade about that they're getting tough and they're cracking down on security arrangements for Australian workers who work at ports and airports. And we have a number of amendments that go to some of our concerns about the legislation. But there is nothing in this legislation that addresses the security risk posed by foreign crew, by flag of convenience crew. And that is why I am moving this amendment, because Labor proposes that there is a better way to ensure that foreign crew are subject to more extensive security requirements, and that would be to reform the maritime crew visa. And we feel so strongly about this that we are asking this Senate to approve that the transport security bill cannot be commenced until the issue of foreign crew have been addressed. The security challenges around foreign crew have been addressed. Now, we're going to hear the government say that the vast majority of maritime uh, visa crew visa holders do not require unescorted access in maritime security zones. They'll say any seafarer, whether Australian or foreign, is, is only required to hold an MSIC if they require unsupervised access to a maritime security zone. And they're going to say that obligating visa holders to comply with elements of the M6 scheme, where they do not require unsupervised access to maritime security zone, would pose a significant financial burden on the administration of the, uh, the scheme for no discernible benefit. Well, look, while the Canberra boffins here tell the, their ministers that foreign crew do not have unescorted, unescorted access to ports, any Warfy can tell you this is not the case. Any worker on a wharf can tell you that's not the case. The Morrison government has taken their eye off the ball when it comes to security at our ports. And foreign crew, as we heard in Senate inquiries, are regularly, routinely, routinely, routinely left to wander around secure areas.
And this is something that was examined in the recent RRAD inquiry into this flawed bill. So, my first question to the government is, does the government agree with the Department of Immigration and Border Protection's 2017 finding that there are features of flag of convenience registration, regulation, and practice that organized crime terrorists or organized crime syndicates or terrorists may seek to exploit. Does the government agree that, as the Department of Immigration and Border Protection said in 2017, that reduced transparency and secrecy surrounding complex financial and ownership arrangements are factors that make flag of convenience vessels more attractive for use in illegal activity, including by organized crime and terrorist groups? And does the government agree that flag of convenient ships, as the Department of Immigration said, can be used in a range of illegal activities, including the illegal exploitation of natural resources, illegal activity in protected areas, people smuggling, and facility prohibited imports or exports? And if the government doesn't agree that there are risks, can they please explain why the Department of, where the De Department of Immigration and Border Protection is wrong. I can answer it for you. Do you want me to do it for you? The Minister. Thank you very much. And I, I appreciate the generosity of Senator Stirl allowing me the opportunity to answer on behalf of the government. I know he would love to be on this side and um, seizing Thank the opportunity himself. Stop. The government will not be supporting the amendments to the bill on sheet 1117. Um, because that would make the commencement of the bill, as Senator Keneally has outlined, contingent on the passage of Senator Keneally's private members' bill, which seeks to link aspects of the MSIC background check process with maritime crew visas, particularly um, as they apply to um, foreign flagged vessels. And that would have the consequence um, of making it so that um, those people were not able to uh, get visas unless they underwent a, a similar sort of process. Now, um, the opposition's bill replicates what is already in place at the present time under the maritime crew visa requirements that exist under current migration legislation. Before a person is granted a maritime crew visa, and this is important for those opposite who have um, kicked and screamed and um, fought this all the way, their criminal history and their national security risk is already considered by the Department of Home Affairs before the visa is issued. Requiring that this also be assessed under the M6 scheme is an unnecessary duplication of those requirements. Now, um, the government doesn't support Senator Keneally's bill, and so an amendment now to make the commencement of this bill contingent on the passage of a bill that the government does not support would mean um, it's very unlikely that the important measures in this bill would never commence. Now, um, there has been an argument made by um, those opposite that there is an injustice in using, for instance, um, detailed criminal history checks or criminal intelligence reports to assess the suitability of an Australian working person on our wharves for suitability for an M6 card. Um, the injustice in that, they say, is that um, the, the injustice they say exists as a consequence is that people coming into Australia from foreign flag vessels don't face the same um, background checks, the same level of scrutiny. That's, that's the argument you've made. And I'm, I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying. I'm showing you Senator Stirl and Senator Keneally that I've listened. I've understood what you said. Now, if you'll let me address the, the flaws with that, that would be nice. Um, so the difficulty with that, and um, it's important that those listening at home are able to follow, follow this information, the vast majority of people who hold maritime crew visas do not require unescorted access to maritime security zones in the way that a person who has an MSIC card receives. Visa holders are not given the free reign on our wharves um, that 
a person with an MSIC card has. Now, it's been said by those opposite that anyone who has walked, worked on an Australian wharf knows that people with a maritime crew visa um, are not subject to those restrictions in practical terms. Now, not only does that sit very uncomfortably with the clear evidence that was given by the department at the hearing, um, it also is reliant upon the evidence of um, those people who most have a vested interest in ensuring that um, they don't face the scrutiny um, of a rigorous M6 scheme, and that is um, the, the unions that have fought this scheme so hard. So um, I would suggest that the reasons for the government's um, opposition to this amendment um, are, put simply, the fact that they are simply not necessary in circumstances where criminal histories are checked, national security risks are checked for maritime crew visas, and furthermore, um, those people um, who receive such a visa do not require and should not be receiving, do not in practice receive, um, access to zones um, that a person with an MSIC card does have access to in an un unescorted way. Senator Still. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, thank you, uh, Senator Stoker. And, and, and I just want to clear a few things up. And this is not something that I've been asked just to come down and have a chat. I've actually been living and breathing this for many, many years, as many in this place would probably understand. For those who don't, I am the chair of the Rural Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee that has been looking into this bill, and we've been doing it for four years. We've had some five five, I think, inquiries. And I must thank my colleagues on the, in the Greens and the crossbench, because when this bill was going to go through three weeks ago, I actually went to the crossbenches and I thanked Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts. I thanked Senator Lambie. I thanked Senator Patrick. I thanked Senator Griff and, of course, my colleagues in the Greens through Senator Rice has been a stalwart on this bill from the time that this bill came up, but only that, Senator Rice has been a stalwart on the issues facing our shipping industry. And Senator Rice, like myself and like Senator Sheldon, has watched the demise of the Australian shipping industry through teary eyes. When I found out that, you know, in the Howard years, in, in, through Prime Minister Howard years, we used to have 170 odd ships. 170 odd ships. Now I know that's a, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a bit of history going back there, but it wasn't that long ago. Now we're down to 13, and that's if the Australia, the Australia, the, the, the icebreaker down there, and what's it called, the one that's been replaced, and we're waiting for a replacement ship comes. Otherwise, we're talking 12. And let's talk about our Australian ships. Just while I'm at it, to give some clarity there, we've got the two gas buggies and good on Woodside. To continuing with the gas going out of the Dampier to Japan and Korea, Australian vessels, Australian flagged, Australian crewed. Let's talk about the six that are running between Tasmania, between the um, passengers and the toll ships and the sea freight ships. And we talk about the old clunker boat, the old clinker, clinker boat, not clunker boat. And then I'm trying to find, sorry about that, to the, to the boys and girls on the old clinker boat. <clears throat> I did pass you one night in the Bass Strait. I was on the toll ship, sorry about that. Uh, so it doesn't leave a lot of confidence in the crossbench, the Greens and myself, that the government has the best interests of Australia's seafarers and our shipping industry at front of mind, because they don't. But I do have to pull you up on this, Senator Stoker, when you said, talked about clear evidence given to the committee. And I will clearly, clearly articulate a few things that led to the frustration that we had when I went and approached the crossbenchers and the Greens for support to continue the inquiry because of the disrespect that was shown Senator Rice, as you know, to the Rural Regional Affairs and Transport Committee when we clearly sought questions, or we had questions, we clearly and fairly sought, sought answers to our questions about what is the importance of this bill. Tell us how this bill is going to improve the flow of illegal drugs coming into our nation. And as I've said very clearly on a number of times, not only in Senate inquiries, around this matter, <coughs> excuse me, but to this Senate that the supply of illicit drugs, and I know that there's chemicals that make illicit drugs that are being able to be purchased on our shores, but the majority of these illegal drugs are not coming in by hot air balloon. We're not seeing that coming across the uh, 
uh, from, New from uh, Indonesia across our shores. They're certainly not being strapped to the legs of carrier pigeons. And if they, if they are, my goodness me, how big is the pigeon? Because I've got one piece of evidence here that I, I won't table, Madam Acting Deputy President, but only as uh, late as uh, the 12th of March. What are we today? About the 16th or something? So the uh, last couple of days, 200 kilograms of cocaine intercepted on a boat off of Sydney. The majority of illegal drugs in this nation, they're not coming through our airports. We all know. We all know, and I won't talk about what we've all done on previous committees and previous inquiries when we've gone backstage of Sydney and Melbourne Airport, Senator Rice, as we have, and I won't talk about the intelligence committees that we've all served on, okay, but we all turn our TV on and we see border security and we see those fine diligent, hard-working men and women in border protection and immigration going through suitcases, and they're probably finding the odd bit of fruit and veggies and some meat or something. And, and then I won't talk about other things we talked about that we found. So where is the majority of the drugs coming in? Now, if you listen to the government and you listen to the ill-informed senators on the other side desperately trying to protect their minister, who doesn't really deserve any protection, to be real honest with you, but I understand how it works in this building. You're told to go down and do your duty. Are you serious to think that if we, if we, if we make it as hard as possible for a wharfie or a seafarer or someone working on the airport with their ASIC, and I know all about MSIC and ASIC, it was the first inquiry I did when I came in here over 15 odd years ago. Do we seriously think that these are the men and women that are, that are importing and distributing the drugs in our. I'll take about distribution, for God's sake. You know who the baddies are. You've got laws out there. Go and do it. You cannot fool me for one minute when I absolutely, once again, Senator Sheldon, as you would remember, the disrespect that this Senate was shown once again from the Department of Border Protection and Immigration. I don't blame the good folk there. The good man turned up in his, in his uniform. He was summons. I'll tell you where I lay the blame. I lay the blame clearly, clearly at the feet of Minister Dutton, because this is the same minister when I uncovered the truck drivers that were being exploited under the foreign visa system on student visas, the same minister, Minister Dutton, the same secretary, Mr Paluzzo, there's a common trend here. Are you serious to tell me if you think that you can make it as hard as possible for some decent working man or woman on the waterfront who's doing the right thing day in and day out, that you're going to combat the flow of illegal drugs into this area. And seriously, you should listen to what's stuck under your nose. I'm going to help you out here, Senator Stoker, because I think you could be a very decent person, but you're getting fed the wrong information. Don't take that nonsense that they're putting a bit of paper under you. We know what's going on in this nation. You have no idea if you knew, if you knew what was coming through. 200 kilos, that's not an Australian mother. Ship. It's not an Australian mothership because we haven't damn got any out there. It's not an Australian crew. It's not Australian flagged. If you really want to address the issue of foreign drugs in this nation, can you seriously, in your heart of hearts, sit there and think this is the bill that's going to fix it? It's not going to fix it. I'll tell you why it's not going to fix it. Because you, not you, Senator Stoker personally, I'll look over here, Minister Dutton in your office and all the boffins you've got there and all the pointy heads in bureaucracy down there in Canberra at the, at the department. Oh my God, the drugs will stop because we're going to make someone who may have a son who's been wayward, who's joined a, motorbike, a motorcycle gang, will deny him his MSIC or his ASIC. So that will stop the flow of drugs coming into this nation. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, please wake up. Your own evidence from your, from your departments down there. When I actually said, do we actually have the checks and balances? And I can tell you, because I've walked up the gangplanks and I've come down the gangplanks. I don't have an MSIC and down I've come. Hello, boys and girls, as I've walked through security. No worries, mate, I'm with him. I'm all right, he's got an MSIC too. Yeah, good, good to go. Wouldn't know me from a bar of soap. When those seafarers come down the gangplank, and I'm one that always stands up to look after foreign seafarers, but let's not fool ourselves. And I'm going to have another 10 minutes when I talk about Captain Salas and the Sage Sagittarius. Make no mistake about that, because I was the one that found that one out too. <clears throat> What's in your bag, mate? Do you ask that? We ask the department officials, do you know what's in the backpack or the suitcases of those foreign seafarers coming off these vessels? No idea. 
It started off as crickets. Do you actually scan them like at the airport? Do they, do they shuffle through a security? You know, where you strip off everything, your belts and all that, and they go through, and the, the camera comes up, and then there's a false alarm because your belt you didn't take off, or someone's left 10 cents in the pocket on the waterfront. Zilch, nothing. Not a clue. No idea. Is there any form? Is there any form of saying, look, I know the passport photo matches the face here for this Filipino or this Iranian, and I'm not being prejudiced because this is the majority of foreign seafarers that are being explored around our coastline. Is that really you? No idea. <clears throat> Ask them. We said, well, do you check this? You know what the answer came back said in the shell? I know you're going to have some fun here. No, we don't have anyone. There's no one on the. There's no one on the port. We got no idea. And this is before I even start with another 10 minutes about the temporary voyage permits. And let me get going on that. Half the time, some of these ships don't even apply for a temporary voyage permit. We got no idea. This is cuckoo land. This is crazy stuff. And I feel sorry for my, my colleagues across the chamber who are running Minister Dutton's line about, I'm going to be tough as on the ex-copper, but I'll tell you what, we're going to stamp out drugs. Oh, my goodness me. So my question is to you, Senator Stoker, I'm sorry you've got the carriage of this. You know you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Do you honestly believe that this bill will stop the inflow of illicit drugs into this great nation by flags of convenience, foreign shippers and exploited foreign Thank seafarers? Thank you, Senator Stirl. Minister. I very much enjoyed that, Senator Stirl. It's, um, I think I'm um, looking forward to, to an awful lot of um, uh, theatrics tonight, and um, I'm, I'm glad I've eaten well and settled in. The, um, the bill will um, certainly do no harm, particularly in um, the circumstances to which you point, um, and it will do some good in relation to the people who do pose a risk on the M6 side. Senator Rice. Acting Deputy President. Um, look, the Greens are going to be supporting this amendment from the Labor Party. And it's because we believe, like I think almost everybody in this place believes, that addressing the issue of serious crime is an incredibly important thing that we should focus on. But, and the reason we're supporting this amendment is if you are concerned about addressing serious crime, it's important to actually look at where the problem is. And I will you know, reiterate the comments made by um, Senator Keneally earlier on um, of the very clear evidence that was given in the 2017 inquiry into flags of convenient shipping. And I mean, Senator Keneally quoted them, and I think it's worth quoting them again, that, that there are features of flags of convenience, registration, regulation and practice that organised crime syndicates or terrorists may seek to exploit, and that there are factors that can make flags of convenient ships more attractive for use in illegal activity, including by organised crime and terrorist groups. And this means that flag of convenient ships may be used in a range of illegal activities, including illegal exploitation of natural resources, illegal activity in protected areas, people smuggling and facilitating prohibited imports or exports. I mean, the whole purpose that we are being told that this legislation is being introduced, and you know, I'll quote the explanatory memorandum, was that um, we are aiming to reduce criminal influence at Australia's security-controlled airports, security-regulated ports and security-regulated offshore oil and gas facilities. If that's what we are aiming to do, well, then we need to be looking in the right place. And by increasing the difficulty of getting an MSIC or an ASIC, it seems to us, is not going to be addressing this um, purpose at all. All it's going to do, and in contrast to what the minister just said, that this bill would not do any harm, it is going to be doing harm. It is going to be putting unnecessary, unreasonable um, limitations on people's ability to work at our airports and our ports. It will be doing significant harm, and it will continue the harm that this government has been doing to our domestic shipping industry for the last seven years. And at the same time as you know, our domestic shipping industry is going down the gurgler, we are doing nothing about dealing with the risks of criminal activity from flags of convenient shipping. We are having legislation introduced that is looking in entirely the wrong place. 
So, Minister, what I want to ask is, if the, as the explanatory memorandum says that the aim is to reduce criminal influence at Australia's security-controlled airports, security-regulated ports and security-regulated offshore oil and gas facilities, what evidence do you have that increasing the, the difficulty of workers being able to get an MSIC or an ASIC is actually going to achieve that purpose? Because for the life of me, I cannot see that it is going to do that, given that we know that there's a far, far greater risk of criminal activity through flags of convenient shipping. 